24. The group of warriors filed through the library to a loft area where X stood at a wood balustrade with Imula and Sergeant Wynn. Miles moved up beside X, pushing his muzzle through the bars. Below, Colonel Forge and Lieutenant Colonel Ranker made their way through the maze of dimly lit tables, their black capes fluttering behind them. The Helldivers came next, in their jumpsuits and armor, ready for whatever orders awaited them. Seeing them had X reconsidering his decision. He worried that many of these warriors would leave the Vanguard Islands to do their duty and never return again. Captain Mitchells towered above the group with Evie by his side. The woman had suffered much over the years, losing a child and most recently her husband. X had considered ordering her back to the Helldivers, but she was needed more on the bridge of discovery. Welcome, everyone, X said. Let's get started. Imola, bring me the maps. The scribe returned, and Wynne helped him unroll the large scroll and spread it over the table. Mac and Felipe came in and joined the rest of the group at the table. This first map is of the Outrider, once called Aruba, X said. I need to know how long it will take to get there, how much fuel we have, and what we expect to find when we get there. It's about a two-day sail to Aruba, said Lieutenant Colonel Ranker. We've already combined our fuel, and it should get us there if we don't push too hard. So how do we get back home? Arlo asked. Outrider is another refinery, Imola said. If you are victorious, you will have access to a new fuel source. Precisely why I don't want to have Discovery just blow the place up, X said. We still don't know if the Iron Reef in Belize is destroyed. If it is, this is our only known source of fuel. What about sending Discovery, Roger said. We could dive in and surprise the Skinwalkers. It'll be a slaughter. Yeah, it could be a slaughter of us. X said. Roger wasn't thinking logically, and his comment proved it. I'll kill them all, Roger said. Every last one of them. Sending in a diving team isn't a bad idea, Roch, Magnolia said. She rubbed the bandage on her head. But don't forget about the machines. What about sending out Renegade to Belize to check on the fuel outpost? Wynne asked. Do we have the time? I thought about that. But we can't risk sending out one of our warships, X said. We'll need them to defend the Vanguard Islands and for the mission to the Outrider. Which brings me back to my original question. What should we expect to find there? Ranker interpreted for Forge. He was the highest-ranking soldier left at the islands. But as far as X knew, most knowledge of the Skinwalkers had died with General Santiago and Rio de Janeiro. We know that Horn killed half the crew of Raven's Claw. Ranker said. That puts his numbers at anywhere from a hundred to a hundred and fifty, minus however many he lost in the attack here and on the ground in Rio. We saw at least thirty there, Michael said. Maybe more. We know he has two more submarines, said Wynne. And while they are small, probably some sort of research sub, they can do real damage. Imola went to another table and brought back a green hardcover book with an octopus logo engraved on the spine. He dusted off the cover, also marked by an octopus, and handed it to X. Most of us were children when the colony was abandoned, Ranker said. Very little is known now, Imola said. I found that in the archives, but the other books were missing, probably destroyed by El Pulpo. So what do we know about it? X asked. Colonel Ford said it was another training facility for warriors, Ranker said. In fact, he went there when he was a teenager and was stationed there for a few months. X looked to Forge, who simply stared at the map as if recalling memories of long ago. He glanced up and caught X's gaze. Lieutenant Colonel Ranker, ask Colonel Forge why it was abandoned, X said. The two Casador officers spoke for several moments. Ranker then stiffened slightly. The metal gods found it, sir. What? X blurted. The secrets these people held continued to infuriate him. Look, I still haven't figured out how you forgot to tell me El Pulpo had a bastard son or that Moretto was the mom, but not revealing this. For the moment, words failed him. I want to know everything you know, X said. 
He glared at Imola. The muscles in the scribe's cheeks trembled slightly. While some of us suspected Moretto was Horn's mother, speaking this would have been treachery, he said. Ranker nodded. The scribe is right. Moretto would have killed anyone who spoke such truth. X scratched his beard. It didn't matter now anyway. What did matter was that the machines had found the outpost, so maybe Horn wasn't lying about working with them. That's why they wear people's skins, X said. They must worship the machines. It makes total sense now. I suspected that myself when I was in Rio, Michael said. X took another look at the map of the former colony. What he was about to order must be done. The soldiers and divers all waited for what many of them knew was coming. Sergeant Wynn, X said. The Asian man stiffened. Yes, sir. You're being promoted to lieutenant and will oversee defenses at home while we send Shadow and Renegade to the Outrider. The warship Elysium will remain here to guard our homes. Wynn nodded. Thank you, King Xavier. X looked to Forge and Mac next. Mac, I'm assigning Renegade to you and the Barracudas and promoting you to Colonel, X said. That would be my honor, sir, Mac said, bowing his hunched back. Ranker, I want you to relay this to Colonel Forge, X said. Colonel Forge, I'm promoting you to General of the Combined Armies of the Cazadores and Sky People, X said. Your first orders are to sail Shadow to the Outrider. Ranker translated the first part. I will join you on this mission, along with a select group of my people, X said. Together, we will destroy Horn and the Skinwalkers. Several people seemed surprised by the order, but X realized now more than ever that they needed the Cazadores all in on their cause, and the best way to do that without Rhino was to give his position to another Cazador. After listening to the orders, Forge thumped his armored chest, and X nodded back. He didn't fully trust the man, not as he had trusted Rhino by the end, but Forge had helped save his life with the nanotech gel and had also kept the truth about what happened to the warship Lion under wraps. He had also helped them clear the Capitol Tower of Sirens. If he was a collaborator with the Skinwalkers, he was doing a lousy job. That takes care of one threat. But what about the machines? Les asked. X had a feeling this was coming. I'm getting there. But first, what's the status of the airship? Sir, Discovery should be ready in three days if all goes to plan, Les replied. Samson managed to locate some parts thanks to Tomas Mata. Good news. Pedro has briefed us on everything he knows about the base in Africa, Les said. We are still working up a strategy, but I won't need a full crew, just enough to run the ship and two teams of Helldivers. X considered the request again. They had no idea what they would find at either location, only that both would be heavily guarded by human warriors and probably machines as well. He missed the old days of fighting sirens and bone beasts. If you can get the airship ready, she's yours, Captain, X said. And you will have your Helldivers. I also need an XO now that Ada is deceased and Layla is sitting this mission out, Les said. He looked down to Evie. Anson Corey, how do you feel about joining me in Africa on... I'd be honored. You understand the risks, X said. All due respect, King Xavier, but I'm well aware. And I've got nothing to lose anyways. X gave her an empathetic nod. There's a lot of work to do before we depart, he said. But I want everyone here to spend time with their families. That's in order. He looked at Michael, then less. All right. Dismissed. X said. He reached down to pet Miles. The room started to empty, but Les lingered. Tun and Victor remained on guard. Sir, a moment of your time, Les said. Michael, you too. They took seats at the table and waited for everyone to leave the library. When the doors clicked shut in the distance, Les spoke. I need Magnolia and Roger on the mission to Africa, he said. I know that Roger wants to avenge his parents and that Sophia will want to kill Horn, but I don't think Magnolia is going anywhere without Roger, Michael said. 
We have a dozen divers, X said. Can't you make do without those two? A dozen divers who have either never dived or dived only a few times, Les said. I need veterans, not greenhorns to screw things up like Arlo did. I know. And you're right, X said. I'll talk it over with them. Thank you, sir, Les said. He stood and nodded at Michael, then started out of the room. He stopped at the twisting stairwell. I'll be at the shark's cage if you need me, sir, Les said. Don't forget my order, Captain, X said. Catherine and Phil need you too. I know, Les replied. I'm heading up to see them first. For the record, that's why I'm going to Africa. For them and for Trey. I know, X said. We all have our own missions now. Les ducked down the spiral staircase and hurried out of the library, his footfalls echoing. I better get back to Layla, too, Michael said. She's worried. Hold up a minute. Michael brushed his long hair over his shoulder as he stood. You ever gonna cut that or what? X asked, also getting up. I don't know. You gonna trim that unibrow? It looks like an angry caterpillar. X laughed. Grooming isn't high on my priority list. I'm more concerned about getting myself one of those. Michael held up his robotic arm. I'll bring one back from Africa. The thought of the mission made X tense up. It was almost surely the more dangerous of the two, and he hoped he was making the right decision sending Michael there. Don't worry, X, Michael said as if sensing his concern. I am worried, and I know Layla is too. X caught Michael's gaze. How does she feel about this? She hates it but I promise this is the last mission. X feared that it would be, but not in the way Michael thought. He feared for Les and the other Helldivers, too. The choice he had to make was an impossible one, but he would face it without flinching. We dive so humanity survives, Michael said. You know, I always found that a little cheesy. How about we fight so humanity survives? He picked up the spear that Rhino had carried into battle. Somehow, he must learn to use the ungainly weapon before he went out to kill Horn. In seriousness, I'm glad we can talk in private, Michael said. Because I want to have a small gathering to celebrate my union with Layla before I go. Tomorrow night, after we wrap most of the preps. I figured you would do that when we get back. A moment of silence passed, with both of them probably thinking the same thing. Okay, X said. We do it tomorrow night. Now we just need to find someone to marry us. Don't look at me, kid. I'm no priest. Ain't that the truth? But you are a king. X cracked a half grin and patted Michael on the shoulder. Michael wrapped him in a hug. There's another reason I need a new limb, X said when he pulled away. I want to be able to hold Bray when he comes. Michael smiled wide. Although I'm not too good with babies, X said. Me neither, Michael laughed. We'll figure it out together, old man. Heading back to his apartment, Les kept a brisk pace through the hallways of the Capitol Tower, trying to ignore the signs of battle. Despite the best efforts of a cleaning crew, there was still evidence of the sirens that had ravaged this place. Blood spatter on walls and overhead claw marks on doors. Even a few spent bullet casings had eluded the cleanup crew. But there were far bigger problems to deal with than washing blood off the walls. He counted his blessings. His family had survived unscathed, physically anyway, although he worried about the psychological damage, especially for his daughter. His suspicions were confirmed when he arrived back at his apartment. He unlocked the door to the sound of sobbing. Les quietly shut the door and slipped into the shadows outside the room Phil had shared with Trey. A candle burned on the bedside table. She was sitting up in bed, clutching a stuffed animal, with Catherine sitting by her side. Neither of them had heard him come in, and for a moment he stood in the darkness watching. He wanted to comfort his daughter, but he felt frozen. 
The father he had become over the past few months was an absent one, and he couldn't bear hearing Phil beg him not to leave again or endure the resentful gaze Catherine fired at him every time he walked into the room. Taking a step back, he considered slipping away and heading back to the shark's cage. That would be easier. But that wasn't the father he wanted to be, and he wouldn't be able to live with the guilt later. He would rather watch his child cry her eyes out than abandon her and go back to work. Les walked into the room, the creaking floor attracting Catherine's attention. To his surprise, it wasn't a resentful gaze, probably because she was crying. He went to the bed as Phil stretched out her arms. Papa, she cried. He leaned down and pulled her tight. Sweetie, what's wrong? He said quietly. Papa, the monsters, she whimpered. Catherine stood and folded her arms over her chest after wiping away the tears. She had a bad dream about the sirens, she said. Les released his grip on Phil and sat on the bed next to her. Sweetheart, the monsters are gone, he said. But what if they come back? They won't. I'm going to make sure of that. You promise? Cross my heart, Les said. Phil smiled, then frowned. Does that mean you have to leave again? Because if it does, I won't be able to sleep. Les didn't reply, the guilt already eating at his insides. Papa, I want you to sleep on my floor like you used to. A flood of memories entered his brain, but the worst part wasn't recalling the past. It was explaining the future. Daddy has to go back to work, Catherine said. He looked up at his wife, surprised again. To make sure the monsters stay away, Catherine said. Right, Les? He just nodded. Now go back to sleep, he said. I'll come back in the morning and eat breakfast with you and your mom, okay? Promise and cross your heart again? Les motioned over his chest, drawing the hint of a smile from Phil. He grabbed her stuffed bear and put it in her hands. She relaxed her head on the pillow, hugging the bear and letting out a sigh. Everything is going to be okay, my princess, Les said. He pulled the sheet up to her neck and tucked the sides in neatly around the bed. Phil watched him retreat to the doorway with Catherine. Wait, she called out. We're going to talk outside, okay, Catherine said. We'll be right outside the door in the hallway. Phil's lips quivered in the candlelight. Just right outside, Les said. Leave the door open, Phil said. Les followed his wife out of the room and kept the door ajar. He fully expected another lecture or that withering gaze, but again he was surprised. Catherine took his hand. Les, she said. Moonlight through an open window illuminated his wife's features. She had braided her hair tonight, just the way he loved it. After the ceremony earlier tonight, I realized why you're doing all this, she said. I won't try and talk you out of it anymore, or make you feel guilty. Les felt as if he had entered a dream. This couldn't be real. I don't understand the sudden shift, he started to say. The world I've lived in is not the same as yours, she said. You have dived through the storms, tracked through the wastes, and fought countless monsters and humans. It's my duty, and I do it for you and Phil, just as Trey did. I know, Catherine said, heaving a deep sigh. Her freckled nose crinkled in the moonlight. All this time I've been mad at you for leaving and for what happened to Trey. But, she squeezed his hand. I don't blame you for what happened to our son, she said. I know you would have traded your life for his if you could. I would have, he said. But hell divers don't get do-overs. And I will live with the regret of that mission for the rest of my life. Don't blame yourself. You're a good diver, captain, father, and husband. You're a good man, Les. You always have been. He didn't know what to say. 
but he didn't hold back his emotions this time. He let the tears come. It's okay, Les, she said. I'm sorry. He wiped his eyes. No, if you need to cry, cry. I just want you to know I was wrong and I'm so sorry. You have no idea how good it is to hear these things, he said. Catherine, I'm going to do everything in my power to save our home, our people, and you and Phil so she can grow up in a peaceful, safe world. I know. She loosened her grip slightly, and he waited for things to take a turn for the worse. What are the odds you can beat the machines and the skinwalkers, she asked. I mean, what are the chances we will win this war? He hadn't seen that one coming. He reached down and grabbed her other hand and led her to the kitchen. We'll be right out here, Catherine called out to Phil. Les stopped near the open windows where the cool breeze rustled his thinning red tuft. I don't know exactly what we're going to find when we reach the target in Africa, he said. All I know is that I have two secret weapons to use against the machines. Timothy Pepper and Helldivers. Les, you're not just a good man, you're an intelligent one. And that's part of the reason I fell in love with you. But one AI and a team of Helldivers? What makes you think you can stop the machines that destroyed the world? I have a plan. I'm working with Timothy to develop something that I can't talk about yet, but you have to trust me. Trust that I believe I have a chance. I... Les kissed her on the lips. Then he held her gaze. I have to do this, or eventually they will find this place. If that happens, there will be no future for Phil or the rest of the children. There's no one else who can do this? Everyone will play a role in the coming war, he said. This is mine. What can I do? Take care of our daughter, and promise me you'll always love me. Oh, Les. She hugged him. I'm so sorry for not being there for you. I didn't realize how bad things were until I talked to... What? She looked down. I talked to X, and he gave me some perspective on things. Les didn't know whether to be happy or mad, but the king had done something he couldn't. Make Catherine realize she loved him still. I'm sorry, too, for everything. I love you and Phil so much. They kissed, but were interrupted by a surprised voice. What is that? They both turned to see Phil standing in the hallway, her stuffed bear dangling from one hand. You're supposed to be in bed, Catherine said. Phil lifted a finger and pointed out the window, not answering. Les and Catherine turned to the open shutters. Red flares floated down from the sky. What is that, Les? Catherine asked. He smiled. Those are hell divers, he said. And they're going to help me save us from the monsters. 25. The next morning, the islands had come alive with activity. News of Colonel Forge's promotion to general had spread fast and most Cazadores seemed thrilled that one of their own was again in charge of the military. Civilians across the rigs had started their day helping with the war effort. Rumors about the machines had also spread, and every soul understood what was at stake. It had taken a shared threat to bring everyone together, a threat that had already wiped out most of humanity and destroyed the world. Michael watched it all proudly, with confidence and optimism. Everyone was playing a role in preparing for what could very well be the final battle in a war that had lasted over two and a half centuries. An army of shipwrights and mechanics had arrived to get Renegade and Shadow ready for battle. Every bullet, bomb, and missile across the islands was inventoried, while prisoners at the shark's cage and civilians on other rigs redoubled their efforts repairing damaged ordnance, casting lead bullets, and reloading spent brass. At the trading post... Animals were being slaughtered and preserved for the journey to Aruba. Food, ammunition, and spare parts were being ferried out to Discovery. Even the people from the bunker in Rio were helping. On the Capitol Tower, a group had gathered at dawn to patch jumpsuits and parachutes. 
The people who had lived underground for centuries had many skills that were coming in handy. Like most of the Helldivers, Michael had spent much of the night diving through the clouds to train for the Africa mission. This would be his last time in the sky, a promise he had made to Layla and wasn't going to break. After wrapping up 12 training jumps, the divers had been assigned to help a team of Cazador scuba divers with the last of the underwater sensors to detect submarines. These were already in place at strategic locations along the border of light and dark, but the teams installed more around the Capitol Tower and the Hive just in case. When the sensors were all in the water, the divers returned to the Capitol Tower for a few hours of rest before more training. Finally, Michael took them to the Sky Arena where they were given breakfast and water. He was there with them now, standing in front of Mac and Felipe. A rusted metal rack of swords and spears was nearby. Pedro stood with his arms folded over his chest, dreads hanging over his back. He was here at X's request, although Michael wasn't quite sure why. Michael handed a bottle of water to Sophia, who passed it down to the other divers. The casual onlooker wouldn't have known a greenhorn from a veteran. They all looked exhausted. Sophia, Lena, Ted, Hector, Edgar, Arlo, Magnolia, and Roger were all here, but barely. Some were almost staggering. Arlo sat down and then leaned back with his hands behind his head. Let me know when you're ready, he said. I'm going to take a quick nap. X should be here soon, Michael said. He looked up at the surrounding seats, picturing the crowds that had watched when X and Roger first fought here. So much had changed since then. Some of the other divers started to sit down too, but Michael remained standing next to Magnolia and Roger. I know you're all tired, he said, but suck it up. What you're about to learn could very well be the difference between life and death once we reach Africa. I ain't fucking going to Africa, Roger muttered. Michael wasn't in the mood to argue, and he didn't want to upset Roger further so soon after he buried his parents. That's going to be decided by King Xavier, he said. Regardless of where you go, there or Aruba, you need this training. Roger grumbled, and Magnolia elbowed him in the ribs. The sound of boots on the stands commanded his attention, and Michael brought a hand up to shield his eyes from the sun. Tun and Victor walked with X down the stairwell splitting the stands. Miles trotted after them, but stopped at the railing. Arlo and the other divers got to their feet. Stay, boy, X said. The dog paced and whined after X and his guards climbed down to the sand. The king carried the double-headed spear that had belonged to his most trusted guard, Rhino. Sorry I'm late, X said. Welcome, King Xavier, Max said. He bowed slightly and twirled a cutlass in his only hand. This afternoon, you're getting a crash course on how to wield that spear. What the hell do we need those for when we have machine guns and blasters? Arlo asked. Mac looked at the diver as one might respond to a slow child. Then he said, Guns don't always work in the wastes, and a sword doesn't run out of ammo. He swung the cutlass at Arlo's neck the blade stomping less than an inch from his Adam's apple. In the time it would take to aim a gun, I would have just lopped your head off, Max said. Arlo swallowed, looking shaken. Everyone grab a weapon, he said. Your training starts now. The divers walked over to the rack of weapons and chose from the blades and spears. Pedro joined the divers and grabbed a double-edged sword. Hope you got a plan on how to teach me to use this with one arm, X said, raising his spear awkwardly in the air. Oh, I'll show you a few tricks, Max said. Michael didn't like the idea of X trying to fight Horn with the weapon, but he knew better than to try to talk him out of it. Once X had his mind made up, he rarely entertained alternatives without a fight. But also, Michael wanted to see how Mac would train X on the weapon. Watch and learn. Max said. He stepped into a white ring painted in the dirt and raised a blunted cutlass to Felipe. The younger Barracuda got into a fighting stance with a short sword. Sweat beaded on his bald pate and trickled down the crab tattoo. 
Mac let out a cry as he swung first. The blades clanged. For an old man with only two natural limbs, Mac was fast. Felipe was a strong fighter, too, and he didn't seem to be going easy on the veteran. They traded blows for several minutes, staying within the border of the white line. Don't watch your opponent's eyes, Mac said to the spectators. He can use them to fake you out. You can get a better read on his next move by watching his chest. Felipe, who didn't know much English, wasn't prepared when Mac flitted his eyes to the left and jabbed with his right. Mac turned the dull blade aside at the last moment, smacking Felipe in the back with the flat. Wincing, Felipe hopped away. Wow, Arlo said. That was sick. Edgar twirled his sword. He was still bruised and injured, but looked more determined than ever. Let me try, he said. The former militia soldier wasn't just an expert with a sniper rifle. In the militia, he had been an artist with a baton. He wasn't bad with a sword, either. At least, that was what Michael thought until Mac had the helldiver on his back with a blade to his chest within four strokes. Damn, Arlo said. You just got worked, Holmes. Sick? Worked? Holmes? What the hell does that shit even mean? Sophia asked. Just stuff I heard in old world movies and songs, Arlo said. Sophia stepped up next, and to everyone's surprise, she swung her sword so hard that it made Mac take a step back with his prosthetic leg. He hit back, but Sophia lunged, forcing him to sidestep the blow. Whoa, X said. Take it easy, Sophia. But she only hit harder. Mac parried the blows with his cutlass, not striking back, letting her expend energy. Damn, Arlo said. He looked to Lena. You got hidden moves like that? I know a few tricks, she replied. He winked at her and Lena rolled her eyes. Guys less talking, more watching, Michael said. She's got skills, Arlo said. You're right, for once, Ted said after taking a slug from his flask. Sophia grunted louder, hitting harder, feet moving nimbly. Careful, X warned them. But Mac didn't seem to be easing up any more than she was, and the bloodlust in her eyes made Michael a little uneasy. A scream pierced the morning as Sophia charged Mac. She swung hard, sparks flying when Mac's sword deflected the blow. Felipe stepped closer, clearly worried about his commander. You're good, but not that good, Mac said. He swung at her, but she swung harder, almost knocking his sword out of his grip. She smacked him in the face with her elbow. Stumbling backward, he dragged his forearm across his lips, smearing blood. His eyes glared with rage. They both raised their swords at the same time, but Michael strode into the middle of the ring and reached out with his metal arm, catching her sword blade. Felipe stepped in front of Mac. Enough, X said. The king's raised voice seemed to calm Mac down, but Sophia just yanked on her sword. Michael's robotic fingers held the blade like a vice. Calm down, he said. Fuck you. Hey, Magnolia said. Sophia, you need to check yourself. You can fuck off too, Sophia said. She finally let go of her sword and stormed off over the railing and up the stairs. Magnolia walked after her, but X shook his head. Give her time, he said. Blood dripped off Mac's chin. He held up his hand and spat a tooth into his palm. Oh. It's just wood, he said, and chuckled. X laughed too, but the jocularity vanished with the whistling wind. Michael dropped Sophia's sword, point first into the soil. Tell me again how we're supposed to use swords on the machines, Arlo said. I don't think I caught that part of the training. You're not, X said. They're for human enemies. And why is Pedro here? Ted asked. Hearing his name, Pedro walked over. He's going with you to Africa, X said. He's humbly volunteered to join the crew and share his knowledge of the machines. Michael wasn't surprised to hear this and once again appreciated the man's courage. Either way, I think I prefer my submachine gun and blaster, Arlo said. They had bigger problems than weaponry to worry about. Michael wondered whether X was thinking the same thing. 
How could a team of emotionally and physically broken down Helldivers fight the machines on the machine's turf? They weren't ready. But would they ever be? While the sun sank into the sea to end another day, Cazadores and Sky People worked together preparing for war. X was still in the Sky Arena working with Mac and Felipe. He wanted to hear Imula translate the book about the Outrider, but there would be plenty of time for that on the journey to the not-so-abandoned Cazador colony on Aryuba. Right now, though, he must learn how to fight one-handed with the spear if he had any hope of killing Horn. Mac and Felipe finished off the rest of their water, and Mac motioned for X to get back into the ring. Again, Mac said. X gripped the spear as Mac had taught him and then jabbed it through the air at the crab tattoo on Felipe's skull, only to have the blade knocked away by his cutlass. Better, but too slow, Max said. He spat in the dirt. It's a shame you lost your knife hand. Makes training all the more difficult. No shit, X muttered, panting. He tightened the thong of the leather sheath on his spearhead. Tun and Victor watched his every move. They weren't the only ones. Miles watched from the stands and got up when X looked in his direction. Almost done, boy, he said. Looking at his wristwatch, he realized he was running out of time to spar. The ceremony for Michael and Layla was in an hour. We'll pick this up later, X said. Thank you for helping me out, brother. X went back to his room where he left Miles with a bowl of fresh food and water. Then he headed for the solar-heated showers on the floor below. Tun and Victor pushed open the double doors, and they all entered a steamy room that smelled like a mixture of body odor and flowers. Ted and Arlo were in the first changing area. With his back turned and his long curly locks hanging over his shoulders, Arlo looked like a woman. You know why soldiers buzz their heads in old wars? X asked him. Arlo turned, tightening the towel around his waist. The stab wound he had suffered in Rio de Janeiro wasn't fully healed yet, but the stitches were out. I don't recall, King Xavier, he replied. So an enemy couldn't pull your head back and slit your throat, X said, tracing a line across his own scarred neck. Arlo flipped a lock of hair over his shoulder, flinging water on Ted. Hey, man, what the hell? Sorry, Arlo said. He sat on a long wooden bench. All due respect, King Xavier, but I'm going to have a helmet on out there, right? Yes, but that's not the point. I still don't know how a sword is going to do me any good against a machine. It may not, X said. But there are more than machines where you're going. Remember that siren pit you fell into on your last dive? Arlo swallowed hard, and Tun and Victor gave him a hard look as X hit the showers. Feeling refreshed, X walked back to his quarters in silence. Miles followed him over to his closet where X pulled out his best shorts and slipped into his worn leather sandals. The two white shirts hanging on hooks were wrinkled, but the one thing in his small closet wasn't. What do you think, boy? X asked Miles. The dog moved into the closet and sniffed the bottom of the leather outfit that Imula had given X during the first days of his reign. To be king... You must dress like one, he had said. Fuck that, X mumbled. It was the same reply he had given back then. He left the closet and went over to the trunk at the foot of the bed. Miles sniffed the box eagerly, expecting a treat. X opened the lid to reveal the only possession that had survived all his journeys. While he had lost most of his original Helldiver armor during his trek through the wastes and his imprisonment by the Cazadores, he still had the main plate of his chest armor. He placed it on the bed. After putting on a white button-down shirt, he added the chest plate. Turning, he checked himself in the cracked mirror on the wall. I look good, he said, glancing down. Miles' tail thumped and X laughed. He went to his small desk where he had placed Imola's book on the Outrider colony. But it was the second book from Imola that he was interested in tonight. A faded gold cross marked the cover. It was as old as X felt, with pages as creased and weathered as his scarred flesh. He had never felt much in common with religions, but tonight 
He was going to use a line from this ancient book for the old world ceremony that would unite Michael and Layla. X buckled his captain's sword to the duty belt at his waist. For the first time in as long as he could remember, he stopped in front of the mirror and made sure he didn't have anything in his teeth. He even ran his fingernails through the thicket of eyebrow, then used scissors to cut any errant bristles. Satisfied, he went to work trimming his beard into shape. At last, he wiped the mirror off and stared at his reflection. He hardly recognized the man looking back at him. A new wrinkle had formed on his forehead, and his nose looked more crooked than before, and his short hair and beard now had more salt than pepper. You shouldn't even be alive, he said. He and Miles left the room and walked with Tun and Victor to the sun deck where El Pulpo's wives had once lounged in the sun while servants fed them grapes. The servants were gone, as were the cages that once held Roger and Miles captive. The rest had been transformed into a beautiful oasis. Electric lights hung from the branches of trees. Four tables, each covered with a white cloth and set with dishes of fruit and vegetables, had been set up along the deck. Voices came from the other side of the garden. X walked toward them, halting behind a tree when he saw Michael and Layla holding hands under a bower strung with lights. Several people waited in the shadows. Layla looked beautiful in a white dress with flowers and a lace v-neck. Michael wore a black Helldiver jumpsuit with the Raptor logo on the sleeves. Armor covered his chest. The ponytail was gone, shorn down to a crew cut. He had also shaved his baby face. Both were too busy talking with Imola to even see X. He stood there a moment, admiring the two kids. Even in their mid-twenties, that was how he saw them. And they were about to start their own family now. X drew in a breath, suddenly feeling more nervous than he did before a dive. A memory surfaced of his 96th jump, the day Michael's father died with the rest of Team Raptor. More memories flooded his mind, bringing tin orange noodles while he put together a vacuum cleaner bot in their small quarters, finding the boy in the medical ward with his shiny foil hat after a storm. He recalled the fortune cookie quote Tin had given him before the dive that left X stranded on the surface. They hadn't seen each other for almost a decade until their reunion in Florida, when X was a half-crazed shell of his former self. Since then, they had made up for lost time. But that time was fraught with harsh reality. Devastating dives. The battle for the islands. Death and suffering. His drinking again. All those moments had led X to tonight. To this very spot where he was lucky enough to see Michael and Layla joined together in the sacred tradition of marriage. Roger and Magnolia waited hand in hand. She had buzzed her head and wore a bandage over the burn wounds on the right side of her forehead. Roger pushed his glasses up and smiled as X walked over. Les stood with his wife and daughter, holding their hands. Evie and Samson had also come, and there were the ever-present Victor and Tun, keeping to the shadows to watch for threats. But so many were not here tonight. People they had lost who would have loved to see this union. X led Miles over to the gathering. Welcome, King Xavier, Imola said. X almost choked up as Michael and Layla turned to face him. They both smiled, but there was still tension in their faces, concern over what came after their ceremony. X vowed to live in the moment and leave the worries for tomorrow. We are here to celebrate the union of two beautiful people tonight, X said. Two people I've had the pleasure of knowing since they were children. He stepped up in front of the altar under the fronds of a palm tree. Layla Brower and Michael Everhart, it is my honor to oversee this ceremony. You are beautiful inside and out, and have always put others before yourselves with your kind and selfless hearts. He let that sink in. Tonight is about you and I hope you can put aside all other thoughts and focus on each other right now. For this is a night that you will never forget. Michael looked at Layla and smiled. Her dimpled grin widened. Gather around, 
X said. Everyone moved closer, and he thought back to his own wedding. He wasn't even sure how long ago it was. Probably thirty years by now. A distant memory, but one that still lived in his mind. His wife had looked so beautiful that day, and they were so in love. Long before the diving turned him into a drunk, and at times an asshole. Accept your past without regrets, he reminded himself. X opened the book. Clearing his throat, he read the passage about love. Love is kind. It does not envy. He handed the book to Imola and moved to a tradition his people had come up with over the years. Layla, Michael, X said. Tonight your hearts become one. Wherever one of you goes, the other follows, even if not in physical form. They placed their hands over each other's heart. Repeat after me, X said. He waited a moment. I, Michael Everhart, promise always to put you first and take care of you as long as we live in the sky. Several chuckles sounded. Sorry, X said. I guess we'll need to change some words. Michael and Layla both smiled even wider. As long as we live, X corrected. Michael repeated the words, and Layla did the same. I want to make another promise tonight in front of you all, Michael said. He looked to X for permission. Go ahead, X said. Layla, Michael said, meeting her gaze once again. I promise the mission to Africa will be my last as a helldiver. A tear rolled down her cheek. She nodded once, then twice. Put your hand on top of each other's, X said. They did, and X put his left hand on top of theirs. Let us all pray for their love and safety, he said. The small crowd bowed their heads. X waited another beat and took his hand away. And with that, I present you all with Michael and Layla Everhart, he said. Clapping rang out and several cheers. Miles wagged his tail and barked. Michael looked to X and mouthed, thank you. Don't look at me, kid. Uh, man, X said, correcting himself again. Kiss your bride. Michael leaned in, kissing her gently on the lips. To no one's surprise, Roger did the same thing to Magnolia, and to everyone's surprise, she didn't slap him. Samson walked over to the table, grumbling about being hungry while the lovebirds embraced. X smiled and cried at the same time as he sat with the others for their banquet, just as they did before a dive. Only tonight, X wasn't going to get plastered and make bad decisions. Tonight he was going to be the king that his people needed before the most important missions of their lives. And perhaps the most important mission since the end of the world. 26. The rain sounded like hundreds of fingernails tapping on the glass. The noise stirred Ada awake. The first thing she saw was two large, gleaming black eyes staring back at her. Startled, she let out a cry that prompted a shrill yelp in reply. She had slept so hard that at first she didn't remember where she was, but the sight of the baby monkey brought everything crashing down. The creatures she had rescued from the island hopped off the bunk and onto the deck of the rocking boat. It's okay, Jojo, Ada muttered. I'm not going to hurt you. She sat up and checked her wrist monitor, shocked to see she had slept for several hours. It was no wonder, really. She had expended much energy launching the boat after first killing a pack of sirens. The launch had gone better than expected, but she had worked for hours to rig the other sails and one still needed patching. She was lucky to be on the water, lucky to be alive and off that nightmare island, lucky to be going home. Now she needed to figure out where home was in this vast sea, and for that she needed the boat's GPS. The monkey grunted and then whimpered. Ada reached out with a gloved hand. Jojo reared back, bearing a slight underbite. The creature's hair was bristly, almost like spikes. She had yet to touch it with her bare hands, fearing that it would transmit some disease. 
A long groan sounded across the vessel's twin hulls. The monkey looked left, then right, and climbed Ada's leg to perch on her lap. The creature let out a purring sound as her gloved hand stroked its back. You don't like boats, huh? Ada said. That makes two of us. The monkey just whimpered. She had no idea what Jojo wanted, so she dug through the supplies she had stowed in front of the control panel. Digging into a pack, she started with food. The little creature didn't seem to want any more fish jerky. She tried water next, mindful of what little she had left, but it wasn't that either. You must just be scared then, huh? Ada said. Lightning forked outside, followed by a loud thunderclap. The monkey didn't seem to care about the noise, but every time a wave jostled the boat, it cried out. Ada picked up the animal again and sat down on one of the chairs in front of the control panel. The screen was cracked, and the controls to the sail wouldn't work without power. The monkey went limp in her arms, and she didn't dare move. She held it for a few minutes, until the bristly back moved rhythmically up and down. Ada gently set the baby monkey down on the pad and covered it with the blanket she had salvaged from her boat. With the creature asleep, she changed into her suit. She had managed to sail out of the obstacle course that was the harbor, but if they were going to find their way home, she must get the battery online. After putting on her taped-up helmet, she returned to the back hatch, stopping first to check on the monkey who was snoring peacefully. Ada slung her backpack and opened the hatch. Wind and rain blasted her, and she quickly closed it behind her. A torrent of electricity flashed through the clouds. The strikes lit up more than just the boat. They showed her a storm front that appeared as a wall of clouds rolling over the water. Cloud towers that looked almost like scrapers rose out of the mass, moving as if they were a floating city. From what she could tell, the boat was heading right for it. Or rather, the mass was heading right for the boat. Grabbing her backpack, she crouched near a hatch. Rain pummeled her as she twisted the screwdriver. Another wave crashed into the hull, splashing her with water. Thunder boomed, rattling the twin hulls. With the hatch open, she shined her flashlight into the battery compartment. A thick, powdery rime of corrosion blossomed up from both the battery's poles. Her heart sank. This could be a lost cause. Still, she had to try. In the pause between thunderclaps and the whistling wind, she heard a familiar crying sound, followed by pounding on metal. Jojo was awake again, alone and probably scared to death. Ada worked faster, scrabbling in the toolkit for the wrench to fit the battery clamps. The battery was old, and while some of them had a theoretically infinite lifespan, its connections hadn't been cleaned in a century or more. Her gut told her the sky people needed her. She wasn't sure why she felt so strong about this. It felt almost like a sixth sense. It was no mistake that she found the note from X when she did. Her heart told her the king needed someone like her who could make tough choices to save their people. Holding two screwdrivers by their insulated grips, she placed the tip of each on a battery pole and bumped the shafts together. She was rewarded with a pop and a spark. Her spirits lifted instantly. The old storage cell still had some juice. If she could clean the poles and cable clamps, she just might be able to get some of that juice to the GPS monitor. What she needed now was something alkaline to clean them with. When she returned to the cabin, the baby monkey jumped onto her, latching around her waist. It held on as she moved over to the little refrigerator. Praying that it had what she needed, she opened the door and groaned. The shelves inside were bare. As she swung the door shut, something caught her eye. Opening the door again, she reached to the back of the bottom shelf and pulled out a small yellowish cardboard box. Yes! She had heard about this old world trick of keeping an open box of baking soda in the fridge. Putting a few ounces of water in a pan, she dumped half the box in and stirred it with a wooden spoon. Then, grabbing a dish rag from the counter, she calmed Jojo and went outside again. She must get this done before the storm arrived. Soon, she had loosened the nut on each battery clamp and got the cables free. Then she wet the dish rag with the baking soda water slurry in the pan and rubbed both clamps and both poles of the battery. They fizzed and foamed, and when she wiped them off, they were gleaming and free of corrosion. 
She reconnected the cables and tightened down the clamps, then closed the battery compartment and went back inside. With bated breath, she flipped the toggle switch powering the GPS monitor. Ada let out a whoop so loud Jojo started whimpering again. There on the monitor was a map of the Caribbean. After soothing the nervous monkey, she brought up her current location. They were way off course, sailing south when they should be going east. Then she typed in the direction she wanted to go and the destination, what had been the British Virgin Islands. The monitor on the control panel brought up a map that showed a line through the water. Not a line, a road to the Vanguard Islands. Again, she thanked all the gods that the machines hadn't been able to shoot down the solar-powered positioning satellites, without which she would be forever lost on a dark ocean. Ada held both fists in the air and gave a slightly more subdued whoop this time. The monkey just looked up at her. We're headed home, Jojo, she said. And I think you're going to love it there. Magnolia had revenge on her mind and a light hangover from last night's celebration of Michael and Layla. The wine had helped numb the pain of her burns, but combining it with the medicine was a bad idea. At least she could hear better. The nanotech gel was a miracle drug even if it made her sick after a few carafes of wine. The burns were already healing nicely. She forced herself out of bed and into the kitchen, where she brewed a cup of Cazador coffee. A gust of cool air blew through the window as she pushed the shutters open. The warmth of the sun on her face helped her feel a little better. That was good. Today was not a good day to be in pain. She had a hundred things to do before they departed on their mission to find and destroy the skinwalkers and the machines. She sipped a steaming mug of coffee at the open window as the sun rose. The shimmering orange ball continued to amaze her every time she woke to watch it rise. It was hard to imagine that the entire world had once witnessed this magic every day. Somehow she was one of the very few privileged to see it now. And that was why she couldn't stop fighting. Mags, Roger mumbled. He sat up in her bed, a hand to his head. I can't find my glasses, he said. Do you know where? He stood and staggered. Ah, I don't feel so good. You drank too much, she said. We both did. And I ate too much. His hand went to his belly. Then he looked at her, squinting without his glasses. Realization crossed his face and his eyes went wide. Did we? He looked down at the crinkled sheets. Magnolia just smiled. Oh, my, my, he mumbled to himself. His eyes flitted back to hers. We finally, she burst out laughing. Roger stared for a moment, then felt about in the sheets until he found his glasses. He put them on and straightened his back, looking like a schoolchild with an important question. Was it? It was great, Rajman, she said. You're more agile than you look, that's for sure. A grin broke across his face. I, I remember most of it, he said. She let his imagination run, but she wasn't about to give him a round two. They had much to do today. Here she said, handing him the cup. Drink up and get your clothes on. We need to get to the marina. As he dressed, the solemn look returned. Their lovemaking hadn't helped his aching heart, but she had at least gotten him to smile and forget about revenge for a while. Twenty minutes later, Magnolia tossed Roger an apple, and they took the elevator cage down to the already bustling docks. Cazadores and Sky People worked together loading boats that ferried supplies to Renegade and Shadow anchored in the distance. She still hadn't talked to X about where she and Roger were going, but she had a feeling the king would want her in the air. As much as she wanted to finish off Carmelo Moretto, she would do what was for the greater good. They would find out soon. X stood at the end of the pier with Tun and Victor. Miles crouched at his side, barking at the water. The dog turned when Magnolia and Roger approached. Hey, boy, she called out. Miles trotted over, tail wagging. I see you two to show up, X said, wiping sweat from his brow. Sorry, we, Magnolia said. 
X had already turned to other things. Normally, she would have expected him to be hungover, but he hadn't drunk a single drop last night and even looked well rested. I need to talk to you both, he said. A lot has happened since last night. He motioned for them to follow him over to the marina, where the Helldivers were loading the last of the supplies to take to Discovery. X kept walking until he got to the moored sea wolf. A humming sound came from inside the vessel. He hopped over the railing and into the cabin. Magnolia and Roger followed, passing the kitchen where she had cooked shark and the bedroom where she had spent many restless nights. The hatch closed behind them, and Dex locked it from the inside. In the control room, she was surprised to find Michael welding on a robot, so early the morning after he'd just celebrated his marriage. But she was even more surprised to see Layla helping. But what shocked Magnolia was what they both were working on. Michael stood and pushed the goggles up over his fresh crew cut. He wasn't working on just any robot. Cricket lay on the deck, cords connecting its torso to the Sea Wolf's display panel. Whoa, when did the bot get back? Roger asked. An hour ago, Michael said. Returned on its own, and I'm trying to figure out why. I didn't even know it was coming back until I woke up. 4.13 this morning, to be exact, Layla said with a roll of her eyes. Sorry, Michael said. I should have checked the signal before we went to bed. If it's here, then we have no idea if the skinwalkers are still at their outpost, Magnolia said. That's true, X said. But we should have a ton of intel on the Outrider, including where the skinwalkers likely are and their numbers. Horn and Moretto are there for sure, Roger asked. We don't know yet, Michael said. The data from Cricket's mainframe is just now being uploaded to the Seawolf's computer system. How much longer, Roger asked. I'm not sure, Layla said. We had a problem getting things connected, but we're good to go now. That's her job, Michael said. I'm trying to fix the outside of our little friend. Two of the drone's four limbs were broken, and the exterior charred and dented. Magnolia was amazed it had even made it back. Well, hell, that makes sense, Layla suddenly said. What? Michael leaned over to look at the monitor on the display panel. I figured out why it came back, she said. The battery unit was almost dead. Michael moved over to the monitor. He shook his head and frowned. I feel pretty stupid, but now we know why the data hasn't been uploading quickly. It's probably on power-saving mode. Layla checked a few things on the monitor and nodded. Yep, that's exactly why. Can you charge it here? Magnolia asked. Yeah, it just takes longer than it would on Discovery, Michael said while changing out wires. Should we tell General Forge? Magnolia asked X. Not yet. They watched Michael and Layla work in silence. Roger paced impatiently. He stopped as a low wail rose in the distance. X went rigid, narrowing his brows. Is that the emergency siren? Layla asked, looking up. Sure as hell sounds like it, X growled. He stopped. Michael, is it also possible Cricket returned because the skinwalkers left the Outrider? Yes, but we won't know until I get this data downloaded, Michael said. Fuck, X shouted. Michael, you and Layla get that data downloaded. Raj and Mags with me. They rushed off the ship and back to where the Helldivers were getting out their weapons. Ted tightened a bandana over his silver hair and Lena loaded a rifle. What's going on? Arlo shouted. Trouble, X yelled back. Magnolia ran after X and the others out into the sunshine. The emergency siren blasted so loud it hurt her injured eardrum. Two militia soldiers came running. One held a handset. Something set off one of our sensors on the border, King Xavier, he said. Give me the radio, X said. The soldier handed it over, and X took off toward the end of a pier where the armored war boat was waiting. Mac and Felipe were in the bow, feeding belts of ammunition through a hatch in the deck. Both men looked up from their work, covered in grease. Magnolia and Roger hopped into the speedboat with X. We got a major problem, Colonel, X said to Mac. You got those machine guns ready? Almost, Mac said. I need them ready in five minutes, X said. He went to the controls and fired up the engine. Mac and Felipe went back to work, while Magnolia and Roger helped unmoor the boat. 
She untied one of the ropes and tossed it to the dock hand as several militia boats full of soldiers cruised away from the piers. She untied the last rope and threw it overboard. Ready, Magnolia shouted. X pushed down on the throttle. Miles barked as they took off, and X yelled over his shoulder for him to stay. Then he turned to Mags and Roger. Get ready, he said. Roger crouched and pulled his small revolver from the holster around his ankle. Magnolia had her sheathed blades and her blaster, but those weren't going to do much good if the skinwalkers had returned. She searched for a weapon, but all she saw were the swords and spears Mac and Felipe had placed on the deck. I need a- Magnolia began. Her eyes lit on the fifty caliber machine gun installed in the bow with the seat and lever that rotated the weapon. She moved to the bow, past X at the controls, stopping behind Mac and Felipe who were still feeding ammunition into an open hatch. X held up a headset to his ear. Then he yelled, Whatever set off those sensors hasn't surfaced yet. My guess is subs. Magnolia had figured this much already, but hearing it sent a chill down her spine. She climbed into the seat and grabbed the machine gun. Almost ready, Mac called out. An explosion of water in the distance confirmed their suspicions. The militia and Cazador vessels that had joined the hunt spread out in various directions, forming a surface net to surround the sub. I've got you now, you son of a bitch, she muttered. Closing an eye, she focused the iron sights where she had seen the geyser of ocean water. Ready, Max said, patting her on the shoulder. He and Felipe both got off the deck and moved behind her with Roger. X yelled into his radio, but she couldn't hear much over the ringing in her ears. Another blast of water exploded into the air, rising above the militia boats, which X had slowed. X also eased off on the throttle, but continued straight for the target. She moved her finger to the trigger. One of the fishing boats suddenly rose into the air, slammed from the starboard side. The impact rolled the boat, sending Cazadores flying into the sea. She lined up the iron sights, ready to fire on the submarine that had rammed the vessel. A wall of water rose along the narrow sub, now on a crash course with their warboat. She pulled the trigger, sending rounds lancing into the water. But instead of hitting metal, they found flesh. Small geysers of blood spurted above the water. Magnolia squinted, not at a submarine, but at a whale the size of one. Memories of the beasts that had sunk Star Grazer surfaced in her mind as she pulled the trigger, firing a burst at the monstrous beast. X turned the boat, and she worked the chair lever to track the creature. Casings pinged off the deck as she fired again. It suddenly vanished under the water, but the trajectory was clear as the sky to Magnolia. The beast was making a run for the Capitol Tower. Clicking noises commanded her attention, and she looked right at a pod of spinner dolphins that had emerged. They must have realized it a moment later, because they all went under and retreated in the opposite direction. A burst of water shot into the sky a few minutes later, and X gunned the warboat toward the surfaced whale. Lumpy pink flesh broke the surface as it took in a breath. It was already halfway to the pier outside the Capitol Tower where dozens of people were working. She sighted in again and prepared to pull the trigger when multiple snake-like limbs writhed out of the water and slapped the mutant leviathan's warty back. A high-pitched roaring sounded above the rumbling engines as the giant octopus wrapped its tentacular arms around the whale. It rolled, throwing up a wall of water and bringing the body of the gargantuan purple octopus above water for a split second. X laid off the throttle and the boat coasted. Mac and Felipe moved up next to Magnolia, both of them throwing their hands in the air and cheering on the octopus they worshipped. She had seen one before but this was a sight for the ages. The beasts fought for minutes, creating a growing red tinge in the water. Dozens of boats surrounded the battle, and on every deck, sailors and soldiers watched in awe. Many of the Cazadores held their spears and swords in the air, chanting for the octopus. In a final effort to shake its attacker, the whale rolled again, revealing bloody wounds across its back and belly. Waves rolled outward, and red bubbles formed as the monsters returned to the depths. The onlookers fell into silent anticipation, waiting for the whale to reemerge. But the only thing that surfaced was more blood. After a few moments, Mac raised his cutlass in the air. Sharpen your spears, brothers and sisters, he yelled.
The octopus lords are with us! 27. Late in the morning before he was to leave for Africa, Les had taken his wife and daughter to an open balcony on the back side of the Capitol Tower. The long platform stretching over the ocean was usually packed with people fishing, but not today. Everyone on the rigs was preparing for war. Do you think I might catch one of those huge whales? Phil asked. Les laughed. Let's hope not, sweetie. Then we'd have to clean it. He had been working on discovery on the rooftop of the shark's cage, overseeing the final repairs when the whale attacked. They were ahead of schedule on the airship, and he had decided to take the rest of the morning off and surprise Phil by taking her here to fish. Catherine sat on a bench behind them, out of the sun, knitting a new pair of socks for Phil. She had seemed surprised when he showed up at mid-morning. Every few minutes, she looked up from her work, smiling. But there was a sadness in her gaze. Les could feel it, too. He was happy to be here with his family, yet his mind was a mess with worry, and he was having a hard time concentrating. Deep down, he felt as if this could be one of the last moments he would ever share with them. Make the best of it, then. He helped Phil bait her hook with a shrimp and cast the line out into the water with the big fishing rod. Keep letting out the line, Les said. We have to go pretty deep to catch a fish here, I think. Phil hung her tongue out the side of her mouth as she let the line out. Every few seconds, she looked for his approval. Keep going, sweetheart, Les said. He wanted her to do it on her own, but the Cazador rods were long for a child and the reels tricky to operate. Once the baited hook was deep enough, he helped her fit the pole into a holder on the railing. Now what? she asked. We wait. They stared down at the clear water. Several boats cruised away from the Capitol Tower. Les glanced subtly at his wrist computer. He couldn't stay much longer, and he really wanted to help her catch a fish before he had to return to Discovery. And he still hadn't told her he was going to Africa. For the next few minutes, he willed his brain and his heart to be in the moment and enjoy just being a father and husband. Fishing in the sunshine was something he had never in his wildest dreams imagined doing with his family. Captain, said a voice. Layla stepped out onto the balcony with Evie, who wore her white officer's uniform with a new lieutenant insignia pinned to the collar. Bags hung under her eyes, and Les realized she had worked through the night. Hey, Phil said. Look, we're fishing. That looks fun, Layla said. Did you catch anything? Evie asked. Not yet, Phil said, but I'm going for a whale, so probably going to take some time. What's going on? Catherine asked. She had gotten to her feet and set her knitting down. We need to speak to Captain Mitchells, Layla said. Sorry to interrupt, Evie said. Les looked to his wife. She nodded and went over to the pole with Phil while Les went to the other side of the balcony with the officers. Sir, we've got Cricket's data all downloaded, Layla said. We're still going through it, but we've got quite a bit of intel already. And? Les asked. We have identified the outpost and their vessels, including two subs and Raven's Claw. Layla raised a brow. Assuming it hasn't left. What about the machines? She shook her head. None that we saw. Cricket didn't detect any exhaust plumes either. So either Horn is lying or they're hunkered down. Precisely. Catherine and Phil chuckled as Phil pointed at something in the water. Sir, there's something else, Evie said. Les brought his attention back to his lieutenant. Since the repairs are ahead of schedule, King Xavier has moved up the launch of Discovery. I just came from the airship, and the bridge is almost operational thanks to Timothy. The airship and the warships are all slated to leave tonight, Layla said. Les felt deflated. He no longer had a day with his family. He had just hours. I want you to know I'll look after Phil and Catherine while you're gone, Layla said. I know, and I appreciate that very much. I wish I could come with. New life is priceless, and it must be protected. It's been an honor serving with you, Captain. Les smiled. 
In some ways, she had been like a daughter to him. He hated not having her on the most important mission of their lives. Layla reached out and embraced him. Please be careful and bring back my husband, she said. I know you will, Captain. Giraffe, please, he said, grinning. I'm sick of being called Captain. I just want to be a civilian again. Soon, she said, when you return. Her voice seemed to catch, but before he could respond, Phil crowed, Dad, Daddy, I got a fish. The pole arched, bending down. He hurried over and grabbed it, pulling it from the holder and spun the reel several times to make sure the hook was set. The fish fought back, pulling hard enough that Les almost lost the rod. Here, help me reel it in, he said. He moved back from the rail and bent down to let Phil grab the reel handle. Twist it, he said. Phil turned the handle, intent on the prize. It's a big one, Papa, she said. Les couldn't see the fish, but whatever it was, it was big. He held the rod as she turned the reel. The three women stepped up to watch. Don't let it get away, said his wife. Phil's got this, Les said. He spotted a long, narrow shadow swimming below the surface. It darted away, then back again. He raised the rod, pulling the fish toward the surface. Faster, he said. Phil let out a grunt. The silvery fish broke through the surface, but then went back under, darting away again. Holy wastes, Les said. Did they have a big tuna on the line? It was so damn fast and powerful. Pulling up on the rod, he got the fish closer to the surface again while Phil spun the reel. When it was just below the waves, Les yanked on the rod, and the fish burst out of the water, somersaulting in the air. He reeled it the rest of the way up until he could grab the line in one hand. Take the rod, Les said to Catherine. She grabbed it, squealing as Les pulled the fish over the railing. He grabbed the back with his other hand and brought it to the deck where he put a knee on the slender body. The fish had to be two feet long, with needle teeth that were snapping at his hand. He glanced up at Phil. You did it, sweetie, he said. You caught a big fish. Phil walked over timidly, staring with wide eyes. What is that thing? Catherine asked. I'm not sure, Les said. Layla bent down. Looks a lot like the crest that Rhino wore, and the ones that Mac and Felipe have on their armor, she said. I think it might be a barracuda. Wow, a barracuda, Papa, Phil said. Les carefully removed the hook from the mouth and then held the fish up in both hands. Want to touch it before I throw it back in? He asked. Phil moved over cautiously. Then she brought up a finger and ran it along the body. The barracuda squirmed, forcing her back into Catherine's arms. Okay, I better get it back home, Les said. Say goodbye. Bye, barracuda, Phil said. Les gently tossed the fish over the rail. It landed with a splash and swam slowly in a circle, stunned. I want to see, Phil said. He picked her up for a better view just as the silver body vanished into the depths. That was so cool, Phil said. Great work, kiddo. You can now tell the other kids you caught a barracuda, one of the fiercest fish in the ocean. She smiled wider and looked up at him. I figured out what I want to be when I get older, she said. A fisherwoman, Catherine said. Phil shook her head. Nope. What then, Les asked. I want to be a barracuda warrior that fights the monsters. Les and Catherine exchanged a worried glance. I better get going, Layla said. She held up a high five to Phil before parting. Good job, little lady. Thanks, Phil said, slapping her hand. Evie smiled at Phil and left with Layla. See you in a bit, Les said. Phil's smile disappeared as Les put her back on the deck. The time had come to tell her the truth about his mission. I wish Trey were here to see me catch that fish, she said. Maybe he's watching from above. Oh, he is, sweetie, Catherine said. Les bent down so he could meet his daughter's eyes. What's wrong? Phil said. She looked to her mom and said, something's wrong, isn't it, Mama? Catherine looked at Les. I'm going away for a while again, 
he said. To fight the monsters? Yes. But this time it's different, he said. I'm going to make sure they never come back again, and that you can fish whenever you want and grow up and be whatever you want to be. When will you be back? Phil asked. I don't know, he said. Hopefully I won't be gone too long. Phil looked at the sky. I want to come this time, she said. I caught a barracuda. I'm strong enough. I promise. Not this trip, he said. But maybe someday. But barracuda warriors don't pout, he said. Barracuda warriors are like hell divers. They don't cry. They just do what they have to do so humanity can keep carrying on. Phil thought on it, then nodded firmly, her pigtails bobbing. Okay, but promise me you're going to be back soon so we can go fishing again. I promise, Les said, trying not to choke up. Just remember, no matter where I am, I'm always here. He tapped Phil over her heart and kissed her forehead. Storm clouds rolled in with the darkness over the Vanguard Islands. X watched the footage Cricket had captured of Raven's Claw. On his tablet, the recorded video feed was grainy, but there was no mistaking the massive Cazador warship that the bastard son of El Pulpo had stolen and sailed to the Outrider. Soldiers patrolled on the deck, wearing human skin over their armor. X zoomed in on the one wearing a horn on his helmet. I'm coming for you, hijo de puta, X said. He set the tablet aside and went back to writing letters. When he finished the last one, he sealed the envelope with a hot wax stamp of the Helldiver Raptor symbol. Writing with his left hand had taken him longer than he expected, and now he was running late for the launches. You'd be late to your own funeral, Sloan had told him. I've never met a warrior who can't tell time, Rhino once said. X put the letters in his backpack and gestured for Miles to follow him out of his quarters. He blew out the candle and shut the door. They took the stairs down to the docks. Dozens of soldiers waited in the moonlight, their armored silhouettes turning in his direction. There would be no ceremony for the departing warriors tonight, no boats with thousands of cazadores holding torches and candles to wish them success on their missions, no flower petals being cast before them to show love for the men and women defending this audacious miracle in the middle of the ocean. Tonight, they were leaving in silence as discreetly as possible. Layla waited on the docks with Phil and Catherine, all of them wearing robes against the unusually cold wind. Michael stood with them, arms around his wife and unborn son. Several other people were outside having said goodbye to their loved ones, while many more were on their balconies gazing out at the warships. King Xavier, Michael said. You ready? X asked. Michael and Layla ended their long embrace, and he hefted his pack and gear. Look after Les for us, Catherine said to Michael. I will. X fished in his bag and handed a note to Layla. Read this after we leave, X said. She took it gingerly, then tightened her grip as the wind gusted. This isn't goodbye, X said. He hugged Layla, then Catherine and Phil and walked away at a brisk pace with Miles by his side. Michael ran to catch up. At the end of the pier, Tun and Victor stood, still as statues, on a boat with a militia soldier behind the wheel. X helped Miles aboard, and off they went. Their destination, Renegade. The warship was fueled and waiting with shadow in the distance. The dark bulk of Elysium came into view in the moonlight. The massive training vessel and flagship of the Cazador Navy carried over a hundred Cazador and militia soldiers manning its cannons and machine guns ready to defend the islands. The ferry bore right, and a rig blocked the view of the flagship. X took a moment to look up at the airship he had called home for nearly all his life. Scaffolding surrounded the sections of the hive damaged by the skinwalker's attack. Sparks showered down from welders patching up the hull. The teams had worked tirelessly to repair the exterior, and engineers were already fixing life support systems inside the ship. X wanted it ready to fly. On the balconies, civilians and militia soldiers patrolled, 
some armed with nothing but crossbows. Everyone had pitched in to fix the hive and to ensure it was defended from another attack at all costs. It's our turn now, buddy, X said, reaching down to pet Miles. X, Michael said. Yeah. Michael unslung his backpack. After the Sky Arena training the other day, I made something for you that I think will help you defeat Horn. He pulled out a contraption with leather straps and buckles. It's not a robotic defector limb, but it should help you handle the spear better, Michael said. Half of it, anyway. He handed the prosthetic arm to X. Go ahead and try it on. X put the contraption around his stump, and Michael cinched the leather straps tight. What the hell am I going to do with this? X asked. Michael picked up Rhino's spear from the deck and clicked the middle, pulling the shafts apart. Then he inserted one into a metal slot in the prosthesis and twisted until it clicked. Go ahead, try it, Michael said. X stood, the spear shaft and blade pointing down. For a moment, he just stared. Swing it already, he said. The shaft and blade whooshed through the air. Michael smiled. The half shaft wasn't heavy and felt natural. After a few swings, jabs, and uppercuts, X smiled too. Pretty smooth, right? Michael said. I borrowed the spear when you were in the library. Had to make a few mods, but it should work. X went to the back of the boat where he could swing without taking anyone's head off. For the first time in weeks, he felt as if he could fight again. Once again, Michael had helped fill him with confidence just as when he gave X the fortune cookie quote on the dive that had separated them for a decade. X raised the blade again. The militia soldier steered the ferry around the decommissioned airship. X spotted motion on the decks of Shadow and Renegade. Even this far away, he could hear the voices of the crew, sailors, and hell divers. X thought of the last decision he must make, one that had burdened him for days now. Miles nudged up against his leg, and again X bent down to stroke the husky, trying to remain calm, even though he felt as if he might puke. He had to face what seemed an impossible task, rallying an army to fight battles he wasn't sure they could win. Miles' touch and the renewed confidence bestowed by Michael's gift did help with the anxiety, though. I really appreciate this, he said to Michael. I wish there were something I could give you to help you take out the machines. Before Michael could reply, the boat slowed, and Victor climbed onto the bow to fend off the hull of Renegade. King Xavier, you go first, Victor said. His English was getting better by the day. The refugee warrior grabbed a rope ladder hanging over the hull of the warship. X turned around and tucked Miles into his improvised canvas pack saddle. Then X hoisted him over his shoulders and started up the ladder. Roger and Magnolia were the first two people X saw when he got up to the deck. All the other divers stood around piles of gear bags they were taking to Discovery. Surrounding the team was a group of barracudas, including Mac and Felipe. They had selected 20 of the best warriors left in the Cazador army to fight the skinwalkers. X looked them over. Many of them were bulky and muscular like Rhino, Whale, and Fuego. There were also lean women like Wendig, and one who reminded him of Sloane. Trusting eyes locked on to X, reminding him of all the dead divers and soldiers who had trusted his leadership. Brave warriors always rose when the brave fell. People like Colonel Mack and Felipe, and General Forge, and several of his officers, fresh off shadow for final orders and Lieutenant Wynn and two of his soldiers recently promoted to sergeant who would stay behind on Elysium. X approached, wondering how many of them would perish. All right, gather around, X said. Imola, up here with me. The Helldivers formed the inner circle with General Forge and his men, while the Barracudas clustered behind them. X dreaded talking tonight, but his words had never been more important. Miles sat and looked up with his sapphire gaze. X smiled at the dog, then spoke. Tonight we embark on two missions to save our home. 
facing dual threats from the very machines that brought our species to the brink of extinction and the evil men who worship those machines. He walked in a circle so he could see everyone while Imola translated. If we defeat our enemies, he pointed his prosthetic spear at the rigs around them, at the hundreds of torches burning on the decks where Cazadores and Sky People had made their homes. Then we will have secured safety and peace for the next generation of humanity. X looked to Michael. Peace and safety for the children who will help us rebuild, repopulate, and thrive. X paused to look at Roger and Magnolia. He had always believed that the only people who could save humanity were Helldivers, which was why he couldn't send them to Africa. The world needed them, and risking them all on one mission again could doom humanity. So he was sending them to Aruba. He couldn't bear to lose Magnolia and Michael, although that could still happen if both missions failed. If they did, there was still one final failsafe, noted in the letters in his bag. Some of you are wondering how we are going to win this fight, X said. Truth is, none of us know how much time we have, but I will gladly die to protect our home. His voice grew louder. I will gladly die for the Helldiver, Militia Soldier, or Cazador Warrior beside me. We win this fight not just through skill and courage, but by relying on the men and women at our side. Michael clapped Roger on the shoulder, and Arlo nudged Lena. All around, the group seemed to come closer together. Cazadores thumped their chest armor and clanked their spear shafts on the deck. Helldivers never give up, X yelled. Even when the odds are stacked against us, we press on. We fight. We are the last guardians of humanity. He raised his spear into the air. We are the soldiers of the apocalypse, and we will fight so humanity survives. The Helldivers and other warriors yelled in unison, raising weapons and fists. Immortal, shouted the Helldivers and militia soldiers. Immortal, shouted the Cazadores. X shook his head. He hated that name, just as he hated being called King. But the chant grew louder, and it only helped their cause. Sometimes it was better to believe in a fantasy than in nothing at all. A humming rose over their voices, and blue lights appeared on the horizon. The chant was drowned out by the whir of turbofans. X lowered his spear and watched as Discovery flew toward their location. There she is, Roger yelled. The Helldivers said their final goodbyes, with Roger and Magnolia hugging Sophia, Edgar, Arlo, Ted, Lena, and the others. X hurried over to his pack and pulled out the letters. He handed the first one to win. If something goes wrong, these are your final orders, Lieutenant, he said. Wynn nodded. Good luck, sir. You too, he said. Defend this place at all costs. X handed two more sealed letters to Michael. Give this to Captain Mitchells, he said. And this one is for you. Michael hugged X harder than ever before. This isn't goodbye, X said again. It's just good luck. The final weapons were distributed, with one laser rifle going to Magnolia, the other to Michael. Not nearly enough, but from what X knew about the top secret plan Timothy and Les were working on, it would help buy them time to destroy the machines. Discovery switched off several of the repaired turbofans as it hovered closer. The rotor wash whipped across the deck. X glimpsed the bow as it approached. The portholes there had been replaced with an armored shell covering the bridge. Samson was up there, along with Les and Timothy. The ship steered directly overhead, and the launch bay doors opened. Alfred's crew of technicians dropped ropes down to the divers. The eight brave men and women selected for the mission hooked in, and waved goodbye. Michael hesitated a moment as he clipped into a rope. Xavier, he said. On the boat, you said you wished you could give me something to help me take out the machines. But you already gave me something more important than any weapon, he said. You gave me courage and taught me how to fight. Taught us all to fight. Michael clipped into the rope and rose into the air. We will win these two battles and the war. Face your future without fear.
28. Ada recited from the note that X had tucked inside the bottle. Handle your present with confidence, she said aloud. The whistling wind answered, followed by a crack of thunder. Rain smacked into her suit and helmet in the torrential downpour. Holding the wheel of the sailboat in her gloved hands, she tried to see through the waterfall running down her taped-up visor. Swells slapped the twin hulls like the arms of some giant sea creature trying to break them apart. Face your future without fear, she said. The storm seemed to respond, slamming her with a gust that almost pushed her away from the wheel. Determined, she held on. Her new companion Jojo was below decks, hiding under the bunk. Trying not to think about the monkey, she brought up her wrist monitor to make sure she was going in the right direction. The Vanguard Islands were another two days' sail, maybe longer. She would be a lot closer had the storm not caught up with her. She looked out over the luminous horizon. Lightning snaked out in all directions, as if she were in a blue bowl of electricity. The storm was growing, and she feared for the mast. Even with the small sails designed for storms, it was being tested near its limit. At least she could operate the mast and sails on her own without a crew. The automated system was easy to operate with battery power. Although having to steer out in the weather wasn't ideal. She would have preferred to do it from the controls inside the cabin, but it was almost impossible to see anything through the clouded windows. Another flurry of wind buffeted her. That didn't bother her. It was the lightning and monster waves that had her on edge. The risk of capsizing grew with every building swell. Keeping the speed of the boat up allowed her to steer away from the bigger waves. The biggest threat was those tall breaking seas that had rolled her last boat. But there were other things out here besides the waves and storm to worry about. Mutant sea creatures the size of her boat or bigger had evolved to live and hunt in the darkness. She tried not to think about what lurked below and focused on the water. As the hours passed, her hands grew numb inside the soaked gloves. Her body began to tremble from the cold water that had crept beneath her suit. She shivered violently. Wet, exhausted, and scared, she wasn't sure how much longer she could stay out here. It was two in the morning, and she hadn't checked on Jojo since before midnight. But even a short break could kill them. One rogue wave catching them broadside would roll them. She remained at the wheel changing her grip and blinking repeatedly to keep her eyes open. Moving around a bit helped get her blood flowing, but exhaustion had no cure besides sleep. An hour later, she felt as if she would soon pass out. A wave bashed against the right hull, throwing the sailboat off course and snapping her alert. The skyline lit up with blue tendrils. Thunder like exploding artillery echoed through the early morning hours. She thought of the Vanguard Islands, and again wondered whether she would be too late to help her people. Every minute that passed, her gut told her something was happening back there that would change the future of humanity. Another tall wave slammed the boat. The sail whipped behind her, the mast vibrating. Thunder boomed so loud overhead it rattled her teeth. She steeled herself. She could do nothing about the lightning, but she just might be able to keep this boat right side up until the storm passed. A strike sizzled into the ocean somewhere in the distance. Turning the wheel slightly, she kept the boat as perpendicular as she could to the prevailing waves, but it wasn't enough, and a crossing wave caught them amidships, nearly knocking her off the boat. Lightning split the sky to westward, where the storm seemed to be the worst. She guided the boat away from it, heading east. An hour later, she reached the edge of the storm, and calmer waters. Exhausted. Ada locked the wheel in place. It was time to take a break and check on Jojo, and she really had to pee. Dry clothes and a bite to eat also sounded heavenly. She checked the sails. Both needed better patching, but that could wait. The main sail was working fine for now. She ducked into the cabin where Jojo waited. The monkey leaped on her, clinging to her leg. It's okay, Ada said. I'm back, and we're going to be okay. The animal whimpered, gripping her leg as she took off her helmet, then her suit. Then she peed in the bucket, put on dry clothes, and got back into her suit. 
After drinking some water and eating a stick of jerky and her last orange, she checked her wrist monitor. They were heading farther and farther off course. It would only add time to her journey, but that was okay with her, as long as they survived. She had plenty of food and water left. What she needed was rest. She went through her pack to find something for Jojo to eat. The sniffling monkey seemed hungry. A piece of fish jerky was the first thing she pulled out. The monkey sniffed at the stick, then bit off a hunk. Ada went to dump out the bucket. Jojo, still eating, shadowed her to the hatch. I'll be right back, she said. Ada got the monkey to back up, then went outside. Lightning burst overhead as she closed the hatch. After discarding the waste into the ocean, she let the bucket collect some rainwater and washed it out. The sea had settled somewhat, but the wind was still brisk, rippling her suit. The moment she re-entered the cabin, Jojo jumped back on her leg, chirping over the howling wind. At least that was what it sounded like. But as Ada closed the hatch, she heard another chirping sound. This sounded electronic. She hurried over to the control panel and the cracked radar screen. The beeping was coming from the speakers every few seconds. Each time, Ada tensed at the sound. Either another vessel was out here, or a sea creature swimming along the surface was big enough to be picked up by the radio waves. But the broken screen didn't allow her to see the range, angle, or velocity of the object or objects. There was only one way to find out. She put her helmet back on and looped the binoculars around her neck. Wait here she said to Jojo, gesturing with her finger. The monkey either didn't understand or didn't care, and followed her to the hatch. There, Ada slung her rifle and grabbed her machete. Weapons at the ready, she went outside. The rain felt like tiny darts being flung at her. She felt as though she was being watched, as if someone or something was looking right at her. Had something spotted her sailboat? She didn't see how that was possible. Statistically, it wasn't likely. They were in the middle of the ocean, a pebble in a desert. She unlocked the steering, just in case she needed to make a run for it. Using the glow of lightning in the storm clouds, she scanned the water with her binoculars, keeping one hand on the wheel as she searched. Several scans in all directions revealed nothing but endless dunes of whitecaps. The storm seemed to be rolling away now, but she feared steering back into it. After another few minutes of searching the water, she decided that it was safe enough to hew closer to the prescribed heading. Recharged from the water and food, she stayed topside for another half hour. Once she was back on course and satisfied they would avoid the storm, she went back into the cabin. As soon as she got inside, she heard the beeping again. It was getting louder, which meant that whatever it was, it was getting closer. But that was impossible. She hadn't seen any vessels, and if one was out there, it had detected her boat and was coming for her. Not necessarily. As an officer on two airships, she had learned a lot about radar and what various images could mean. Although she couldn't determine the object's range or heading, it had to mean one of two things. Either it had found her and was closing in, or the two vessels were sailing toward the same destination. Statistically, nothing else made sense. She grabbed her rifle again and went back to the second deck. Standing behind the upper gunnel, she searched the waters again for whatever boat or ship was heading in the same direction, to the Vanguard Islands. Michael walked to the briefing room on Discovery, trying to keep his mind off Layla and Bray. The wedding ring on his finger was a constant reminder. The old world tradition connected them forever. He massaged the ring, taking comfort in its touch. He'd had plenty of time to think about his family and future during the 30 hours since he left the islands. The airship had been cruising at around 25,000 feet, far above the electrical storms, at an average speed of 150 miles per hour. Michael opened the hatch into the room where the other divers sat contemplating an uncertain future for themselves and those they had left behind at the islands. It felt odd not seeing Magnolia and Roger, but he understood X's decision to send them to Aruba, and he was glad that X would have divers there with him. Briefing starts in a few minutes, Michael said. 
Arlo, Sophia, Edgar, Lena, Ted, and Hector returned to their quiet thoughts. Time was ever the enemy of a Helldiver. There was either too much or never enough. But it was truly an enemy before a mission, especially for the new boots who had so much to think about before the dive. Michael walked over to the wall-mounted monitor and turned it on. A digital map of their current location came on screen. The red dot representing Discovery slowly inched across the Atlantic Ocean. As you can see, we're about to cross into West Africa, Michael said. We'll be some of the first humans to pass the invisible threshold in decades. Damn, that's a big country, Arlo said. There's got to be some survivors living here somewhere. Not a country. It's a continent, Sophia said. Arlo shrugged. Why do you always got to bust my balls about every damn little thing? Ted chuckled and sipped from his flask. Maybe she likes you, Arlo. You ever thought of that? Sophia got out of her chair and knocked the flask out of Ted's hand. Hey, he yelled, shooting to his feet. That was valuable shine. Michael went over to end the fight before it could get traction. Right as he got there, the hatch opened, and a tall figure ducked under the bulkhead. Captain on deck, Michael said, coming to attention. The other divers all stood while Ted and Sophia turned toward Les. At ease, everyone, said Les. Pedro, Evie, and Timothy followed him into the room. Coughing echoed from the passage, and Samson walked in last, holding a handkerchief to his mouth. When he pulled it away, Michael noticed the flecks of blood. The engineer was sick and not getting better. Have a seat, Les said. The divers returned to their chairs, but Ted first reached down and scooped up his flask, putting it back in his vest before the captain could see. Alfred and his two technicians walked into the dimly lit briefing room. The other two had refused to come on the mission, believing it was too dangerous. Michael didn't blame them. He stepped over next to the side of the podium with the Vanguard Islands symbol on the crest. All right, listen up, Les said from behind the podium. We reach our East Africa destination in about 26 hours. We got a five-hour launch jump on Shadow and Renegade, so we'll have boots on the ground at Kilimanjaro about the same time our ships reach the Outrider. If we don't shut down the machines fast, King Xavier and General Forge may have more than skinwalkers to fight. I thought Cricket didn't detect any machines at the skinwalker outpost, Arlo said. Cricket didn't, but that doesn't mean they aren't there, Michael said. Some of the footage was difficult to make out, but at least we know where their barracks and their fleet are. Assuming they haven't left, Samson said. Unfortunately, we have no way of knowing what they discover, since we're now out of range of all radio transmissions. Several divers fidgeted in their seats. So we have no idea what's going on at the Vanguard Islands either, Lena asked. The Vanguard Islands are in good hands with Lieutenant Wynn, Les said. And we're not on our own, Michael said. Don't forget what King Xavier said. He took a moment to look at each Helldiver. We are only as good as the man or woman standing next to us. Never forget that. Indeed, Les said. He walked over to the digital map with Samson and instructed Timothy to pull up the target. A mountain surrounded by green and brown terrain came online. This satellite footage of Mount Kilimanjaro is 258 years old, Les said, so a lot will have changed in that time. But for now, it's all we've got. Pedro walked over to the map, studying it. He turned and said something to Timothy in his native tongue, then pointed to an area on the map and circled it with his finger. Pedro said the history handed down through the generations told of the great battle that occurred somewhere around the base of this mountain, Timothy said. What does great battle mean? Sophia asked. Like ground troops? Or was this a battle in the sky, or both, or what? Timothy asked Pedro, who shook his head, unsure. From what I know about the blackout, there probably wasn't much left of the world's militaries to launch this final offensive, Les said. I doubt anyone had much of an air force left. It was just the airships that survived the EMP bursts and the computer virus. The rumbling deck beneath his boots reminded Michael of the irony. They were on the last known airship in the world, and they were going to use it to destroy the machines. 
Pedro spoke again, and Timothy interpreted. He says the Allied forces were trying to get inside the base, where they could shut down the machines by destroying their mainframe. This was around 250 years ago, time enough for them to build more mainframes or move them. Not necessarily, Les said. He nodded to the AI. Timothy, share your plan. Timothy turned off the map of the target and replaced it with a technical rendering of a DEF-9 unit. The 3D image showed the machine's multi-layered anatomy. An orange visor glowed on a titanium alloy skull with humanoid features. The endoskeleton is a lab-created hyperalloy, Timothy said. Very strong and almost impervious to bullets. The DEF-9 units have a supercomputer the size of a microchip encased inside the skull. To bring one down, you need to destroy either the supercomputer or the battery unit in the chest. But there is another way to bring them all down, Les said. According to Pedro, their mainframe acts as a heart to machines across the world, and Timothy has a plan to destroy it. Les pulled out two metal devices that looked like old-world computer flash drives. He held them up for everyone to see. A virus, he said, the same way they destroyed us during the blackout. Michael was the only other person in the room besides Samson who knew of the plan. He had shared it only with Layla before leaving. It was part of the reason she believed this wasn't a suicide mission after all. There are two ways to end the AI threat, Timothy said. Either by destroying the mainframe with a nuclear blast, or by uploading this computer virus, which will do essentially the same thing by sending a signal worldwide to every DEF-9 unit. You mean a helldiver delivering the virus, right? Lena asked. Correct. How does this virus work? Edgar asked. Quite simply, really, Timothy said. He gave a half smile. The computer virus changes one key component of the machine's programming. To kill humans. So it doesn't destroy them? Sophia asked. No, Timothy said. I designed this virus by uploading a crucial part of my own programming. Never to harm a human. It's genius if it works, Samson said. Les walked back to the screen to look at the technical rendering of the machine. It will work, he said after a pause. And while I would prefer to destroy them, our duty is to protect humanity in any way possible. He switched the screen back to the map. Mount Kilimanjaro is huge, Timothy said. At 5,895 meters above sea level, it's the world's 20th highest summit. A hard slog, but not a technical ascent, so you won't need climbing gear. Still, we don't know exactly what the terrain is like, Les cut in. So we'll approach cautiously and come up with a plan once we're closer. Commander Everhart will explain. Michael stepped in front and said, I've been given the duty and honor of helping plan this mission. After much deliberation, Captain Mitchells and I have agreed we will hover at 40,000 feet, about 10 miles from the target. Here. Timothy marked the spot on the digital map not far from the area Pedro had pointed out, an area of low hills around the base of the mountain where the decisive battle had occurred. From there, we will send in Cricket to access the machine's defenses, Michael continued. If we determine we can get close enough to send a missile down their throats, we'll launch one of the nukes. We expect the base to be buried and heavily defended, Samson said. If I were the machines, I would protect the mainframe with every resource available. And if we can't launch the nukes, Arlo asked. Then we go with plan B, Michael said. Send in the Helldivers, with Les and me leading two teams to deliver the virus that will produce the same effect. I'll take Team Phoenix with Lena, Ted, and Edgar, Les said. And I've got Team Raptor, Michael said. Arlo, Sophia, and Hector are with me. If that happens, Evie and Timothy will man the ship with Alfred and his skeleton crew, Les said. The rest of us will locate the main facility, infiltrate it, and upload the virus. Several of the divers exchanged worried glances. Michael discreetly scrutinized them one by one. Ted was nervously running his fingers through his hair. Arlo doodled on his notepad, making stick figures of what had to be machines. Hector had his arms folded over his muscular chest, showing no emotion. 
Others sought comfort in one another. Michael noticed Edgar brush his finger up next to Lena's hand under the table. She didn't seem to mind. I know what you're all thinking, Michael said. I doubt that, Arlo said. Unless it's that eight of us are launching an offensive against the machines when a worldwide effort failed 260 years ago. You have something they did not, Timothy said. The AI had been uncharacteristically quiet for most of the journey, and Michael was glad to see him speaking up. What's that, you? Ted asked. No, you, Timothy said. Helldivers, Michael said. And a captain hell-bent on destroying the machines, Les said. All I need is for you to show up when the time comes and fight by my side. I'll do the rest. Michael subtly glanced at the tall man. The iron resolve in his features was the same that he often saw in X. Any questions? Les asked. When no one spoke, Michael said, All right, get some shut-eye. We're all going to need it. The divers got up and slogged out of the room with the technicians. They think it's a suicide mission, Evie said. Samson frowned. The chances of success are thin. Thanks for keeping that to yourself earlier, Les said. Timothy cupped his hands behind his back but said nothing, even though he surely knew the numerical odds for success. Michael didn't want to hear the number either. Les shut off the digital map. Let's get back to the bridge, he said. Timothy's hologram was already there. What's our current location? Les asked. Evie took a seat at her station and scanned the weather conditions. We're just passing over the West African coastline, Timothy replied. A place that was called Liberia. And the skies? Les asked. Storms are still 10,000 feet below us, sir, Evie replied. All clear from what I can see. For now. Timothy said, but according to the archives, several nukes were detonated in areas we are traversing. I've adjusted our course, but we will likely experience an increase in storm activity. Okay, Les said. Keep an eye out for hostiles on radar. You really think the machines could have aircraft? Evie asked. There's zero evidence of that. If they had aircraft, they would have found our airships over the years, Michael said. They probably thought we were all dead. Les went and sat in his captain's chair, staring at the section of hull where the portholes had been replaced with lightweight aluminum plates. Michael joined him there for a moment. Across the world, X would be halfway to Aruba, and neither team knew how many hostiles waited at their targets. Everyone remain on high alert, Les said. We're in enemy territory. Anything is possible now. 29. On the voyage to Aruba, Magnolia and Roger had spent much of the first day in their bunk. In fact, it was almost dark when they finally got up to eat dinner in the mess. She couldn't deny how happy she felt. Finally giving herself and committing to Roger after so long was a relief, and her hearing had returned to almost full acuity. Even her charred scalp was healing. He seemed happy too, but there were still moments when she found him staring into space. She found herself drifting also, thinking about what the Helldivers would find in East Africa, and whether she would ever see them again. She feared for Layla and Bray. The human race couldn't afford to lose good men like Michael and Les. There were too few left. She had to hope they would somehow manage to shut the machines down and end the threat once and for all. Not being there to help them weighed on her, and she felt an absence, something she couldn't explain. Both missions needed her, though, and Roger needed her more than anyone. Without her, he would do something stupid that would get him killed. She thrust her legs into her jumpsuit while he looked for his glasses. Magnolia saw them on the deck and scooped them up. Then, still half naked, she placed them gently on his face as a rap sounded on their hatch. A militia soldier named Brett poked his head inside before she could finish dressing. Hey, Mags. Raj, he said. She covered her chest, but Brett remained in the open entryway. King Xavier is sparring with Felipe on the deck, he said. You guys should come watch. Get out of here, she snapped. 
Brett laughed, then shut the hatch. Dickhead, Roger muttered. They threw on clothes and left the quarters. A ladder took them to the upper decks. At the top landing, she put on her helmet over her bandaged head. The few militia soldiers who had accompanied them on the trip were outside in the darkness, weapons cradled, rain pattering on their armor. In the center, X was fighting with Felipe. The young Cazador warrior twirled two blunted cutlasses as he circled X. Max supervised nearby, leaning on his cane. Felipe forced X back with several strikes from his cutlasses, which X deflected with his spear, covered in a lightweight aluminum sheath to protect Felipe. The clang of metal on metal rang out. Felipe lunged and sidestepped with fluid grace, but X appeared slow and sluggish. He was still recovering from his wounds, and he was still getting the hang of the spear. Magnolia had no idea how he was going to kill Horn with half a spear and half an arm. But he had the will, and as they used to say, he would find a way. Soon, Magnolia would also find a way to get her revenge, killing Moretto. The mother of the skinwalker prince had caused many of her own people to die, and what they had done to Sloan made Magnolia shudder each time she thought about it. The gruff militia officer had died trying to protect the Vanguard Islands, losing her skin to the monsters. God knew what else the animals had done to her. Magnolia blocked out the mental images and focused on the sparring session that was starting to look more like a real fight. Felipe swung his right cutlass low, and X again knocked away the blow. A jab with the left cutlass almost struck X in his chest armor. He jumped back and threw an uppercut with the spear, nearly catching Felipe in the jaw. Bien, Mac yelled. Good. The other barracudas drew closer as the session intensified. Magnolia did the same. Lightning split the horizon, illuminating the two warriors. X swiped sideways, the blade coming close to Felipe's neck. Felipe came back with a swing of his right cutlass, which X jumped over. He landed on both feet but couldn't do much besides brace himself against the kick that Felipe planted in the center of his chest armor. Barracudas roared and thumped their spear shafts on the deck. The impact forced X back. He recovered quickly and threw a left hook that hit Felipe in the jaw. The young warrior stumbled backward as the Cazador and militia soldiers shouted even louder. Immortal, Magnolia yelled. Felipe, yelled one of the Barracudas. Mac got between the two, holding up his cane. Good, he said to X. Then he looked at Felipe. Muy bien. Don't stop now, shouted Brett. It's just getting good. Get back to work, Mac said. You're not my CO. Actually, shit for brains, Colonel Mac is your CO, Magnolia called out. Brett glared her way, then motioned for the soldiers to follow him away from the impromptu fighting ring. The Barracuda warriors returned to their duties too, and Magnolia went with Roger to talk to X. He was shaking hands with Felipe, who smiled and then spat blood on the deck. Where you two been? X asked. Haven't seen much of you all day. My head was hurting something awful, Magnolia lied. Roger simply nodded. The king looked at each of them and said, Meet me in the command center in an hour. We need to go over the intel again. Aye, aye, sir, Magnolia said. They went to the mess to get some food while they waited. Imola was a few people ahead of them in the short line. Hey, Imola, she said. Want to sit with us? The scribe turned and smiled politely. He joined them at a long metal table. His plate of grilled sea bass smelled heavenly. But Magnolia didn't have an appetite. Her head was starting to pulse again, and she swallowed another pain pill. Not hungry? Roger asked. You must at least try to eat, Imula said. You will need your energy to fight the skinwalkers. I know. She swallowed a few bites of fish and vegetables. The warship rocked slightly, and their plates slid on the table. Damn boat doesn't help my stomach, Magnolia grumbled. I really do prefer diving to sailing. Roger looked as if he might reply then just shoveled food into his mouth. What's your take on the machines? Magnolia asked Imola. He set his fork down and stroked his long beard. I think that it's a lie, he said. 
that Horn and his skinwalkers have not joined with them, but I do think they worship them. The Cazadores really can be sick, Roger said. But there are some good ones, like you, Rhino, Sophia. There are a lot of good Cazadores, Magnolia said. I grew fond of Lieutenant Alejo in Rio de Janeiro, and General Santiago wasn't all that bad. They both were very brave men and wanted to kill Horn. It's a complicated society, fueled by warfare, not unlike many of the old world societies, Imola said. I firmly believe that the Cazadores' martial ethos kept the metal, er, uh, vanguard islands safe all these years. How do you mean? Roger asked. Did you ever read Niccolò Machiavelli or Charles Darwin? I have, Magnolia said. The state of nature and survival of the fittest, Imola said. The islands are prime examples of these theories in action. If it weren't for the warrior mentality, I'm not sure the islands would have survived. Magnolia agreed with a nod, but she didn't say what she was thinking. That the warrior society hadn't saved El Pulpo from defeat at the hands of her people. Then again, his son could still achieve victory and retake the islands. A group of militia soldiers led by Brett walked into the mess, distracting her from the conversation. Excuse me, Roger said. He got up and walked over before Magnolia could stop him. Great, she whispered. What? Imola asked. Brett halted as Roger approached. Hey, I think you owe Magnolia an apology, Roger said. Brett's eyes went to Magnolia and then Imola. I don't apologize to Cazador sympathizers, he said. What did you say? Magnolia called out. Roger stepped up closer to Brett as Magnolia got out of her seat. You better watch your mouth, Roger said. You're pissing everyone off, and we're not even to the target yet. Brett smirked. Like I give a shit if I piss off. Before the words had left Brett's mouth, Roger shoved him against a bulkhead. He hit it hard, then let out a scream of rage and tackled Roger to the deck. The entire mess hall got up from their seats to watch. Magnolia tried to move in to help, but Roger headbutted Brett in the nose. The crack echoed, and Brett yelped. He rolled off, holding his gushing nose. But Roger wasn't finished yet. He grabbed Brett by the throat, choking him while Magnolia tried to pull him back. Raj, enough, she shouted. Two soldiers crowded around and helped Magnolia pull Roger off. Brett scrambled away, glaring at Roger like a frightened, wounded animal. Get him out of here, Magnolia shouted. Brett pushed out of the soldier's grip and stalked off through the open hatch, again muttering something about Cazador sympathizers. Chest heaving, Roger watched them leave. Everyone in the mess stared at him as he wiped blood from his face. What y'all looking at, Roger said. Imola sat back down and returned to his meal. The sailors and soldiers did the same. Come on, Magnolia said to Roger. They left quickly, not speaking until they got to the CIC. Tun and Victor stood outside the hatch. Magnolia pulled Roger back around the corner out of view. What the hell was that all about? she said. I'm sick of people talking shit. Yeah, but was attacking Brett necessary? Roger didn't reply. Still breathing heavily, he opened the hatch to the CIC. X was there, his spear arm lying across a table covered with several well-worn maps. Miles sat on the deck. You're late, X said. General Forge, Lieutenant Colonel Ranker, and Colonel Mack were also inside, looking out the portholes at the dark water. Shut the hatch, X said. We've devised a plan for recon. I'll let General Forge explain. General Forge stood stiffly, his stone jaw set as he looked over the map. He pointed to a bay and spoke while Lieutenant Colonel Ranker interpreted. The general says this is the location of the outpost, and he's marked where the drone captured footage of Raven's Claw and also the submarines. This is an oil refinery, and part of the reason the outrider was set up. Forge then pointed to several buildings near a sprawling equipment complex. Magnolia had seen the video feed. The pump stations, vacuum pipe stills, and drums were like what she had seen back at the Bloodline outpost. 
This is why we can't nuke the island, X said. The oil in there will determine whether the Vanguard Islands survive or die. Forge pointed to the eastern part of the map and spoke. He says this is where he proposes sending our stealth speedboats, Ranker said. It's a little over a mile hike, and it will allow Renegade and Shadow to stay out of view while two strike teams make sure the targets are still in the same place. What about mines or booby traps? Magnolia asked. There could be some out there, but I doubt they will be anywhere near the route we're taking, Max said. Still, I'll bring my best scouts and mine sweeping equipment. It's a good plan, X said. But keep in mind, this route wasn't in the footage from Cricket, so we have no idea what conditions there will be. The Barracudas can handle it, Max said. I've requested permission to lead the scouting mission, and General Forge has accepted. Good, X said. Forge stepped back and looked at X. He says once we confirm the targets are there, he will attack with the warships and take out the submarines and Raven's Claw, Ranker said. Then you can go in, find Horn, and deal with him and Moretto, if she's there. What? Magnolia asked. What do you mean, if she's there? X scratched his weak old beard. I've got classified information, he said. This doesn't leave the CIC. Okay, Magnolia said. Roger nodded. First, we saw something that makes no sense, X said. He pulled out his personal tablet and set it on the table. Then he tabbed it on and scrolled through to the footage time-stamped ten hours and fifty minutes into Cricket's mission. Here, X said, pointing to the frozen frame. Magnolia and Roger looked down at what appeared to be a group of people in black suits walking outside a building at the oil refinery. But these weren't the skinwalkers Magnolia remembered. They weren't wearing armor or human hides nor did they carry weapons. Who are they? Magnolia asked. We don't know, X said. They are in Cazadores, Max said. I can tell you that much. There are too many of them to have been crew from Raven's Claw. Maybe they're people from bunkers or ITC facilities that Horn kidnapped and enslaved, Magnolia said. That's my guess, but there's no way to know from the video, X said. What it boils down to is the Skinwalker army could be bigger than we thought. I still want to know what you meant by if Moretto is there, Roger said. Like I said, I was going over Cricket's footage again, X said. I noticed something and double-checked with several others. But there is no evidence that Colonel Moretto is at the outpost. Not a single video feed captured her. Magnolia swallowed, implications sinking in. You gotta be fucking joking, Roger said. Do you think she's... Magnolia began to say. I think it's possible she never left the islands, X said. We have to warn Lieutenant Wynn, Magnolia said. X shook his head. We can't break radio silence now. Wynn is prepared for an attack, and I trust him to hold security while we're away. We're making good time, Max said. At this rate, we'll be there in less than 24 hours. We're ready, X said. More than ready, Roger added. I'm going to find that murdering witch, and then I'm going to burn her alive. 30. All hands approaching target, ETA 15 minutes, said Les. He put the handset back in its cradle. This was the moment they all had been waiting for, the moment he had visualized since Trey's death. Almost sixty hours into their journey, they were nearing their destination above Tanzania, the home of the machines. If all went to plan, they would deploy Cricket in a few moments for a first glimpse at a zone no one had laid eyes on in decades. Skies are clear, Captain, Evie said. She twisted from her station. Only minimal storms from here to Mount Kilimanjaro, and zero sign of hostile contacts on radar. Captain Rolo reported the same thing. Clear skies, then... Les suddenly had a feeling he knew exactly what had happened to the airship that crossed the ocean before discovery. Timothy, you have the ship, he ordered. Keep us in the cloud cover, all systems in stealth mode. Samson, everything looking good with the weapon systems? The lead engineer stood over a station. He coughed into a hanky and glanced up. 
Sorry, he grumbled. This damn, he coughed again into the handkerchief. All weapons are primed and ready, he finally said. And we have our defensive flares ready to deploy. Good. I'm heading down to oversee the launch of Cricket. Samson went back to coughing, and Evie turned to her monitor. The closed hatches in the passage leading from the bridge reminded less of all the people who had lived here after Michael and his team found the ship at the hilltop bastion. It was no longer a life barge. It was a weapon. By the time Les arrived at the launch bay, the two teams of hell divers were suited up and ready. Michael crouched in the center of the open space, working on cricket with Alfred and another tech. Two open crates of tools lay on the floor next to the crates of machine guns and blasters. Captain on deck, Ted said. Not a captain now, Les said. As you were. He thumped the Team Phoenix logo on the breastplate of his Helldiver armor. I'm one of you all. Ted, Arlo, Sophia, Edgar, Hector, and Lena all formed a line beside Michael. They looked ready for battle. They wore bandoliers of shotgun shells and armor-piercing rounds, and blasters and knives were sheathed on their hips. Vests over their armor held extra magazines and grenades. Edgar, the best marksman of them all, had a slung sniper rifle that fired the armor-piercing rounds, the same model of weapon that Aaron Jenkins had used to take down several machines at Red Sphere. But there was one thing they lacked. Only one precious EMP grenade remained in their stockpile. Michael had it in his gear. He also carried the one laser rifle and one of the USB sticks containing the virus that would reprogram the machines. Les carried the other. They looked like two teams of special operations soldiers from the old world. But if they did dive, they would face an enemy designed to be a more efficient killer than any special forces soldier ever to walk the earth. We're ready to dive, sir, Michael said. Indeed you are. Les replied. How is Cricket coming along? We're making some last-minute changes to his system that will lighten his carbon signature and maybe keep him invisible. Michael tapped his wrist computer, and the robot chirped. The hover nodes spun, but without the glow of before. You'll have to move slow on the surface, Alfred said. There's not much we can do about the exhaust from his thrusters. The divers all followed the drone across the open space. Les walked over to the portholes by the launch bay doors. It was the middle of the afternoon, but the sky was a deep charcoal gray with no hint of sunshine bleeding through. Timothy, take us down to 15,000 feet, Les ordered into the headset. Slowly and cautiously. First sign of any hostile contact, you haul ass out of here. Understood, sir. Les went to his locker and carefully peeled the giraffe picture Phil had drawn off the metal door. She had added a mother and two baby giraffes to the image. It was the only picture of his family he had. With the utmost care, he tucked the piece of paper into his vest. Then he walked back to grab a blaster from the crate. He sheathed it and started the manual process of checking his systems. The airship switched to turbofans, lowering through the sky without a lick of turbulence against the hull. Phoenix One online, Les said. Phoenix 2 online, Ted said. Phoenix 3, good to go, Edgar added. Me too, Lena said. I mean, Phoenix 4 ready. Team Raptor went through the same routine with Michael, Arlo, Sophia, and Hector all confirming that their systems were working properly. What did you paint on your dome? Lena asked Arlo. Thunder and Lightning, he replied. My two different nicknames. Who's calling you Lightning now? Michael asked. Arlo smirked, exposing a missing tooth. I believe she actually called me El Relampago. Gross, Sophia said. And I think you mean El Poco Peso, as in lightweight. Okay, let's get serious, people, Les said. He appreciated a little humor to take the edge off before the mission, but they were in enemy territory on what could be a turning point for humanity. Evie, how's it looking up there? Les asked over the comms. Sir, I'm picking up some sort of heat signatures on the surface. Les looked out the portholes and saw nothing through the darkness but clouds. The other divers tried to get a glimpse of the ground. At 18,000 feet, Les turned to the techs who were going through final prep on cricket with Michael. 
They checked the newly installed cameras and each of the jointed mechanical limbs. Two of the extensions were made of scrap metal, but they looked secure. I don't like sending Cricket in without any weapons, Michael said to Les. Not a lot he can do against the machines anyway, right? Edgar said. He sure kicked some skinwalker ass and saved our hides from them back in Rio. But this time he's just doing recon. Michael patted the robot. Nearing launch altitude, Samson reported over the comms. All non-critical systems are ready to go dark on your mark, Captain. Stand by, Les said. That also means no external comm use unless necessary. Everything is internal for now, Les said. Everyone got it? Ted, Arlo, I want to see nods, Michael said. Both helmets dipped. Les waited another moment before he gave the order. The lights winked off throughout the ship, leaving the launch bay in near darkness. Emergency lights came on, emitting a red glow in the corners of the room. Michael patted Cricket on the back as he might a human friend. Be careful down there, buddy, he said. I know you'll make me proud again. Cricket chirped as it hovered toward the launch bay doors. Alfred and team, get back to the secure area, Les ordered. Rest of you, behind the red line. The technicians followed Alfred's flashlight to the exit as Les moved behind the red line with the other divers. The AI's hologram appeared in the middle of the launch bay, but even it was dimmed almost to invisibility. Once Alfred and his men were outside in the hallway, Les gave the order to open the launch bay doors. They let in the gusting wind and revealed the dark skies over Africa. Michael typed commands into his wrist computer. Cricket's hover nodes whirled, propelling it forward. Godspeed, Les said. The drone passed the threshold outside the ship and into the black. It hovered for a moment, then dropped like a rock, vanishing from view. The doors closed, and the divers went to the portholes. But, as before, they could see nothing but random lightning streaks in the soupy black. Timothy, take us down to 12,000 feet, Les said. Michael watched the robot's descent on his monitor. 13,000 feet and lowering, he said. Should be getting a visual of the surface in a few seconds. Timothy, Evie, sit rep, Les said into his headset. The internal comms crackled with static. No change in weather conditions, Evie reported. Just a few pockets of heavy clouds and sporadic lightning. The heat signatures are still coming through on my scans, and best I can tell, they seem to be isolated to six or seven locations. Any idea what they are? Les asked. Looks too small to be fires of any size, she replied. Samson, Timothy, you got any ideas? Les asked. A few theories, but... Les staggered as a pocket of turbulence rocked the vessel. White clouds blocked the view through the portholes. Evie, talk to me, Les said. Just some turbulence, sir. We're hitting a patch of clouds. Les managed his nerves with deep, slow breaths. 3,000 feet, Michael said. Turning on the hover nodes in T-3. Two. One. He tapped his wrist monitor. Les pictured the drone suddenly halting in the sky. Okay, switching feed to our HUDs, Michael said. In the subscreen at the upper right corner of his visor came the grainy footage from one of Cricket's cameras. Les strained to make out the picture. I don't see shit, Ted said. Wait a minute. Need to switch on night vision, Michael said. He tapped his monitor again. There was no mistaking what came on the subscreen this time. Wow, Lena said. I never knew the surface was so colorful. The drone descended over many acres of flat ground covered in glowing purple and red forests. But it wasn't the vibrant jungles or the open fields of blue weeds that amazed Les. It was the snow-capped mountain in the distance. Mount Kilimanjaro, he said. That's our target, Ted asked. You see any other mountains out here? Arlo asked. Switching feet again, Michael said. Another view came online to the east of the mountain. The terrain in that direction seemed desolate, with hardly any flora growing on the sand-colored dirt. The desert stretched to an area near the base of the mountain where fields of purple grass and weeds grew. Dense red jungles snaked up into the rocky slopes. But something didn't fit with the mutant landscape on the southern base of the mountain. 
Massive tubes the color of dirty eggs reached toward the clouds behind the foothills. The towers were human in origin. Or machine. Can you zoom in on those towers? Les asked. Gotta get closer, Michael said. I'm taking Cricket down to 1,000 feet, okay? Roger that. Waiting for the bot to get into position, they gazed at the vast purple fields and jungle carpeting the hills. From this vantage point, it was almost impossible to see any sign of bipedal life, or machinery for that matter. Most of the trees had red umbrella canopies and thick curved trunks. Les had never seen any like them. The jungle thinned, giving way to dry riverbeds and cracked earth. Cricket flew slowly, giving them a panoramic view. Steady, buddy, Michael said. He tapped his screen, slowing the drone's thruster speed as it approached the silos they had seen east of the mountain. What are they? Sophia asked. Must be the source of the heat signatures, Les said. They look like smokestacks from old world factories. Why would the machines have factories? Lena asked. No one had an answer. Not even Timothy hazarded a guess. As Cricket got closer, it became apparent they had found part of the machine's base. According to the data Cricket was sending over their HUDs, black metallic buildings made up the interior of a compound the size of four Old World city blocks. In the center was a rectangular metal tower with a spike on top. Warehouses and small structures all the same metallic color surrounded the tower in neat rows. Several radio towers rose along the base of the mountain. There were satellite dishes, too, some of the biggest Les had ever seen. Perfect for sending the signal out if he uploaded the virus successfully. Timothy, you seeing this? he asked. Yes, Captain, Timothy replied. And I'm mapping it to upload to your huts. I've located two main roads so far, twenty buildings, and... What is it? Les asked. I'm detecting movement in the feed. Where? Les saw the vehicles before the AI responded. From this height, they were hard to make out, but they had central turrets like those on a tank built on a central core unit. But they differed from old world tanks in one major way. Instead of tracks, each had six segmented beetle-like legs, but they were anything but slow. Les watched as they ran at an alarming speed down a road curving through the rocky foothills. Commander Everhart, I would highly recommend pulling Cricket out of there, Timothy said. I think our robot friend has been compromised. Michael tapped at his monitor, cursing. On the screen, the tanks bolted away from the compound, their jointed legs pounding the ground. They halted at a wall built into the rocky landscape. It was hard to say how tall, but it looked thick. The entire area seemed to be one massive fortress that made the most of the terrain. Beeping sounded from the wall-mounted speakers. What is that? Les asked. It's an alert, Timothy said. I set it up should any sensors detect exhaust plumes. Les felt his pulse ramping up. How many is it detecting? He asked. Hard to say. Give me a minute. Cricket had turned now to retreat, but its cameras were still on the compound. The tanks remained at a gate in the fortress wall. Cricket was flying back toward the jungles now, passing over the last stretch of desert. This time, Les saw something else on the subscreen. It looked like mounds in a rocky field. Zoom in on those, he said. Michael tapped his wrist computer and the drone's cameras focused in on the rocky field. Now have him zoom in on those humps in the earth, Les said. The image clarified further, confirming his fear. They weren't rocks. They were weapon nests. Cannons protruded from the ground, and these were just the ones he could see. Those are some big-ass guns, Arlo said. Les considered having Cricket search for more of the hidden emplacements so they could try to take them out, but he had a feeling more defenses were buried out of view. The weapons confirmed what he had already known. Plan B was the only option. Do we even have enough missiles to take them out? Ted asked. No, Timothy said. Not from what I have already seen. Get Cricket out of there and have it return to the launch bay, Les said. Michael nodded and tapped his screen again. Not too fast, Timothy said. You don't want the thrusters to give away. It was already too late. 
several red streaks darted into the sky. Not cannon rounds. These were lasers. One of them struck Cricket, and the view went topsy-turvy as the drone fell. Shit, 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 Michael said. Turn the hover mode back on, Timothy said calmly. I'm trying, Michael snapped. The drone continued to plummet, the view of the sky and ground spinning. One of its arms had sheared off. The divers crowded around Michael. He tried to regain control of the drone, but time was running out. In just seconds, it would hit the dirt. Evie, any sign of hostiles in the sky? Les asked over the internal comms. Negative, Captain, she replied. What's going on out there? No, please, come on, Michael said. He kept tapping the monitor, trying to activate hover mode. Cricket, come on. Please, buddy, don't do this to me again. The nodes finally switched back on around a hundred feet from the surface, but it wasn't enough to prevent the drone from crashing. Dust bloomed out around the feed on their subscreens. The divers stood watching as if in a trance. Like less, they were staring at their huds, waiting for the dust to clear. When it finally did, a view of the desert came into focus. Spindly foliage protruded from the cracked earth. Somehow, the camera feed continued. Can you move, Cricket? Les asked. Michael's helmet shook. I've lost control of all motion systems. The only thing I can move is the camera. Sir, can you zoom in? Arlo said. On what? Michael said. Those skeletal tanks. I think this isn't just a desert, Sophia said. Michael zoomed the camera in on white bones sticking out of the ground. It's a graveyard, she said. The launch bay fell into silence as the drone's cameras provided a panoramic view of a battlefield. Hundreds of bones, some of them still in helmets and armor, littered the sand-colored dirt. Les saw several weapons with rusted barrels strewn about. The remains of thousands littered this one dry field alone. And for every ten human skeletons, there was one destroyed machine. Les broke the silence that hung like humidity in the launch bay. If they didn't know we're here before, they do now, he said. Get us out of here, Timothy. We'll be diving in after all. 31. X stood with Miles on the platform outside Renegade's command center, watching the dark water. He pictured Ada out there, trying to row across the rough sea to Florida, if she was even still alive. Hang in there, kid. She would still be a long way from his old apartment, but he hoped the survival gear and the note, if she found it, would help get her there safely. It would take a miracle, but he hoped to see her again someday. A light rain drizzled down, dripping off the overhang that shielded X and his dog. Here they were together again, out in the wastes. Just like old times, buddy, X said. Miles wagged his tail in his hazard suit but only for a few half-hearted strokes. About how I feel, too, X said. He glassed the horizon with binoculars and his NVGs. Clanking sounded from the hatch that opened onto the platform. Tun and Victor turned from their post, but seeing only Magnolia and Roger, they relaxed. Sir, we're closing in on the location General Forge selected for Anchorage, Magnolia said. Sonar and radar look clear for subs and surface vessels. We're ready to go when you are. You sure you're up for this? X asked. Your head... Is fine, she interrupted. You know I'm ready, Roger said. Miles looked up at them both, then nudged X as if he could understand what they were talking about. On the deck below, the barracudas were moving about. Most wore full protection from radiation, even though historical records put the outpost in a green zone. The militia soldiers hung out on the opposite side of the deck, watching and not helping. As long as the two sides didn't fight, X didn't really care. He glanced west. At Shadow's bow stood the silhouette of a Cazador soldier in full armor. X turned off his optics. Lightning illuminated the orange cape flapping behind the man's armored shoulders. Forge stared into the distance. X had met with him several times on the journey and had grown to respect him more each time. Like X, 
The general had no wife or kids. He had given his life to the Cazador military. But he wasn't savage like so many others. He was strategic and intelligent. And while he wasn't Rhino, X was starting to trust him. After all, he had kept the secret that could have caused a war, and he had given up the precious nanotech gel to help X heal, not to mention helping save the Capitol Tower from the sirens. X turned his NVGs back on, searching the ocean for a glimpse of what awaited them. Being in the dark both literally and figuratively was gnawing on his sour stomach. He had no idea what was happening in Africa. The team would have arrived by now. He also had no clue whether Horn or his evil mother was even on Aruba. He doubted that Moretta was still back at the Vanguard Islands, though. If she had somehow swum to another rig after jumping off the hive, they would have found her during their sweeps after the attack. If X had to guess, she had made it to a submarine and was now hiding in a bunker. When X found her, it would be a nice surprise. He was distracted by the sound of someone shouting in Spanish. It was coming from the deck. At the rail, a pair of Cazadores looked over the side as a clanking sound rang out. They were anchoring. The Barracuda soldier switched to English. Launch the boats! X patted Miles on the head, then went to the lower deck with his team. Mac greeted them there. He wore his armor and had a helmet tucked under his arm. I guess you're coming with us, Max said. You guessed right, X said. And Roger and Mags are coming too. Victor and Tun stepped forward. Oh, and my friends Tun and Victor, X said. We're all coming on the recon mission. All around them, the deckhands, sailors, and soldiers went into action. The anchors went over the side of the warship, splashing into the choppy seas. Pulley systems dropped the black fiberglass boats into the water. The militia soldiers continued to watch the Barracudas without offering to help. One of them, Brett, seemed to be laughing. X had heard in passing about a problem between Brett and Roger. He walked over to the militia guards, Miles at his side. Brett, X called out. The young soldier turned. I've got a job for you. Yes, sir, Brett said. He stood ramrod straight, showing X respect that he had lacked with Roger and Magnolia. Watch my dog, and make sure he doesn't get a scratch while I'm gone, X said. Anything happens to him, you'll have worse things to worry about than the skinwalkers. Brett looked down at Miles. Got it, X said. Yes, King Xavier, sir, Brett replied. X patted him on an armored shoulder pad with the blade of his spear. Good man. He returned to the rail where the barracudas were preparing to climb down to the boats already lowered to the water. The strike team was twelve strong, with Felipe and Mac leading. X looked at his dog one last time and pointed his spear at Brett. Not a scratch, X shouted. Brett raised a hand in acknowledgement. A line had formed at the two ladders leading to the boats below. X got behind Magnolia and Roger while Tun and Victor slung rifles and traded their spears for cutlasses. X had a blaster, a three fifty seven Magnum revolver, his captain's sword, and the half-spear attached to his arm. The other half of Rhino's spear was sheathed over his shoulder. Let's go, Roger yelled. Several barracudas waiting to climb down turned toward him. X pulled Roger aside. Hey, Roger protested. Cool it, man, X said. I know what you've lost, but no one should be eager to kill for revenge. It results in bad decisions. Trust me. Every man is different, Roger replied coldly. You should know that better than anyone. He returned to the line behind Magnolia. She looked at X before carefully slipping her helmet over her bandaged head. It wasn't just Brett who had an attitude. Roger was losing his cool and putting them all at risk. X was starting to regret bringing him along, but the sneaky diver was known to stow away on ships, and he would have found a way out here regardless. X climbed down with Tun and Victor to one of the boats. Roger and Magnolia got into another. 
For a fleeting moment, X considered yanking Roger and locking him in the brig until he got his head on straight. But he didn't get the chance. Max swirled his finger through the air, telling the pilots to start their engines. The two sleek boats sped away from the warship. General Forge remained on the deck. He held up a cutlass and yelled at the departing boats. What's he saying? X asked Mac. We have the octopus lords on our side, he replied. Victory is ours for the taking. X raised his spear arm to the general before turning back to the bow. They thumped over the waves for the next twenty minutes, beating around to the other side of the island where they would beach and trek in. Lightning streaks provided an almost constant blue glow over the water, and not long into the ride, a soldier spotted the landmass. Felipe handed X a pair of binoculars. Through them he could see a shoreline of sandy beaches. The recon boats rode the waves staggered in a combat interval. The black vessels would be almost invisible to the naked eye, and the lightweight fiberglass hulls would help keep them off radar. They slowed on the approach to shore. Nature had retaken this area, with thick jungles growing to the high tide boundary. X scanned with his NVGs for several moments, but saw nothing moving in the underbrush or around the trunks of trees. The canopy towered over the shoreline, some of the mutant palms leaning over the sand. Victor pointed his rifle at the beach, and X brought up the binos again. A pole stuck out of the ground, a skull mounted on top. The sight didn't seem to bother Mac. He motioned for the teams to beach. As soon as the boats hit solid land, the warriors jumped out and pulled them up. X noticed several more shriveled heads and skulls on spikes farther down the beach. While the other soldiers worked to cover their landing, he went to the nearest spike. Magnolia joined him to examine the egg-shaped head without eye sockets. It's a siren, she said. Lovely, X said. Behind them, several soldiers used palm fronds to sweep the tracks away, leaving no trace of their landing. Once the boats were securely stashed under camouflage tarps, the two strike teams set off into the jungle. Felipe and another soldier, both with mine sensors, took point. They moved quickly, but cautiously, trying not to disturb any of the underbrush. Several barracudas used their machetes to hack away the poisonous plants and open a doorway for the teams. X used his captain's sword and his spear to push away limbs covered in pinecone-like growths. Several burst, covering his blade in goo that stretched into a web. The Cazadores worked their way through the foliage, hardly making a sound despite their bulky armor. It was all too reminiscent of his first mission with the Barracudas, almost a year ago, when he was not their leader, but a prisoner. Only Rhino, Wendig, and X had survived the journey. The two warriors would live on in his mind as long as he drew breath. Max stopped ahead and held up his prosthetic hand. A cawing sound echoed through the canopies as a bird with a beak the size of its head took flight. The teams pushed onward, fanning out and navigating the dangerous passage with the two mine detectors on point. X ducked a branch covered in spikes. Magnolia kept to the right, using her curved blades to plow the way for Roger. The jungle gave way to a clearing where the barracudas had taken up positions behind boulders covered in bird guano. X joined her and Roger at the low rocky escarpment bordering an open field that separated them from the oil refinery and ruined old world resorts. Patches of weeds grew out of dirt blanketed in gray ash. Wind turbines, 200 feet tall, stained mostly black with time, stood like giant sentinels. Several of the blades had broken off over the years, and one stuck out of the ground like a massive spearhead. X noticed several skeletal objects that looked almost like huge insects clinging to some of the poles. More hung from the turbine blades as if they had been caught in a spider's web. Mac ignored these also. He gave Felipe and the other point man the signal to advance. They set off first, swinging their elongated mine detectors with a ten-foot range. Once they reached the turbines, Mac sent the next group. The divers and the barracuda's matte gray armor matched the color of the ash. But X worried about their tracks. Glancing behind them, he saw no way to avoid leaving evidence without taking extraordinary measures. 
The barracudas didn't bother trying to erase the tracks as they had on the beach. Next, Mac gestured to X. Tun and Victor went ahead of him, their round shields slung over their backs, rifles up. X sheathed his sword and held his blaster in his left hand. He couldn't fire a rifle accurately anymore, but with a blaster, he just needed to aim in the enemy's general direction and pull the trigger. He took another look at insect remains or whatever was clinging to the poles. Coming closer, he realized they weren't mutant bugs, but human skeletons, and maybe some siren. The brooding turbines were like massive scarecrows to scare off man and monster, using corpses of the skinwalkers' victims. But the barracudas weren't deterred, and neither was Magnolia. She was the first of the three divers to reach one of the turbines. Mac got there next and raised his fist. The barracudas crouched in the field, keeping low. X did the same thing, and Roger followed suit. After a brief conversation with Mac, Felipe took off toward the next landmark between the teams and the target, a row of silos and shipping containers. Using his mind sensor, he cleared a path there, stopping several times to flag mines. General Forge had mentioned the possibility, but their presence still made X uneasy. Felipe finished his sweep and vanished into the maze of structures. He returned a few minutes later, running in a low crouch. Max spoke to the young warrior, then came back to X. Felipe says the area is clear, he said. But we have to move through those silos to get to the buildings. From there, we should be able to see the harbor and the outpost. You might want to hang back a bit, King. Forget it. I'm coming. Okay, let's move out then, Max said. The soldiers took off in combat intervals along the path Felipe had swept earlier. Something felt off to X as he followed them, as if they were being watched. By man, monster, or machine, he couldn't say. Then again, there wasn't much difference in this place. Tun and Victor seemed nervous, too, as they moved toward the shipping containers. The first of the strike team took up position there while the single file moved along the cleared path. Once they were all there... Mac again signaled to advance. This time, X followed Felipe, who pointed with his cutlass inside the open door of a container. Stacked cages contained the remains of several sirens and other mutant beasts, decomposed to just bones. The next shipping container had two gurneys holding human skeletons, both of them missing their limbs. Tun and Victor stopped to look, no doubt recalling the horror they had experienced at the hands of El Polpo's army. X patted them both on the back and kept moving. Several spiny rats skittered out of another container, leaving wet tracks in the dirt. A glance inside revealed fresher kills. X flicked on his helmet light over a limbless body on a table. The corpse had on one of the black suits he had seen in the video footage captured by Cricket. He held up a hand to Magnolia and then went inside. His helmet beam illuminated a humanoid male face on the table eyes closed. He stepped over for a better look. Something about this man seemed off. Higher cheekbones and smooth, almost plastic-like skin. But this was real bone and flesh, so not a robot. Moving to the head, he sheathed his blaster so he could open the eyelids. The orbs were pure black. That was when X noticed the ITC logo on the breast of the uniform. He reeled away from the table. Ax, what is it? It was Magnolia's voice. I think I found out who those people in the video were. Magnolia walked into the container, and Ax pointed with his spear. Genetically engineered humans, pre-siren stage, Ax said. Horn must be raiding ITC facilities to build an army and a workforce, and for meat on the hoof. Sick. Bastard, Magnolia said. What are you doing? Roger said quietly from the open door. Oh, shit. The three of them went outside and followed the barracudas through the maze of meat lockers. At the end of the lot, they reached a fence topped with razor wire. The refinery was just on the other side, its silos towering in the air. Forking electricity illuminated more skeletal remains on pikes. The team split up and snipped through the fence at two entry points. Two roads ran between the wide silos. 
The soldiers walked slowly, eyes roving for hostiles. Felipe led the way with his mind detector. At the halfway point, Max sent Felipe up one of the ladders to look around. He handed his minesweeper to another soldier who started sweeping while the rest of the team waited. X took up position at a silo across from Roger and Magnolia, who crouched behind the rusted hulk of a pickup truck. He looked toward the buildings beyond the silos. An old world tanker truck, its tires long gone, sat alone in the empty parking lot. Beyond the lot, several structures with broken windows and sunken roofs overlooked the beach. The harbor where the Skinwalker ships were docked in Cricket's recon images wouldn't be far. It was possible Felipe could see them from the top of the oil silo. If he did, they could radio General Forge, and the attack could commence. Felipe stopped halfway up the massive silo and looked, then kept going. Screw this, Roger muttered. He got up and went to climb another ladder, ignoring X's signal to get down. God damn it, X muttered. He hurried over and got to the silo just as Magnolia yanked Roger down. You're really starting to piss me off, X growled. Me too, Magnolia said. I'm just... Before Roger could reply, a flare shot into the air, bursting in a bright glow that lit up the refinery. Down, Mac yelled. Automatic gunfire sounded, and a muzzle flash came from the top hatch of the tanker truck in the parking lot where a soldier had popped up with a large machine gun. Green tracer rounds streaked across the two roads between the silos from another position that X couldn't see. Two barracudas crouching in the open went down before they could find cover. One lost an arm at the elbow, and the other lost half his helmet in an explosion of armor, blood, and bone. A barracuda ran over to take cover with X, but was cut down by rounds punching through his chest armor. He landed on his side, and despite the devastating injuries, managed to start crawling. X Crouch walked out to help, but Magnolia pulled him back as bullets kicked up a spray of earth on their way to the fallen soldier. His blood spattered X's armor. The barracuda jerked and then went limp. Tun and Victor were holding their shields at the silo across from X, waiting to make their move across the stream of fire, but he waved them back. Stay there, X shouted. He was no stranger to combat, but the flare and ambush had caught him off guard. He watched the armless Casador crawl for cover, only to be shredded by more gunfire. An explosion boomed in the distance, rumbling the silo X hid behind. Two other barracudas got up to lay down covering fire, but the men they were trying to protect were cut down as soon as they took off running. In a brief lull, X heard Mac shouting over all the other noises of war. The booming voice snapped him out of the shock. He got up to look for another way out, that was when X saw a figure on the silo that Felipe had climbed. This wasn't Felipe. It was a man holding a knife to Felipe's throat. He kicked Felipe's helmet off the roof, attracting Magnolia's attention. X could see the young Barracuda's tattooed face and the glow of the parachute flare. His eyes were proud. No sign of fear. Magnolia raised her laser rifle just as the skinwalker traced the blade across Felipe's throat, and pushed his body to the ash below. 32. A third of a world away, 40,000 feet in the sky, Michael thought of X as discovery hovered over enemy territory. He felt a queasiness in his gut from the fear that something had happened to X. He shook it away. They had already lost Cricket, and now they were facing an impossible decision. This is now a volunteer-only mission, Les said. He looked down at a white line on the deck. We all saw what's down there. I won't blame you if you don't want to dive. The seven other hell divers stood in the launch bay with Timothy, who was here to interpret for Hector. The tension was palpable among the men and women who could very well decide the future of humanity. Michael was both honored and horrified to be one of them. He clenched and opened his robotic fist. We're running out of time, he said. We have to make a decision. Why can't we just launch the nukes and try to take out the machines that way? Lena asked. The mountain can't be that deep. Michael recalled when he had considered dropping the nukes in the ocean where they couldn't cause the human race any more harm. 
But now those same bombs could potentially save humanity from the very machines that had destroyed the world. If we fire the nukes and they don't work, we ruin our chances of going in on foot, Les said. The radiation would be too deadly even for our suits. As I said, you don't have to come if you don't want to. But if you're coming, join me. He stepped over the painted white line. I'll do respect, Captain, said Arlo. But if we dive, how do we get past those defenses we saw on Cricket's feet? Ever hear of the kamikaze? Ted said. There were Japanese pilots during World War II that... I know what they are, Les said. They did their duty for their country during war, and we're going to do ours as well for all humanity. I have a suggestion, if I may, said Timothy, speaking up for the first time. Go ahead, Les said. Perhaps a distraction might help you get into the base. We have enough rockets to take out the bulk of the defenses that Cricket documented. Not all, but most. That will tell them we're here, Arlo said. They know we're here, Michael said. Les nodded. It gives us a chance to sneak in and evens the playing field if we use nukes. So the question is, who's with me? I'm with you, sir, Michael said. I'm here to avenge Ramon, Edgar said. He put an armor-piercing round with his cousin's name written on the brass into the sniper rifle and worked the bolt. Sophia stepped over the line. Arlo grunted. Got to prove I'm thunder and lightning, I guess. He stepped over, and Hector did too, leaving just Lena and Ted grounded. Come on, sweetheart, Arlo said. Remember what you told me last night? Shut up, Arlo, Lena said. She walked over and grabbed Edgar's hand. Oh, I see how it is, Arlo said. Ted sighed and stepped over the line. I can't let Arlo die alone. I ain't dying, Arlo said. You're all very brave, Timothy said. I will watch over you the best I can with the crew while you're on the dive, and once you near the target, we will give the Def-9 units some fireworks. Upload the DZ on our minimaps, Les said, and get the rest of the support crew in here. Timothy uploaded the drop zone the team had chosen from the maps and satellite imagery. It was in the middle of a valley that would give them cover and let them avoid some of the forest. Samson, Evie, Alfred, and the two technicians who had signed on for the dangerous journey all filed into the launch bay. Michael checked his wrist monitor. Cricket was still online somehow, though so damaged that it couldn't fly. He kept an eye on the cameras that were still documenting the graveyard. Samson, Alfred, and the two technicians walked around checking that all dive systems were operational. Michael checked the charge on the laser rifle. It was down to just 8%. He jammed the battery back in, then stepped aside and opened the note that X had given him before they left. He had yet to read it, wanting to save it for the last minute. Timothy, take us to 20,000 feet, Les said. As the ship started down, Michael opened the note. Dear Michael, the day you came screaming into the world was a day I will never forget. Your father insisted I hold you, but I was drunk and almost dropped you on your head. That's how we first met. I literally almost killed you. Clear launch bay, Les said. Michael looked up from the note, saving the rest. Good luck and Godspeed, Alfred said. I pray you all return safely. Samson coughed into his handkerchief. Give him hell, he rasped. He and Les shook hands, and he turned to Michael. Be careful, Tin, Samson said. I want Bray to grow up with a father and become as good a man as I've watched you become. Thank you, sir. They hugged for what Michael realized was the first time. Even more surprisingly, Evie also gave Michael a hug. I don't blame you for Alexander, you know, she said. Thank you, Michael replied. He was a good man and died bravely to save us. He sure was. She took a deep breath. Good luck down there. The support crew departed, and while the helldivers lined up to jump, Michael went back to reading the note. Since then, I've watched you grow into a man who is rare in this world. 
selfless, kind, brave, wise. I could go on and on. Bottom line, you are the best of us, Michael. You are our future. And while I can't be there with you to fight for it, know that I'm fighting for it too halfway across the world, and I will never give up. No matter what happens, I will always be with you, even in death. I love you like both a son and a brother. Michael stopped reading and looked up to blink tears from his eyes. T-minus five minutes to launch, Timothy said. Status reports, Les said. Phoenix One online. Phoenix Four ready to dive, Lena said. Ted and Edgar both confirmed they were good to go. Raptor One ready, said Michael. Raptor Two ready, said Arlo. Raptor Three online, said Hector. Raptor Four good, said Sophia. Nearing jump altitude in one minute, Timothy said. Normally, a red light would have swirled in the launch bay, warning everyone to keep clear, followed by a pulsating blue. But Timothy had the entire ship in stealth mode. Ah, shit, this is really happening, Ted said. You'll be okay, Edgar said. Remember your training. Michael continued reading the letter from X. You saved my life over a decade ago, and have continued to make me a better man every day we've been together. Thank you for reminding me to accept my past without regret, handle my present with confidence, and face my future without fear. As the king of the Vanguard Islands, I promise you, Bray will have a place to grow up that is worthy of humanity, and I pray both you and I will see him grow up there. Love, Xavier. Michael tucked the note back in his vest just in time for the final warning. Prepare to dive, Timothy said. You dive so humanity survives. Good luck, my friends. Michael nodded at the AI. Thank you for everything, Timothy. A countdown came on their HUDs. Michael's heart thumped with conflicted emotions. These could very well be the last moments of his life. He didn't want to leave Layla alone to raise Bray. But if he didn't do this, their home would never be safe. Ten. Nine. Eight. The launch bay doors hissed open, letting in the gusting wind. Michael and Les both stepped out in front of the groups and shook hands. For Trey, Les said. For Trey, sir, Michael replied. Three. Two. One. We dive so humanity survives, Les shouted. He leaped into the darkness, and Michael followed right behind, yelling the same thing. They speared into the inky void. Normally, Michael felt weightless the first few seconds of freefall, but today he felt gravity pulling down on him. Or perhaps it was something else. He brought his hands to his body and formed a human spear. He bumped on his night vision, and the view turned green. The sky was packed with clouds, but there was no hint of lightning. He looked up past his boots to check the other divers. Everyone was out of the launch bay. Normally, the battery units would glow, but today they were all covered. Michael moved away from Les. The other divers did the same, fanning out from each other for safety. They shot through the cold mattress of dense cloud cover like bullets through smoke. Michael shifted his gaze back to his HUD to check the DZ Timothy had selected. The teams were already down to 12,000 feet. At this speed, they would be on the ground in five minutes or less. Michael rocketed through the billowy clouds. The beacons of the other divers blinked on his HUD. As they neared the surface, the cloud cover lightened. At 8,000 feet, it was thin enough that he saw light in the east. He bumped off his night vision goggles and focused on a patch of pulsating red and purple, much like what he had seen on the dive into Rio de Janeiro. It had to be the jungles they had seen via Cricket's feed. Les emerged on his left, still in a nosedive like Michael. A side glance confirmed that Sophia had also caught up to them. The other divers were still 500 to 1,000 feet higher. The floor of black turned white as they neared a new cloud layer. The easy dive was suddenly shaken up by a pocket of turbulence. Michael almost hit Sophia, but managed to move away before he clipped her. A scream 
sounded somewhere above. A male voice, probably Arlo. The teams were all over the place in the clouds. For five seconds, Michael spun out of control. Then he suddenly burst through the bottom of the clouds. Making a hard arch, he then pulled back into stable position and saw that Sophia had done the same thing. She was a natural. It took Les a bit longer to get his long frame into a stable fall. Glancing up, Michael searched for the other divers using his NVGs. Hector burst through the clouds next, cartwheeling. Ted and Arlo weren't in much better shape, but both Lena and Edgar had managed to regain control of their fall. At 5,000 feet, Ted and Arlo didn't have much time to get back into stable position. Come on, Michael thought, you can do this. The young men battled their way out of their spins and got back into nosedives. That left Hector. He seemed almost limp. Had someone hit him and knocked him out? Michael didn't want to break radio silence to find out. He tried to slow his speed and make his way over to Hector. It was terribly dangerous to approach the spinning Cazador, but Michael wasn't about to lose a member of Team Raptor. At 2,000 feet, Michael made his move. He grabbed Hector, trying to push him into a stable position. It didn't work and almost knocked Michael out of his dive. Hector! Michael yelled. The diver didn't respond. Michael went back in again for one last attempt. That was when he saw Hector's open face shield. Frozen eyelashes hung over his closed eyes, and his lips were dark. What the hell? Michael had no idea how the visor had opened, but he had heard about this happening on a long-ago dive. The poor bastard had probably died of asphyxia during the first minute, when his face froze from the thirty below air at a hundred miles per hour. A glance down revealed the first look at the desert-like terrain of the surface. The other divers had already pulled their chutes above the DZ. At a thousand feet, Michael had to make one of the hardest decisions of his career. He pulled away from Hector, knowing there was nothing he could do for him now. Then he pulled his own chute, and the suspension lines came taut. He grabbed the toggles and looked down, his breath catching when he saw a diver right in Hector's path. Lena, Michael shouted. He couldn't tell whether she heard him because her canopy blocked his view. He flinched as Hector's body slammed into her chute, collapsing the two leftmost cells and sending her careening out of control. The ground rose up to meet the divers, only seconds from touchdown for those with canopies, but it was the end for Hector. He frapped into the earth. Michael tried to focus past the devastating loss. Lena was still in trouble and they were almost on the ground in hostile territory. The DZ was in a mile-long valley with jungle growing around the rim. Steep cliffs blocked much of the access, but he spotted the path out that Timothy had plotted on their mini-maps. Lena swung around using her toggles and finally managed to get control. One by one, the other divers performed two-stage flares and stepped out of the sky. Arlo and Ted both crumpled after running a few strides, but Sophia and Les landed gracefully. Lena hit hardest, crashing and tumbling. Michael managed to stay on his feet and ran out the momentum. He crouched down, released his chute and packed it down, and scanned for hostiles. Edgar was the last down. He collapsed his chute and raised the sniper rifle ready to fire on any machines waiting for them. The team packed their chutes quickly. Edgar got to Lena first. She gripped her ankle, grunting in pain. Michael trotted over. How bad is it? He asked. I don't know, Lena said. We need to move, Les said, crouching. Can you walk? Edgar helped her to her feet. She yelped when she weighted the sprain. Les looked to Michael but didn't say a word. They both knew she would slow them down. What happened to Hector? She mumbled. Then she saw Sophia kneeling by the body. Only the armor and jumpsuit held it in a recognizably human shape. It was his visor, Michael said. Somehow it opened during the dive. At least he didn't suffer, Arlo said. Michael didn't want to tell him the truth, that for an agonizing minute or more, Hector had likely suffered far more than if he had just crashed into the ground, and screaming would have made it worse, sucking freezing air into his lungs. What do we do with him? Ted asked. Grab his vital gear and ammunition, Les said then bury him. 
The divers worked quickly, digging a shallow grave and covering the dead Cazador with dirt while Edgar held security with the sniper rifle. When they finished, they each put a hand on the mound of dirt and whispered a few words. I'm sorry, Michael said when it was his turn. Less motion for the teams to move out. Michael, you're on point with Edgar, he said. Ted, Arlo, you got rear guard. We don't stop until we get out of this valley. The divers moved out in combat intervals, navigating the foreign landscape cautiously but fast along a creek that flowed through the valley. Leafy mutant flora grew along the banks. Michael kept the laser rifle shouldered, using his infrared optics to scan for life. Nothing bigger than a rabbit showed. He stopped at the edge of the creek. The fast-flowing water was clear, nothing like the swamp murk he was used to seeing on dives. He tapped his wrist computer. The temperature was 60 degrees, and the air was free of radiation. It was one of the cleanest green zones he had ever dived. Michael set off toward a creek bank of rounded river rocks, his boots sloshing in the ankle-deep water. The path out of the valley was just a quarter mile north. The team crossed two at a time, with Edgar supporting Lena. Michael took cover behind a boulder, aiming his rifle at the distant cliffs and scanning for machines. Lightning fired from the belly of a cloud. Thunder clapped a few seconds later. The team joined him at the rocks, where Michael guided them toward a stand of trees. Another thunderclap echoed through the darkness. This one didn't fade away. Michael halted, straining his ears. A rumbling noise sounded in the distance. Here in the valley, it was difficult to gauge the direction. He flashed signals toward the trees, and the team took off for cover. Edgar slung his rifle, picked Lena up, and ran with her. The thunderous sound grew louder. Michael looked up through the dense canopy, but saw nothing. It was Arlo who spotted the drone. He raised his assault rifle, but Les pushed down on the barrel and shook his head. A drone not much bigger than Cricket flew over the trees, then out over the valley, trailing a purple exhaust plume. The circular body had an antenna on the crest of what looked like an insect head covered in spikes. Michael motioned everyone down. They went to their bellies and hugged the trees for any concealment they could get. The drone circled once, then hovered low over the water. Shit, our tracks, Michael thought. He aimed his laser rifle at the machine, but it continued south, away from their location, but back toward where they had buried Hector. Les was quick to get the divers up. On me, he said. They moved out of the trees at a run toward the rocky incline leading out of the valley. Lena was limping still, enduring the pain. Les slowed the pace up the narrow cleft out of the valley. Nearing the top, Michael moved his robotic finger to the laser rifle's trigger guard, ready to let the bolts fly into the trees growing along the valley rim. He saw no movement among the large trunks, which would provide excellent cover. He motioned the divers to hunker down behind him. Then he took off in a crouching run to the trees. Picking his way around exposed roots, he took up position behind a huge trunk. An infrared scan of the jungle to his left revealed no sign of life, and his NVGs didn't pick up any machines in that direction. Then he looked eastward, to his right. The terrain there was flat, as he had expected. What he didn't expect to see was an airship on the ground. He zoomed in on the faded ITC logo on the hull. My God, he whispered. It was the ITC Victory, the airship that Captain Sean Rollo had flown here decades ago, despite Captain Maria Ash's warnings. She had been right all along. Michael finally understood why she had never flown beyond the shores of North America and had always chosen green zone dives to keep them in the air. It was the reason the Hive became the last survivor of its kind. Perhaps Captain Leon Jordan, despite his evil ways, was trying to keep the same truth a secret. That out here, there was nothing but death. But it was finally time to face the future and end this war forever. 33. We have to retreat! Magnolia yelled. 
Mac's recon team fought their way around the silos trying to escape. Several of his men laid down covering fire toward the machine guns on the tanker truck and a shipping container. Magnolia had frozen during the ambush, but the adrenaline snapped her free of the shock. She ran around a silo and fired off three bolts at the shipping container, peppering the side with glowing red-orange holes. Tun and Victor ran over to help shield X. Bullet kicked up puffs of black ash, and one hit Tun's shield, knocking him to the ground. Roger fired a burst at a silo and hit a skinwalker sniping at the fleeing barracudas. Go, King Xavier, Victor yelled. He helped pick up Tun, and the two men held their shields up as a protective wall. Move, Magnolia shouted. X ran with Tun and Victor while Magnolia took aim at another silo where a new sniper had popped up. The rounds hit a barracuda soldier standing next to Mac. Magnolia took the sniper down with a bolt, removing his leg at the knee. They had set a perfect ambush, but how had they known? She suppressed the burning question and took off after X. The only way to escape was back the way they had come in. Mac was already guiding the team that way. X stopped at Felipe's corpse and bent down despite Victor's shouts to hurry. Magnolia felt X's sorrow. The young Barracuda had fought with him and helped him kill Colonel Vargas, only to die here at the hands of even worse men. She and Roger caught up with X and his guards behind a wall. A helmet covered in what looked like bloody patches of skin emerged on an adjacent silo. She fired a bolt, and even through the blurry NVGs, she could see the top of the soldier's head come off. Let's go, she shouted. Tun and Victor held up their shields and darted with X between two silos as Roger and Magnolia laid down another field of fire. One of the enemy machine guns went silent, either to change ammo or because the gunner was out of action. Four silos remained between X's group and the relative safety of the shipping containers. Six barracudas were already there firing bursts downrange. Bullets whizzed past Magnolia, one actually grazing her leg armor. She rounded a corner, taking cover with the others behind a silo. Bullets pounded the side she had just cleared. Mac ran toward them, waving his prosthetic hand. Four skinwalkers darted into the corridor between Magnolia and X's group and Mac. But instead of gunning the warrior down, the four men drew swords. The old barracuda did the same and charged. Magnolia got up and ran after Tun and Victor, who were trying to keep up with X. Bullets chased them, pinging off the silos and lancing into the dirt. She came up alongside X as he fired a flare at the four skinwalkers. It hit a man in the back, igniting the skin draped over his armor. Flailing and screaming, he burned. Something hit Magnolia hard in the back, slamming her to the dirt. Megs, Roger yelled. She looked up as X raised his spear arm and the captain's sword. The three skinwalkers continued to slash and jab at Mac, who deflected their blows. Yo, fuckface, X yelled. A skinwalker turned, brandishing his sword. X slid, jabbing upward with his prosthetic spear. The blade crunched through the groin and deep into the abdominal cavity. He crumpled, and X got to his feet just as a skinwalker's blade struck Mac's prosthetic hand, breaking it in half like a twig. Magnolia pushed herself up off the ground with Roger's help. He turned to fire at hostiles still approaching on their six, while Tun and Victor ran to help X. But X didn't need help. He jammed his spear through the helmet of the skinwalker who was about to finish Mac off with an axe. He tried to pull the spear out, but it was stuck in metal and bone. The remaining skinwalker swung a cutlass, but X used the skewered man as a shield, turning him toward the blade. Mac grabbed the cutlass wielder by the shoulder and spun him around, then jammed a knife up under the man's chin, through the hard pallet, and into the brain with a crunch that Magnolia could hear. X, she shouted. He braced a foot against the skewered man's head and finally yanked his bloody spear free. You hurt, he asked. She wasn't sure what had hit her, but she didn't feel any blood or pain. The group fled with Mac, finding cover in a scrapyard of containers. After a half minute's rest, they ran back to the field with the wind turbines. Several barracudas waited there, reloading their weapons. Less than half the recon team remained, only five, including Mac. He spoke in Spanish to his men. Magnolia picked up the name Felipe. I'm sorry, X said. He's gone. Mac hesitated, then looked toward the turbines. We can't hold here, he said. 
We have to go back through the field. You go first, King Xavier. We'll cover you. No, X said. We're all going. Bullets dinged against the containers and voices called out in the distance. Another parachute flare streaked into the sky. Once that fades, you go, Max said. He gripped a bloody sword. Rhino told me to guard you with my life before he died, and that's what I'm going to do. Roger fired off a burst, the crack echoing off the containers. Fuck you, he yelled. Tun and Victor brought up their shields, ready to move. The remaining barracudas moved to the sides of the containers and down on their bellies. Go, immortal, Mac yelled. X clearly didn't want to move, but Tun and Victor urged him on. Magnolia and Roger followed them out into the field, keeping low. They kept to the path Felipe had swept for mines on the way in. It was hard to follow the tracks in the ash, especially while under fire. Tun went down with a muffled cry. X helped him back up, and Magnolia noticed Tun was bleeding from his shoulder. Come on, Roger yelled, running ahead to take point. Victor picked up Tun's shield and took rear guard, using both shields to cover their retreat. The thick metal deflected the lower velocity bullets, but some of the bigger jacketed rounds punched through. One hit Victor in the arm. He cried out, dropping one shield, but keeping the other up. Magnolia was focused on the ground, looking for mines, when Roger vanished in an explosion. The blast knocked the entire team down, and something stung like a hot needle in her side. Ears ringing, she lay in the ash for a moment. Lightning tendrils forked across the skyline. Smoke drifted away from a crater ahead of her. She tried to yell for Roger, but all that came out was a gasp. Someone grabbed her and helped her up. She could hear distant wails of pain. They sounded familiar. Mags, said a gruff voice. X stood over her, searching. Roger was curled up on the ground not far from the crater. Victor helped Tun to his feet. Both men raised their shields and moved to protect X and Magnolia. Roger, she managed to say. X helped her up, and they stumbled over to him. His right foot was mangled. The armor was dented in places, but appeared to have saved his limbs. Grab him, X shouted. We have to get out of here. Victor grabbed Roger under the arms and Magnolia lifted his knees. X wrapped Tun's arm over his shoulder, and the group continued toward the turbines, following the tracks from earlier. Moments later, they reached the huge turbine blade that stabbed the earth like a giant's arrow. The ringing in Magnolia's ears faded replaced by the sound of gunfire. Mac and his men held back the skinwalkers, but it wouldn't be long before they were overrun. Magnolia bent down next to Roger and grabbed his hand. I can still fight, he growled, trying to sit up. Roger, hold still. She pushed down on his chest, but too late. He saw his foot. My toes, he said. My toes are gone. Victor had a medical kit out, and X was unwrapping a dressing. Tun gripped his shoulder, blood dripping between his fingers. Mags, Roger said. She looked back down at him. It's okay, Rod, you're going to be okay. You have to kill her for me if I can't do it, he said. Promise me. I promise, now try and relax, you need to be still. He tried to look down at his feet again, but she blocked his view. I love you, Raj she said to distract him. It worked. His helmet turned upward, and she bumped her visor against his. A massive explosion bloomed out on the horizon. She saw it mirrored in Roger's visor. She turned toward it, her heart skipping a beat. A message broke radio silence over the comms in her helmet. Renegade has been hit, someone yelled. X got to his feet and shouted in a crazed voice that didn't sound like his. Miles, he screamed. The sailboat rocked in sloppy seas. Ada sat at the control panel in the cabin, keeping an eye on the radar. She had shadowed the ship for a day now, keeping her distance. She still didn't know who was on it, but one thing was certain. It was heading for the Vanguard Islands. The chances of this being another ghost ship were slim, and while she couldn't see it yet, she had a feeling there were Cazadores aboard. Who else could it be? Luckily, her boat hadn't attracted their attention. Yet. Ada yawned and took a sip of water. 
She wasn't sure how long it had been since she slept for more than an hour straight. She slapped her face twice and blinked her heavy eyelids. Her new little friend slept peacefully on her lap, and she stroked its bristly hair. Jojo had clung to her since she came back inside from the storm. But she must go back out there soon. They were only four to five hours away from the boundary of the Vanguard Islands. If this was an enemy warship, it was her duty to warn King Xavier. But it was more likely just another Cazador vessel like the Lion, and if that was the case, she would just keep her distance and follow them in. But something told her she was sailing back to a war. She just hoped she wasn't too late to help her people. Waves slapped the starboard hull of her craft. She checked the skyline through the portholes. Lightning blasted the clouds, though she couldn't hear the thunder over the breaking waves. The storm was closing in. We're going to have to sail through that, Jojo, Ada said. The monkey opened one big black eye. Ada leaned forward to check the dashboard monitor. The sailboat was gaining some distance on the ship she tracked. Too much distance, she realized. She studied the radar to see whether the ship had changed its heading at all. But if it had detected her, it didn't appear to be acting on it. It was still on the same course for the Vanguard Islands. As the sailboat drew closer to both the ship and the home of her people, Ada felt her heart thump a little faster. After so long at sea, she couldn't wait. You ready to see sunshine? Ada said. The monkey sighed and went back to sleep. It amazed Ada that a creature that could survive in the wastes was so dependent. Anything born into this harsh new world would need natural survival skills. Then again, she herself didn't have many survival skills, and she was still breathing, despite many things that had almost killed her. Ada just watched for a few minutes, taking comfort in the innocence of the miracle she had found in the wastes. Growing up, she had always wondered what the Helldivers encountered on the surface, but they never spoke about it. She couldn't help but think they had come across many creatures that weren't hostile. Her journey had taught her that many forms of life had found a way after the apocalypse, and they weren't all dangerous. Ada put her helmet back on, then grabbed her gear and headed topside. She could operate the sails from inside the cabin, but she needed to see better. Light rain pattered on her suit. The wind gusted, though without its earlier ferocity. Still, it was just enough to power the sailboat through the water faster than the ship she was chasing. Unlocking the wheel was trickier this time and took some fiddling. When it was free, she steered toward the northeast, hoping to avoid the brunt of the storm. For the next hour, she stood there, her excitement growing as she drew closer to the Vanguard Islands. The sky opened up, and thunder boomed closer now as the lightning illuminated the way back to the islands. A half hour later, she spotted something through the rain. At first glance, the ship was far larger than the Cazador warships like the Lion, even bigger than their largest, Elysium. Curious, Ada pulled out the binoculars and waited for the next lightning bolt. When it came, what she saw in those split seconds was unlike any ship she had seen in the Cazador fleet. It had a landing strip like the old world aircraft carriers she had seen in photos. But that made no sense. She had never seen this ship in their fleet when she arrived at the islands, nor did she know of an aircraft carrier at any of their outposts. Ada scoped the horizon again, looking for aircraft. But in the next flash, she saw nothing on the runway. That didn't mean there were none below decks. She swallowed at the implications. If this was a craft X didn't know of, it could very well be a serious threat to her people. There was only one way to find out. Get closer. With only a few hours before she reached the barrier, she must act fast. Returning to the cabin, she moved quietly past the sleeping Jojo and sat at the controls. After a few false starts, she managed to raise the secondary sails. The wind caught in them, and as the sailboat picked up speed, she guided it northeastward, away from the storm. For the next half hour, she waited below decks, eyes fixed to the porthole. The ship seemed to be growing in size. But how? The sailboat had already made up so much ground that... Shit, she shouted. The sailors must have spotted her boat. 
She hurried back toward the hatch, scaring Jojo off the bunk. Stay put, Ada yelled. Grabbing her rifle in one hand, she opened the hatch, then shut it behind her to seal the monkey inside. She climbed up to the deck above the cabin with a round chambered. The rain slanted down in sheets now. She trained the rifle scope on the ship and groaned with relief. It wasn't turning. Ada steered away, then raised her scope again. She was so close, and the lightning's glow she could see small figures moving on the deck. The scope went dark, and she waited for the next strikes to show her who these sailors were. An overhead bolt lit up the deck, and she spotted several armored figures. But something about them was off. The view darkened. Ada cursed as her boat dropped farther away. Holding the scope as steady as she could on the heaving sea, she glimpsed a faint orange light glowing on the deck. A figure walked out to join the armored soldiers. But this was no Cazador. It wasn't even a man. The figure she was looking at had a glowing orange visor. These weren't Cazadores. They were machines. And they had found the Vanguard Islands. 34. The mission clock read three hours. That was also how many miles the Helldiver teams had traveled from their drop zone. It wasn't just Lena slowing them down. Twice now they had hidden from drones searching for them. Les looked at a secondary clock. It was 9.30 at night. A third clock brought up the time in Aruba. It was 4.30 in the afternoon there, and the Barracudas would be on their recon mission by now. That didn't leave the Helldivers much time to shut down the machines. Another drone passed over the jungle canopy, thrusters flaring as it rocketed westward with the howling wind. They definitely know we're here, Michael said. Edgar nodded. They're searching for us. The windstorm picked up, rustling the foliage and making the tree branches creak around the hidden divers. As soon as the drone vanished, Les gave the signal to advance. Taking point, he brought the team deeper into the jungle. He used his rifle barrel to push away barbed plants and a sharp purple weed he had never seen before. A snake with spots that looked like eyeballs slithered in front of his boot. He halted, letting it pass, then pushed on. In the green hue of his optics, he noticed a clearing that provided a window to the arid landscape where the ITC Victory had crash-landed. They were more than a quarter mile away from the ruined hulk, but he could still see it. A tree canopy grew out of the curved rooftop. Decades of exposure to the elements had blown away much of the outer hull, spreading pieces across the landscape. Most of the debris was small, aluminum plates and interior bulkheads. But also, several stabilizing fins had sheared off. From the looks of it, the airship hadn't crash-landed as Les had expected. So why would Captain Rolo come here of all places when it was the base for the machines? There had to be something he didn't know something that Captain Maria Ash had kept from her crew, something not in her records. Perhaps the deranged Captain Jordan destroyed it, or perhaps Captain Ash had. His mind whirled with various scenarios as he trekked through the jungle. Had they known about the machines all along? If Pedro was right, and humanity had launched an offensive to destroy the machines here, then it was a hell of a coincidence that Captain Rolo should come here almost 230 years later. Unless he was tricked. Les put aside the questions and went back to listening for drones and searching for machines on the ground. A bug with a face full of eyes landed on his shoulder. He swatted it away and brought the rifle scope up to his visor. The next leg would take them out of the jungle and into the open for at least five minutes before they reached the airship. Then it would be another four to five miles to the foot of Kilimanjaro and the factories they had seen from the air. He had no idea how they would make it that far without being seen, unless Timothy came through with his distraction. The wind picked up again, blasting a wave of grit into the jungle. Les crouched and turned to the divers. They all seemed to have come through the initial shock of losing Hector, but he could tell by the way some of them moved just how scared they were. That was good and bad. Fear got rid of cockiness, but it also made people do dumb things. He had to stay sharp to keep these young divers alive. Listen up, Les said. 
We're heading for the wreckage of that airship, moving out in teams, with Raptor going first. Why Raptor? Arlo asked. Michael moved in front of Les and held up his laser rifle. This is why, he said. Ted, you help Lena, Les said. Edgar, I need you to keep an eye on things with that rifle of yours, okay? Getting a nod from Edgar, he looked to Lena. I think I can put my full weight on it now, she said. Les watched as she tried it, though he couldn't see whether she was wincing inside her helmet. I'm good, Lena said. Really? Les stood for a better view of the terrain separating them from the airship. Seeing no contacts, he signaled to advance. Michael took point with the laser rifle. Arlo and Sophia followed him out into the screaming wind. The receding figures seemed to dissipate like phantasms in the green hue of his optics. A hundred yards out, Michael stopped and crouched behind a boulder at the edge of the debris field. Sophia and Arlo huddled there with him for a few minutes, then ventured into the wreckage. The wind whipped the branches overhead and one cracked off, falling next to Les. Team Raptor was almost impossible to make out now. He spotted Michael darting to the hull of the ship. A platform still hung from an open hatch in the hull, and he raised his rifle inside to have a look. Then he turned and waved at the jungle before vanishing again in the whirling sand. Let's go, Les said. Ted kept close to Lena, and Edgar took rear guard. Les went first, taking the same route as Michael, but not stopping at the boulder. He went all the way to the scattered metal scraps, keeping low. The wind led up slightly, and he watched Michael walk up the platform and into the airship. What the hell was he doing? Les finally stopped behind the curved blades of a turbofan that had broken off. The other divers of Team Phoenix clustered behind him, checking the sky in all directions. From here to the airship, there was scant cover for someone as tall as Les, and the howling wind made drones hard to hear. Edgar glassed the skyline with his spotting scope. We're clear, sir, he said. The wind stirred up a vortex of dust, blocking his view of the airship. It blew open a suitcase, the contents long gone. For a fleeting moment, the wind seemed to die again, and he saw the full outline of the airship, including the whipping forest canopy growing out of the rooftop. He gave the order to advance. The other divers kept close as they navigated the field. Lena was limping again, with Ted helping her fight the wind. Halfway across, the storm kicked up dust that brought visibility down to just a few feet. Sand scoured his armor, pushing him backward. Les kept his helmet down, eyes on the barely visible ground. The storm continued to gather strength until the team found itself in near blackout conditions. Les looked back to Ted and Lena, scarcely able to make them out. He couldn't see Edgar at all. There was nothing to do but hunker down and wait it out. Over the howl came a thrumming sound that sent a spike of fear through Les. The thrumming grew to a blast. Another drone. The team was trapped in the open, unable to move, as the unmanned hunter hovered somewhere overhead. Les pressed his long frame into the dirt, wishing he could shrink. He motioned for Ted and Lena. They started crawling. Leading the way, he squirmed over to a dislodged fin. He grabbed the side and tried to lift it up, then halted when he saw the faded lettering on the metal. ITC Requiem. But that made no sense. He didn't have time to figure out where this airship came from or where the ITC victory was. Lena moved toward him on all fours about ten feet away. Les still didn't see Edgar but he spotted Ted. The diver was battling the wind from a standing position. Les tried to wave him down, but Ted was looking away, his helmet down. The thrumming came again, drawing Ted's attention. He looked to the sky and raised a hand to his visor. Les got up on one knee, ready to run over and pull Ted down. A bolt of light flashed through the swirling gust, too blue and straight to be lightning. Ted fell backward in the dirt, a sizzling hole in the upper left quadrant of his chest armor where his heart had been. No! Les held in a scream and dropped back down with Lena. More bolts punched into the ground, kicking up dirt and leaving little smoldering craters. Les pushed the fin up and pulled Lena underneath. Then he raised his assault rifle to the sky, aiming at the source of the lasers. A bolt blasted the ground to his right. 
he rolled away, banging into another piece of debris from the airship. A laser whizzed past his helmet. Les got up on a knee and aimed where the bolt had come from. This time, he spotted the drone hovering. A flurry of bolts zipped from the drone as he pulled the trigger. Rounds from his rifle found the target, sparking on impact and sending the machine spiraling away. Les looked at the burning holes in the ground to his left and right, then at the one that had missed his crotch by inches. He was lucky. Far luckier than Ted. Partly in shock, Les crawled back over to the metal fin to get Lena out. Before he got there, the drone's hum rose over the whistling wind. The noise sucked the air from his chest. He spotted the same drone flying back toward his location, smoke fanning away from the holes he had blown in its outer armor. Bolts sprayed the ground, and Les bounded away back toward where Ted had fallen. Edgar was there, on his back next to Ted's body, searching the sky with his NVGs. Laser beams pounded the dirt as the machine homed in on their location. Les rose on both knees, raised his rifle, and was aiming when bolts cleaved the sky, slamming into the smoking side of the drone. It burst into pieces, raining shrapnel on the surface. Over here, yelled a voice. Les turned to see Michael, who had run out into the storm. Help me with Ted, Edgar shouted over the wind. We can't take him with us, Les called back. Grabbing Ted's rifle, Edgar jumped up and followed Les to the dorsal fin where Lena had crawled out. Together, they made their way to Michael and finally to the cover of the airship hull. Arlo and Sophia stepped away from the hull. Where's Ted? Arlo asked. Les shook his head, and Arlo bowed his. The two had been good friends and had grown even closer since joining the Helldivers. But this was the reality of being one. We can't stay here, Michael said. Gotta keep moving. He ran along the starboard side of the airship under broken portholes. The legs had collapsed long ago, and the bottom of the ship had pushed dirt outward into a low, sloping wall smoothed by the wind. Fighting strong gusts, the divers came up on the stern. Michael shouldered his weapon as he reached the debris of broken fins and rudders at the back of the ship. Beyond there, Les couldn't see much in the swirling grit. According to his HUD, they had another four miles march to the mountain, most of it in the open, in the wind. If they made it that far, they must then infiltrate a base, find the mainframe, and upload the virus. Passing another hatch, Les looked inside. Maybe they could shelter in the ship. Not much was left. Pitted bulkheads were covered in dark, moldy growth. Electrical wires hung like spilled guts from the overhead. More discarded suitcases littered the decks. One contained a plastic doll. It was as if these people had landed and then disembarked, leaving their belongings behind. But why? And if these were not Captain Rolo's people, who were they? Captain, called a voice. Michael had stopped ahead, kneeling to glass the terrain in the distance. He waved less over. The other divers followed close behind, hugging the bulkhead like scared children, except for Edgar, who stood tall with his rifle, scanning the debris field they had crossed. Les squatted beside Michael. No sign of drones, Michael said. But we've got to cross that. He gazed out at a flat, desolate, windswept area. Grit clouded the view. But there was something moving out there. An orange glow. Michael saw it, too, and aimed his laser rifle. Get the others into the ship, he said. Tell them to hide. Les spotted three orange lights moving in the storm. Gripping his assault rifle, he thought of Phil and Catherine. He had known that this moment would come. But somehow he didn't feel ready. Did you expect to get in there without a fight? I'll take them, sir, Michael said. You should go with the others. I'm not going anywhere, Les replied. He motioned for Edgar to get the other divers inside the airship. Edgar nodded and corralled Sophia, Lena, and Arlo into the open hatch where they had found the doll. The orange lights on the plateau brightened until Les could see the titanium alloy skulls. Seeing the defectors sparked something inside him. He inched away from the hull. What are you doing, sir? Michael asked. Aim for the chest or the head. I'm going to get us three new laser rifles. With that, Les took off running into the storm, away from the orange visors and back out into the debris field. 
he ducked behind a boulder and propped up his rifle. Michael fired a beat later, opening up with calculated single bolts. An orange visor went down, fading out, but the other two headed right for the airship. Less aimed at the head of one just as they returned fire at Michael. He pulled the trigger, but his aim was slightly off, going high. The shots did the trick in attracting the droid. In an abrupt mechanical motion, it turned and strode in his direction. Les kept steady, lining up the crosshairs on the robot's chest, aiming for the battery unit. Bolts flashed, slamming into the rock and sandblasting his face shield. Les fired again, burst after burst into the metal exoskeleton, but none penetrated. The robot kept coming. Lasers pounded the boulder. Les hunkered down as low as possible, chest heaving. The other defectors sprayed the hull of the airship, but Les couldn't see Michael, nor did he see return fire. Shit, shit, shit! Les buried his fear and prepared to get up and fire, but something felt wrong, as if these were the last seconds of his life. He knew that if he exposed himself now, he would die. Then he heard the crack of automatic weapons. Not one. Bursts from two. Then a third. The defector approaching the airship went down. In a brief lull in the storm, black armored figures funneled out of the ship. One reached down to help someone off the ground. More laser bolts flashed in their direction. The defector had turned its rifle away from the boulder and onto the divers. Les crept around the side of the rock, laying down his assault rifle and grabbing his blaster. With the weapon in hand, he got up and ran toward the defector firing on the helldivers. It turned toward him as he aimed the weapon into the mouth of the machine. For Trey, Les said as he pulled the trigger. 35. X hid with Magnolia and Roger in a thicket at the edge of the beach. The distant sounds of gunfire had faded away, confirming the obvious. Mac and his team were all dead or in captivity. This wasn't supposed to happen. The skinwalkers weren't supposed to have anyone in the refinery. He had seen the damn footage himself. He felt sick. A few feet away from him, Tun and Victor watched the forest for pursuing hostiles. Both men were wounded. Tun had a bullet wound to the shoulder, and Victor had a through and through to the upper arm. Magnolia lay beside Roger and tried to keep him from moaning and giving away their position. It was just a matter of time before the skinwalkers found them here. They hadn't just ambushed his team. They had also attacked Shadow and Renegade. X lifted the binos, afraid to look. Smoke wafted away from Shadow, but Renegade was gone, sunk by the submarines. The skinwalkers had gotten the best of X twice now. Horn had ambushed him at his home, and now at the outpost. And now Miles was dead, caught in the crossfire of a war X couldn't stop. Miles, my sweet boy, he mumbled. He pushed up his visor and vomited onto the sand. Then he sobbed like a child. Magnolia moved over and put a hand on his back. I'm so sorry, X, she said. Roger writhed in pain, and she returned to his side. The landmine had turned his right foot to mush, and his legs had suffered major trauma. If not for his armor, he would have lost them both. The dressing Magnolia had applied below the tourniquet was already bright red. We've got to get him aboard Shadow, Magnolia said. Using his spear as a brace, X pushed himself up. He couldn't grieve for Miles right now, not until Roger was safe and X had his revenge, until they all had their revenge. El Pulpo, Carmela, and their bastard son had taken too much from the Sky People. X was going to make Horn and his mother suffer. Across the green view of the ocean, Shadow sailed farther out to sea. On the deck stood a man wearing an orange cape, X zoomed in with the binos. It was indeed General Forge. As long as the man was alive, they had a chance. Men, Victor said. Magnolia and X both spun about, X with his blaster, Magnolia shouldering her laser rifle. But Victor was pointing at the water. X followed his line of sight, seeing nothing in the waves. Victor kept pointing. See, I see men. 
Where? Even with his night vision on, X didn't see anything beyond the breakers but endless whitecaps. Over the surf came a noise. Barking. X lowered his blaster and walked out onto the sand. King, no, Victor said. X, get back here, Magnolia said. X staggered out farther down the sloping sand toward the pounding waves. Were his ears playing tricks on him? The barking came again and halted, and he strained to see the outline of a craft moving in the water. Miles, X whispered. He stared in disbelief at what had materialized into a rubber boat. Not one, but three, all carrying soldiers and a dog. Miles leaped out into the surf and swam toward the beach. X ran out into the tide, battling the massive waves to get to his best friend. Miles, he yelled. A wave brought Miles right toward X. He wanted to grab the dog, but it was too dangerous while the spear remained attached to his stump. Miles came ashore with the next wave. X wanted to hug the dog and hold him tight, but now wasn't the time. The three rubber craft beached, and malicious soldiers and Cazadores jumped out. With them were Imola and another scribe, bandaged and bleeding. The soldiers pulled the boats up the beach, then grabbed gear and weapons. I took care of him like you said, sir, a voice called out. X spotted the soldier he had told to look after his dog, Brett something. He wanted to hug the guy but he was too busy hugging the dog. Brett ran over, panting. Thank you, X said. I owe you, man. We need medics, Magnolia said. Brett turned and motioned toward the militia soldiers. Two of them ran over with packs. Another walked over to Tun and Victor, who were still watching the jungle for hostiles. Victor waved the medic away. Fine, he grunted. We need men to hold security along this tree line. X said to Brett, pointing with his spear. He counted ten militia soldiers and twelve Cazadores. Several wore the Barracuda logo on their armored chests. He didn't want to tell them what had happened to Colonel Mack and Felipe, but he had no choice. Any of you Cazadores speak English? X asked. I do, King Xavier, said a man in full armor. He walked over, holding a long rifle with a scope. What's your name? X asked. Willis. X explained what had happened, and the soldier interpreted for the other barracudas. Several lowered their heads, clearly distraught, but they put aside their grief and fanned out with their weapons. Brett got down on a knee, still trying to catch his breath. What the hell happened out there? Magnolia asked. Fucking subs. General Forge took one out with a cannon, but Shadow got hit by multiple rockets, and Renegade took one to the starboard hull. They must have seen us coming somehow, said a female militia soldier. She had a see-through visor, and Dex recognized her freckled face. Libby was just 19 and had gone from school on the hive to farm work on a Cazador rig, and now to fighting. We barely escaped, she said. What about Raven's Claw? X asked. Not sure, sir, said Brett. I didn't see it, but General Forge is on the hunt. At least that's what we were told before the comms on Shadow went down. What do we do? Libby asked. X looked at her, then scanned the other frightened faces behind the masks. The Cazadores' helmets were pointed his way, and while he couldn't see their features, he knew that they too were scared. Most of those here on the beach were young people, just as in old wars. Now they were cut off, and X had no idea where Horn and his main forces were. The recon mission had not merely failed, it had ended in a slaughter. But how had Horn known? Sir, Brett said. I mean, King. What do we? We do what the Cazadores do, Magnolia said. We go hunting. Miles wagged his tail. You aren't coming, X said. You're staying with Roger and... X wasn't sure who to put with them, but he couldn't leave them on the beach. He couldn't risk sending them to Shadow either, not with another submarine and Raven's Claw still out there. Victor, tell Tun I want him to stay here and guard them, X said. Victor interpreted, and Tun nodded. A medic had already finished plugging his armor. The militia stays here too, X said. You got that, Brett? Keep an eye on the jungle and beach. If anyone approaches that looks like them, you shoot. Got it? 
Where are you going? Brett asked. Max, Victor, and I are going to find Moretto and Horn, he said. No, Roger moaned. You can't leave me. X bent down to the medic, wrapping Roger's foot. Give him some morphine, he whispered. The medic nodded and fished inside her pack. Roger reached out to X. Don't do this to me, King Xavier, he slurred. I can still fight. Don't worry, Rog, X said. I'll save some for you. Roger grunted in pain as the medic stuck a shot between armored plates into his suit. X walked over to Imola. You okay? The scribe shook his head. The radiation is minimal. You'll be fine without a suit for a little while. What are you going to do, King Xavier? Imola asked. Finish what I came here for, X said. Hang in there, mi amigo. X went to the Barracuda, who had spoken English. X said, Willis, I want you to take eight men down the beach and try and flank the outpost. Don't attack unless you think you can win. I want the other four here with the militia to protect the wounded and Miles. Willis nodded and pounded his chest. By the time X returned, Roger was passed out. Magnolia put her face shield up against his. He's going to be okay, Mags, X said. He went down on one knee beside Miles. Look after Raj, okay, boy? Miles' tail swung back and forth, hampered by his suit. Rising to his feet, X checked the ocean. Shadow sailed toward the harbor in pursuit of the last sub and Raven's Claw. Good luck, General, X said softly. We're both going to need it. Victor waited at the jungle's edge with his cutlass in hand. His left arm hung limp against his side. The medics would dress the bullet wound when they could. Magnolia checked her laser rifle. You guys ready for this? X asked. Two nods. X led the way. Together they set off through the jungle, taking a new path, this time without a mine detector. X selected a route thick with vegetation, knowing it would be less likely to have mines. He chopped a barbed frond with his spear. Purple sap spurted like blood from an artery. Magnolia hacked at branches with her sickle, and Victor used his cutlass. By the time they reached the clearing, their blades were sticky with sap. X took up position behind a thick palm trunk and glassed the field with the binos. Over decades of use, the night vision goggles had become like a set of glasses, helping him see things other divers would miss. On this sweep, he saw nothing between his position and the oil refinery. X, Magnolia said quietly. He joined her at the base of another tree. Look at the turbines, she said. X used his binoculars again, centering them on the turbines in the other direction. A rope hung from one of the blades. He followed the rope to the ground where several people wearing black suits stood pulling the rope. What in the... he whispered. Victor joined him and Magnolia to watch. The people were unarmed and looked just like the ones X had seen in the video from Cricket's recon and in the meat locker. Both Magnolia and Victor aimed their rifles, but X waved them down. He zoomed in on skinwalkers standing around a perimeter with their rifles. They seemed to be guarding the workers in black suits. He hadn't wanted to believe it earlier, but now he knew. The skinwalkers had done the unthinkable, something no Helldiver or even Cazador had ever done. They had awoken genetically modified humans at the ITC chambers and were now using them for both slave labor and food. X zoomed in further, trying to see their features behind the plastic visors. Only then did he see what they were doing. The four groups of slaves stood in single files, hoisting fresh bodies up to the turbine blade. All were barracudas. X watched in impotent rage as Felipe was hauled up. When the workers got him up to one of the blades, the skinwalker soldiers shot crossbows, pinning the young warrior's corpse to the blade. Closing his eyes, X tried to block out the evil. When he opened them again, another corpse was going up on the third turbine. This one had a prosthetic leg and a stump where a prosthetic hand had been broken off. 
X centered his binos on the dead colonel who no longer had a helmet or even a face. The bastards had mutilated him and the other barracudas. What's around his neck? Magnolia asked. X zoomed in on a sign pinned to Max's chest armor. He tried to read it as the workers pulled the limp body up. The words were in Spanish and written in smeared blood, but X knew enough Spanish to read them. Vienen las máquinas. Horn wasn't bluffing. The machines were on their way to the Vanguard Islands. The Helldivers were running out of time. If X and his war party encountered defectors at the Outrider, they would be in major trouble. The divers had to get into the base and upload the virus before it was too late. Three new laser rifles scavenged from the machines would help, but the team had already lost Ted and Hector, and they still had several miles to travel before they even got within view of the base. And now they didn't have Cricket's cameras. The drone's feed had switched off an hour ago. Michael trekked through the wastes with a heavy heart. At this rate, they wouldn't make it far if they encountered more machines. It wasn't a matter of if, but of when. He didn't know what was stopping the machines from finding them now. They knew that the divers were here, but they hadn't sent out any of the beetle-looking tanks. Only a few drones and a single foot patrol of DEF-9 units. Maybe we're not a threat to them. Michael could use this to his advantage. The machines were going to be sorry they hadn't taken the hell divers more seriously. He led the other five divers into the darkness and the howling wind, moving from cover to cover, stopping every few minutes to scan the skies. There wasn't much out here now that they had left the ITC Requiem behind. Michael had plenty of questions about the airship. He still hadn't found Captain Rolo's ITC victory, but he was starting to put the pieces together. It was a hell of a coincidence for the victory to show up where humanity had made a final stand against the machines during World War III. But two warships was beyond any possible coincidence. They had come here for a reason that Captain Maria Ash and Captain Jordan either had hidden or never knew. If he survived, Michael would very soon find out what that reason was. Grit swirled across the plains, making it difficult to see, but Michael spotted cover at a dry riverbed snaking across the cracked ground. A fence of spindly trees grew on the banks, their branches dangling like Cazador fishing poles. He directed the team toward the water course. To his surprise, a weak trickle flowed through the channel below, but the creature drinking there surprised him even more. A four-legged beast that looked like a cross between a cat and a dog looked up at Michael with eyes that glowed green in his NVGs. Long, rigid bristles rose up across its neck and along its back. Michael froze. The animal seemed to do the same. The tail dropped between its hind legs. Opening a mouth full of sharp teeth, it let out an almost human-sounding laugh. Then it turned and took off running. Rising on its hind legs, the beast jumped to the opposite bank and bounded up and over the top. A cackle filled the night as the creature retreated across the fields. What the hell was that thing? Arlo asked. Lena limped over. It looked like a hyena, but with a few adaptations, like those spines. At least there is life out here, Sophia said. That means the machines don't kill everything. Just humans now. Edgar said. Leading the way with his sniper rifle, he set off down into the riverbed. Using the water course for cover, the divers followed its snaking path upstream toward the snow-capped volcano in the distance. A drone flew low over the foothills, searching the canopy of trees growing along the base of the mountain. It circled several times, then shot back over the jungle in the direction of the smokestacks. Michael could see the smoke streaming out into the sky, but still couldn't see the silos. He could see radio towers and a satellite dish protruding from a cliffside like a mechanical ear. Flat, dry terrain stretched from the diver's position to the scree slopes around the base of the mountain. We have to cross that, Arlo whispered. We should have just dropped on the mountain and rappelled down. Quiet, Les snapped. Michael took a sip of water through his straw and tried to calm his nerves. 
He had tried his best to bury all thoughts of what was happening both on Aruba and in the Vanguard Islands, but downtime like this gave his mind time to stir up worries like a gust of wind stirring up grit. A sonic boom snapped him right out of it. The divers all hunched down as a drone rocketed across the sky. It stopped over the mountain and then lowered. Another drone rose into the air over the cliffs and climbed into the clouds. Thrusters pulsated and it blasted away across the skyline. Edgar panned his spotting scope over the flat, sear terrain, then looked over. Lightning reflected in his mirrored visor. We got a window, Commander, he said. This is our chance, Les said. Move fast and stay low. Michael got up and started off across the plains. The team ran in a crouch. Lena was still limping but keeping up. A half mile into the trek, they paused to rest at an outcropping of boulders. The wind had died down enough that Michael could see the hills. He sheltered behind a rock and gestured for Edgar. Find us a path, Michael said. Northeast looks clear with several more outcroppings if we have to hide, Edgar said, handing Michael his spotting scope. There were several clusters of buildings across the plateau, but it was the jungle at the base of the foothills that most interested him. If they could reach it, they could sneak to the foothills and then into the rocks surrounding the fortress at the foot of the mountain. He rotated the scope to look at the smokestacks and the fortress walls. They had to get inside there somehow. We make a run for the jungle, Michael said, then work our way up to the rocks to look for a way in. Everyone on me, fast and tight. He took off running. The trees were a mile and a half away, normally about a 13-minute run in armor but he had to go slower for Lena. Minutes into the trek, he spotted the mounds of earth they had seen from Cricket's camera. And while he couldn't see cannons or turrets, he knew they were there, hiding. A branch snapped under Michael's boot. He kept going, ignoring it. After another snap, he realized that they weren't sticks. Bones littered the dirt ahead. He slowed his pace. They were in the graveyard they had seen from the sky. The round rocks he had spotted at their last position weren't rocks either. Shells of vehicles littered the ground. The nose of a helicopter and a wing of a fighter jet stuck out of the ground to his right. And bones were everywhere. Armor, too. All of it scoured by the wind over the centuries since the human army lost the battle to stop the machines. Michael kept walking, then broke into a trot. Every bone that snapped under his heavy boots made him think of the dead. These people couldn't all have been soldiers. Like the Helldivers, they had probably come from all walks of life. Teachers, engineers, chefs. People trying to save what was left of their world. And they had failed. Michael kept running, trying to put them out of his mind and focus on the mission. But every step was a challenge. He felt that he was in a graveyard possessed by the ghosts of fallen warriors all of them counting on the Helldivers to finish what they themselves had failed to do. His thoughts returned to Layla and Bray. He was trying to save his family, just as these people had tried to save theirs. Thinking of X enabled him to refocus. The king was off fighting the Skinwalkers to save not only his family, but the Vanguard Islands, too. And if X and General Forge ran into defectors there, it could be a slaughter. Michael narrowed in on the trees, running faster, rifle cradled and eyes forward. To defeat the machines, he must become one. He was a quarter mile from the tree line when another drone rose into the sky. He didn't see it at first, only the sound of thrusters. But then it burst through the smoke wafting away from the factory stacks. Michael kept running, close enough to the fortress now to see a dirt road leading away from two massive steel doors that must be an entrance. Both were sealed shut. He glanced over his shoulder. The divers were keeping up with him, even Lena. They bolted for the acres of trees and red sage-like bushes, ample concealment for scouting out the base. Somewhere behind them, another drone thruster roared. Everyone hit the ground, praying that their suits would mask their heat signatures. He stared ahead, not daring to move, staring into the empty orbits of a cracked and wind-polished skull. A ribcage stuck out of the ground nearby, and beside it, a skeletal hand, a wedding ring still on the third finger. Michael again thought of Layla and Bray. 
You're going to see them. You're going to get out of this. As the machine closed in, that little promise to himself seemed hard to believe. Michael flitted his eyes to see the drone up close for the first time. This model was much more advanced than Cricket. It had no limbs and a curved shell. Spikes jutted from the armor, and an antenna tested the air. The thrusters in back turned off as the underbelly opened. It switched to hover mode, and all those spikes extended into what were surely weapons. Heart thumping, he resisted the urge to raise his laser rifle and blast the damn thing out of the sky. If he did, they were so close to the base that the machines would send everything down on them. The drone lowered until it was ten feet above him, close enough that the hover nodes kicked up a rooster tail of dust. The force of the draft exposed a skull still wearing a helmet that didn't look much different from his own. Michael tried to calm his pounding heart as the drone flew over him. He waited for a flurry of bolts that never came. The draft of air passed right over him as it flew over the other divers. He remained frozen, and the noise moved farther away. He swallowed hard and then flinched at another noise, a beeping sound. Michael's gut clenched when he realized what was causing it, his wrist monitor. He brought it under his body and shut it off, but too late. The humming returned, drawing closer. He prepared to roll away and fire his laser rifle, waiting for just the right moment. But just when he flipped onto his back, the thrusters on the drone fired. Blue flames scorched the air as it zipped away. He didn't waste a second getting up. The team followed him toward the trees while the drone flew away to the eastern edge of the battlefield. Michael recognized the location. Cricket had somehow come back online, not to warn Michael, but to provide a distraction. He looked over his shoulder just as the enemy drone located Cricket's broken body. A flurry of red lasers pounded the ground, finishing off the mechanical helldiver that had saved countless human lives, including Michael's. Anger flared, and he halted but Les pulled on his robotic arm. He chambered the anger for later and ran to the jungle on the captain's heels. When they got there, Edgar was aiming his rifle toward the fortress walls. Guys, we have a major fucking problem, he said quietly. The gate Michael had seen earlier widened, giving them the first look inside the base. Marching forward were three DEF-9 units, followed by another three. Within seconds, a small army had left the base, marching down a sloped road. Holy shit, Edgar said. Take a look at this. He handed Michael the spotting scope and Michael zoomed in, expecting to see even more machines inside the base. But he saw other figures. Not machines at all. These were humans, all of them shackled and chained. A drone hovered over the group and a defector led them across an open area toward the factory smokestacks. The gates slowly closed, again blocking the view. Mechanical joints clanked in the distance as the defectors marched down the road and spread out. What do we do? Arlo asked. Les looked toward Michael. They both answered at the same time. We hide. 36. Magnolia climbed the interior stairwell in what appeared to be an abandoned building. Axe and Victor followed her, their helmet beams raking back and forth, illuminating a reddish crust that covered the stained walls like warts. Head pounding from her injuries, she felt like an insect stuck in a web, being pulled in all directions by a family of hungry spiders. Using her body, she burst through a web covering the stairwell. She hoped that Lieutenant Wynne would be able to protect their home until the Helldivers could shut down the machines. Not knowing how Les and Michael were doing made her feel helpless. But that wasn't her only worry. Leaving Miles and a gravely wounded Roger on the beach tugged on her heart. At the top floor of the building, she entered a hallway with cracked walls. Switching off her helmet lamp, she used her night vision optics to scan the passage. The doors were gone, allowing a view into each room. X and Victor followed her, clearing the spaces one by one. At the final room, Magnolia went inside, sweeping her rifle barrel over the rotted desks and rusted chairs. Broken windows looked over the refinery. Keeping low, she spotted a figure on a silo. 
the skinwalkers weren't hiding anymore. Several walked on the round rooftops, watching the ground and the air for hostiles. She counted five of them, and on the ground, another two patrols of four men each inside the fenced-off compound. X and Victor took up position along the wall, sneaking glances out the missing windows. Magnolia checked out the compound. Two fences sealed off the main buildings inside. A third barrier of brick and mortar surrounded the buildings. Weeds and bushes with stubby branches grew inside the fenced zone. Something moved in the purple foliage, parting it like a dorsal fin cutting through the water. An eyeless head emerged and a spiked back. A prowling siren. Another layer of security around the outpost. And not just one siren. She spotted several of the creatures. All were males, their wings sheared off, leaving jagged stubs protruding from their bony backs. X saw them too, then raised his binoculars to the ocean. Magnolia aimed her night vision monocular in that direction, looking for shadow. The remaining Cazador warship was nowhere in sight. But she could see another vessel. Zooming in, she confirmed that it was Raven's Claw, sailing about a mile out to sea. This warship was different from the ones she had seen in the Cazador fleet. Several modifications had been made over the years, but it was the ribs of some gigantic sea beast mounted along the gunnels that caught her attention. On the bow, the skull of the largest shark she had ever seen bared its teeth at the darkness. Raking the scope over the deck, she spotted several sailors, though not as many as she would have expected. X stood beside her, scanning with his binoculars, while Victor stood guard. I don't see Shadow, he said. They turned back to the view of the outpost buildings. The skinwalkers were hunkered down, and Magnolia had a feeling she was seeing only a small portion of their fighting force. They also had the people they had woken from ITC's cryo chambers, not to mention the sirens. Horn and his men weren't just evil. They had to be insane. How are we going to get inside? She asked X. He kept his binos on the industrial buildings inside the fences. The structures were mostly metal warehouses built on concrete foundations. Like the Raven's Claw, they had been reinforced with plate steel. Bars covered the shaded windows. Train cars, no longer on tracks, served as barracks. Rusted containers also stood inside the compound, probably containing more horrors. Three against thirteen men, X finally said. I faced worse numbers. Victor didn't seem to understand. Plus the sirens, Magnolia said. Exactly, X said. Magnolia gave him a puzzled look. X flipped up his face shield and spat on the ground. You take out the guards on the rooftops, and Victor and I will take the patrols outside the outpost, X said. You want me to sit here and snipe? Victor's injured, and as you know, I can't shoot for siren shit with this damn toothpick arm. X was right, but she wanted in on the action when they found Moretto. She had a feeling the woman was hiding in the buildings directly in front of them. Once shit hits, meet on the west side of the outpost, X said. He pointed to the boatyard with its motley fleet and various states of decay, then to a cargo ship laden with containers. There, he said. We use the chaos to pick off anyone coming outside. Then we enter the outpost to mop up any survivors. Got it. Good luck, Mags. You too. The two men left, and Magnolia unslung Roger's assault rifle. She rested it against the wall, then laid out the magazines. Getting on one knee, she trained her laser rifle at the silos that X and Victor crept toward. The skinwalkers had spread out on the tops. They must have night vision goggles, because none were using flashlights. X and Victor neared the area where the barracudas had been ambushed. Blood from fallen soldiers darkened the soil. Spotting the area where Felipe fell, she aimed at the skinwalker who had killed him. Flaps of bloody skin draped the sides of his helmet. Magnolia noticed the dark tattoos on the patches. He was wearing Felipe's face and scalp. Bye-bye, asswart, she whispered. A bolt flashed through his mouth and out the back of his head. He crumpled to the silo roof out of view. Seconds later, she dropped another skinwalker with a bolt through the chest. 
She could see through the glowing orange hole in his middle as he teetered and fell. The other three soldiers seemed oblivious. She used the lag time to take off a third skinwalker's arm at the elbow. Before he could cry out, his head slid off and rolled against the severed forearm. The fourth guard turned, looking around wildly as he raised his rifle. Magnolia took his hand off, then blew through his helmet with a second bolt. Seeing his comrade drop, the fifth and final soldier swung his rifle toward her. She vaporized his chest armor before he could squeeze the trigger. Victor and X had advanced toward the first patrol of four skinwalkers. The men all carried rifles and had bows slung over their backs. X took up position behind a low concrete wall and pulled the other half of Rhino's spear from the sheath over his back. Victor stood with drawn cutlass, hugging the wall of an adjacent silo. Even from here, Magnolia could see that the blood had soaked through the bandage on his arm. The Skinwalker Patrol marched toward the ambush until the leader, a hulking man sporting a human jaw on his helmet, stopped and held up a hand. He looked up at a corpse hanging its head and arm over the edge of a roof. Magnolia aimed right at the jaw on the bulky Skinwalker as he raised an arm. Before she could pull the trigger, X materialized from behind a concrete wall. With a swift jab, his prosthetic spear pierced the man's helmet. With his left hand, he drove the other half of the spear into another soldier's chest. Victor had flanked, bringing his cutlass down on the back of a neck, severing head from spine. By the time the fourth soldier knew what was happening, both X and Victor had stabbed him twice. He dropped to the ground, and X finished him off with a spear through the eye slot. The patrol was dispatched in less than a minute, and Magnolia hadn't even fired a bolt. The king and Victor took off for the final patrol outside the fences. Gunfire cracked in the distance. Magnolia looked back toward the wind turbines. The noise seemed to be coming from that direction. Roger. Miles. More shots popped toward the beach west of the compound, where the other Barracuda team had gone to flank the outpost. Trying not to think about what was happening out there, she focused on finding the last patrol. X and Victor ran down the dirt road, following streaks of blood toward the fences and the area where she had last seen the other patrol. She moved to another window, but still didn't see the four warriors. Where the hell did they go? Magnolia went back to the window where she had rested her assault rifle. Using her night vision monocular, she combed the ground, finally spotting boot prints. She followed them to a silo where they vanished from view. Panning left, she finally saw part of a soldier. Just an arm and back of the helmet of a man who had stopped behind the silo. X and Victor were walking right toward the Skinwalker Patrol. If she didn't do something, they would be the ones ambushed. She aimed at the exposed helmet, but the angle was tricky. And even if she made the shot, there were still three more. Acting quickly, she swung the barrel to X and Victor and sent a bolt across their path. They both retreated and looked up at her position. She pointed at the location of the patrol. X nodded and started to flank with Victor, each moving around one side of the silo. She kept her rifle barrel aimed at the still-exposed helmet of the soldier standing sentry. The distant pop of gunshots came again, but it was more sporadic. Voices drifted in the lull. Magnolia took her visor away from the scope for a moment, looking east, toward the field with the wind turbines. It took a moment of scanning to see movement. Figures marched across the ash-covered field. The ITC slaves were returning with their masters. Shit, shit. She panned back to X and Victor. Both men were inching around the silo from opposite sides, preparing to strike the final patrol. The voices of the skinwalkers guarding the workers grew louder, but neither of her friends seemed to notice. Again, she moved her night vision monocular to the slavers. She counted six. They were heading right for the refinery. She couldn't take them all out before being spotted. When she turned back, X and Victor had moved around the silo. A scream rang out, then a gunshot. Metal clanked on metal. She tried to get a shot, but saw only a blur of armor. A skinwalker flew backward, limp, already dead. She still couldn't get a clear shot, and the slaver soldiers were about to reach the refinery. Come on, X, she whispered. Zooming in, she saw another skinwalker hit the ground. 
Someone grabbed his boots and dragged him out of view. Victor emerged and did the same with the other dead men. X waved up to her and then set off with Victor. Side by side, they ran for the fence and disappeared around a shipping container. Magnolia slung her rifle and set off to join them when a footfall made her freeze. With no time to unsling her rifle, she unsheathed one of her crescent blades. Whirling, she raised it, only to have it smacked away. Her blade flew across the room, clanking against a wall. A hand grabbed her around the neck and lifted her off the ground. She kicked at armored legs as she stared at the helmet of a massive skinwalker holding an axe. Several more soldiers in bulky armor adorned with bloody skin flanked the warrior. He squeezed tighter, cutting off her airway. She kicked and grabbed his wrist, but nothing worked. The man held her up higher, and she saw the horn on top of his helmet. It was the last thing she saw before the red border of her vision encroached, turning everything dark. Les had abandoned the idea of hiding and ran through the jungle with the other divers, not even trying to cut down the barbed branches and spiky blades in his path. Laser bolts singed the air, raining bark and leaves down from the canopy. He was trying to put all the distance he could between his team and the machines. Lasers punched into tree trunks, bursting out the other side in bright streaks that seemed to reach infinity. An artillery shell whistled overhead and streaked into the jungle, exploding in a brilliant orange glow. Leaves and branches fell blazing to the ground. Another shell sheared the top off a tree to his left. The blast shot out hundreds of little splinters that punched into his armor, leaving spikes like the bristles on a caterpillar. Pain lanced down his arm where one of the slivers jabbed through an interstice between armor plates. He gritted his teeth and plucked it out, only to trip over a root and fall flat on his stomach. Captain! Michael waved from what looked like a drop-off in the jungle. He ran over to Les, yelling something that Les couldn't make out over the ringing in his ears. Smoke whirled around them as flames lapped upward, igniting the dry bark of towering trees. Embers fell like flakes of burning snow. Les turned to see Edgar helping Lena through the labyrinthine foliage. They took off for the area Michael had waved from, but Arlo and Sophia were nowhere in sight. Another flurry of laser bolts strobed through the forest, slicing through everything in their path. He had a feeling the two young divers were already cut to pieces by the bolts. He pushed at the ground, but hesitated when he saw pulsating light through the trees. Michael started moving, then froze. Bumping off his NVGs gave Les a clearer view. A platoon of orange visors strode into the forest, looking like old world soldiers. But these soldiers would not show mercy. They would not take prisoners or lay down their weapons if surrounded. They would fight to the end and kill to the very last machine. They had one purpose, to end humanity. Bolts sprayed from their guns. Branches fell and a monstrous tree split at the crotch, both halves knocking down many of their neighbors. Let's go, Michael said. Stay low. Les pushed himself up on his knees, trying to stay close to the ground as he crawled. A cracking sound came from the advancing army, and he got his first view of one of the beetle tanks. The six segmented legs were taller than the defectors, probably even taller than Les. The turret rotated with at least six long tubular weapons. He got only a glimpse before the tubes opened fire, raking through the forest. As the machines and tanks entered the jungle, the barrage from the distant cannons stopped. Les started moving in a crouch, listening to the mechanical joints of the tanks as they strode into the forest. A figure came running from about halfway between Les and the machines. Dozens of bolts cut overhead, and he held a breath as the Helldiver zigged and zagged, ducking under branches and darting between two trees. Help! the diver screamed. Les could hear the nasal voice over the ringing in his ears. It was Arlo, and here he came, screaming and diving to the ground between Les and Michael. He rolled onto his back, gasping. What the hell do we do? Arlo yelled. Stay down and follow me, Michael said. There's some protection behind those trees. Where's Sophia? Les shouted. Arlo shook his head. She fell. Come on, Michael commanded. He started crawling under the spray of bolts, and Les and Arlo followed. They moved around a tree, and Michael got up to lay down covering fire. No, Les said. That'll tell them where we are. 
Michael nodded and pulled something off his vest. Get down, then run. The final EMP grenade. He pushed a button and lobbed it at the wave of approaching robot infantry. Les shook Arlo, who lay trembling on the ground. Run when I tell you, Les said. Arlo managed a nod. Michael raised his rifle again, his back to the tree, and sneaked a glance. Go now, he shouted. Les grabbed Arlo and pulled him up, and they ran together, zigzagging as low as they could go. The stream of laser bolts had all but stopped. Edgar fired his sniper rifle from a prone position between two trees just ahead. Les and Arlo made it to the drop-off Michael had found earlier. Unable to stop, Arlo yelped as he tumbled down the side. Les tried to grab him, but almost went over with him. Digging his boots into the dirt, Les watched helplessly as Arlo pitch-pulled right past Lena and banged into a tree twenty feet below. Lena went after Arlo, and Les turned to help Edgar. Where's Tin? Les yelled. Edgar took his shot, then pointed. Following Edgar's finger, Les saw a figure advancing toward the machines disabled by the EMP grenade, firing laser bolts so they would never walk again. The blast had taken down half of them, but others advanced through the curtain of smoke. Michael fired calculated shots, destroying several of the machines. We have to help, Les said. He got up, but Edgar yanked him back down. You nuts, Cap? he asked. Chest heaving, Les watched in horror as Michael fought his way deeper into enemy territory. But it wasn't simply the urge to kill that was driving the commander mad. Les saw where Michael was heading. Sophia was slouched against a tree, holding her shoulder. The armor glowed red where a bolt had singed the plate. A crack from Edgar's rifle refocused Les. Another machine went down from an armor-piercing round to the skull. Les aimed his laser rifle at the defectors closing in on Michael. He had gotten to Sophia and reached down to help her up. Two defectors burst through the bushes to the right of the tree. Edgar took one down, and Michael reached up with his robotic hand and slapped the other machine's laser muzzle away. Then he punched it in the chest with his robotic hand, breaking the exoskeleton and shattering the battery. The machine toppled to the ground. Les fired more bolts into the machines trying to flank the two divers. Several went down from well-aimed shots, but more came. Les had no idea how Michael and Sophia could make it to the drop-off without being cut down. There had to be at least twenty more machines in the jungle, plus the two tanks pushing their way through burning trees. Les and Edgar fired over and over, doing their best to help. The staccato crack of automatic gunfire joined the din, and in his peripheral vision, Les saw Lena pull out another magazine and palm it into her assault rifle. Return fire kicked up dirt in front of the rock and then found the boulder. The three divers hunkered down under the flurry of lasers. What do we do now? Edgar asked. Bolts pounded the rock and blew limbs off trees as Les crawled around the boulder to sneak a look. Michael and Sophia were trapped behind a massive tree. Ten or more orange visors homed in, unleashing an onslaught of bolts into the tree. The lasers broke through like a chainsaw until it cracked in the middle. Michael! Les shouted. Michael gripped his laser rifle to his chest and looked at the boulder. Then he waved at Les, motioning for him to retreat. We have to go, or we're all going to die, Edgar said. Lena crawled backward as bits of rocks pattered down, mixing with the bark and foliage from the trees. Edgar grabbed Les, but Les pulled out of his grip. I can't leave them, he said. He reached into his vest and pulled out the device containing the virus. Take this and complete the mission with Lena and Arlo if I don't make it. Sir, you. A bolt flashed by their helmets, cutting Edgar off. Then came what sounded like multiple shells screaming through the sky. Both men looked up as detonations filled the night. Rockets descended like destroying angels from the clouds, ripping into the jungle canopy and making the ground rumble. Les got up as defectors cartwheeled through the air like thrown ragdolls, an entire infantry column vanished in a wave of fire. Run, he yelled to Michael. Michael was already on his feet, helping Sophia up. Les and Edgar fell back into firing positions to cover their retreat. The entire jungle seemed to light up in a bright glare of the missile blasts. Timothy was giving the machines much more than just a distraction. 
the AI was giving the other AIs a beating. Michael and Sophia made it to the boulder, and they all slid down the hill. Arlo was at the bottom, standing now. This way, Lena said. The team headed into the ravine and toward a slope up. As they climbed, a view of the white-capped mountain rose in front of them. It took a few minutes to work their way up through thick bushes and spiky plants. At the crest of the hill, they could see the burning jungle and the ground scorched between it and the fortress. Twisted remains of machines littered the smoking dirt. A humming sound came from above. It wasn't a drone. Les looked up and saw the outline of discovery. He raised a hand, knowing that Timothy couldn't see him. As if in response, another salvo of missiles tore through the clouds and slammed into the fortress wall, opening gaping holes. Now's our chance, Michael yelled. Let's go! 37. The little catamaran had slipped ahead of the aircraft carrier in the darkness, but time was running out for Ada to reach the Vanguard Islands and warn King Xavier about the machines. In a few hours, her sails would penetrate the barrier between dark and light. The only saving grace was that the machines had slowed and stopped their ship, planning their attack or waiting for orders. She remained on the weather deck, holding the wheel and wearing one of the life jackets she had found inside the cabin. The protection helped her manage her anxiety, although it was building again. With each wave her hull stumped over, the anticipation grew. She had endured hell in the wastes, but that would all be a walk in the park, as they used to say, if the machines reached the islands. She turned for a parting look at the aircraft carrier, but she had sailed out of view. A pounding sounded below. Jojo hammered at the hatch, wanting out of the cabin. The monkey's constant slamming was grating on her nerves, but she couldn't go and check on it now. The black wall ahead seemed to lighten, or perhaps her eyes were playing tricks on her. According to her wrist monitor, she was still at least 20 miles from the barrier. Ada took one hand off the wheel to use her binoculars. Holding them to her cracked visor, she raked them over the waves, stomping on a shape that jutted out of the ocean. The sails flapped, hit by a crosswind that shook the boat. She nearly lost the binos over the gunwale. She put them away and grabbed the wheel, trying to keep the craft steady. Moments later, a blast of lightning stabbed the horizon like a spear from the heavens. In the glow, she saw a tower on the water. She remembered then, several oil rigs were outside the barrier. This was where the Cazadores kept their prisoners, a place she could have been sent if not exiled. The shark's cage. She steered toward it, thrilled at her good luck. They would have a communication system there, a way to radio the king about what was coming. She hoped he was still alive to fight. Thunder rattled the boat, and another lightning strike fired the horizon. But she kept going toward the rig, undeterred. A chill ran up her spine when she spotted something over her shoulder. She kept her gaze on that grid of ocean, but after a few moments, she marked it off as a wave. She still had time. Before her loomed the oil rig turned prison. The southern side had a marina where several boats were docked. It had been a long time since she saw another human, and she prayed there were at least a few militia soldiers here, though she doubted it. Tired, Injured and cranky, she wasn't in the mood to talk to Cazadores. Waves slapped at the boat as she sailed toward the piers. She eased off the sails, trying to slow the boat. This was the first time she had ever tried to dock. All that matters is getting there, even if you destroy the boat. But if she crashed, that could injure Jojo. She realized then that the pounding below had stopped. Maybe that was good. Ada put the monkey out of her mind. As she sailed closer, one question consumed her. How had the machines found them? A cracking sound snapped her away from the implications. The damn monkey was trying to escape. Ada was locking the wheel when she heard the shattering of glass on the starboard side of the boat. A bundle of dark fur emerged on the aft ladder. Two wide black eyes stared at her. You little shit, she yelled. Get over here. 
Jojo climbed up onto the deck and clung to her leg. Ada grabbed the steering wheel again. A wave slapped the port side, dousing them in water. She wasn't sure Jojo could swim and didn't want it to freak out when it saw other humans, especially Cazadores in full armor. Ada eyed the other life jacket she had found below decks. It was out of reach, and with Jojo clinging to her leg, she couldn't nudge it with her boot. The rig was close now, the docks within view. Letting go of the wheel, she hobbled over to the jacket with Jojo stuck like a limpet to her leg. She strapped the creature into the jacket, then hurried back to the wheel. Right as she grabbed it, a rumbling sounded over the waves, commanding both her and the creature's attention. The noise was from a motor. A light blasted the sailboat, blinding Ada and sending the monkey bolting. No, Ada shouted. She raised a hand to block the spotlight beam. The creature had gone now, retreating to the lower deck. Another beam hit Ada in the side of the head, forcing her to turn away, and she heard the chug of another motor. Over the engine noise came shouting, all in Spanish. A flare streaked into the sky, exploding in a bright red burst. In the glow, she spotted multiple small vessels closing in from different directions. Within minutes, the sailboat was surrounded. Lower your sails, someone shouted in English. It's me, Ada Winslow, she yelled back. The machines are coming. Shut up and lower your sails. She decided to do as ordered. Six boats closed in as she slowed her craft. There's something on the deck behind the mast, someone shouted. Some sort of... Ada turned to look for Jojo, but froze when a gunshot cracked. Hands up and don't move, yelled the same voice from earlier. You have to listen to me, she cried. There is a ship, an aircraft carrier of machines heading this way. No one replied at first. Then came laughter. Hands up. Don't make me tell you again. A voice in Spanish followed, someone giving orders. Two of the boats approached, men on the bows ready to jump onto her deck. Not just Cazadores, the militia was here too, and they might shoot her strange companion out of fear. She raised her hands and slowly turned. Please, you have to listen to me. We're coming aboard, don't move. The monkey whimpered. It was hiding somewhere below, and she had to get to it before the soldiers did. She walked away from the wheel, holding a breath in her chest, waiting for bullets to pierce her flesh. She made it to the ladder. Bathed in light, she stood there, searching the deck for Jojo. She found the monkey in a corner on the port side, by a lashed down stack of crates. She pushed her luck by climbing down the ladder. Several voices called out to stop her, but no bullets came. She got to the deck and hurried over to Jojo, petting the monkey with one hand and keeping the other hand above her head. The two boats that had started to approach had stalled. She could hear distant voices, all of them quieter now. Then, over the chug of outboard motors, she heard humming. What is that? A soldier asked. Ada turned toward the shark's cage but saw nothing. Then she looked out over the ocean. The warriors and the boats were doing the same thing, turning in all directions. Purple streaks burst from the clouds, and a swarm of spherical craft the size of siren cocoons rocketed out of the sky. Incoming, someone yelled. Fire! Gunfire cracked all around her, muzzles winking in the darkness. Laser bolts lit up the darkness like perfect lines of lightning. One hit the boat nearest her, and it burst into flames. The next beam flashed through the sailboat's deck. Ada did the only thing she could think of. She sucked in a breath, grabbed Jojo, and jumped overboard. Waves swallowed them, but she kept her grip on the terrified monkey. The life jackets pulled them back up toward the dazzling flurry of bolts lancing through the darkness. She tried to stay below the surface, using her legs and free arm to push down, but they bobbed back up. The sounds of slaughter boomed in her ears. She swallowed a mouthful of water from a wave that slapped against them. On her back, still choking, she kicked away from the boats. Jojo gripped her tight, digging its nails into her. Hold on, little friend. Laser bolts flashed from the drones swooping overhead. Explosions boomed, and glowing metal hissed into the water. An armored body splashed in front of her and sank like a stone. 
She finally stopped coughing and rolled onto her belly, one arm around Jojo, the other paddling. Bolts sizzled into the black water below her. Muffled sounds filled her ears. She expected a bolt to burn through her at any moment, but only her lungs burned. She kept kicking until she couldn't. Pulling her face up, she listened. This time, there was only a humming sound. Water dripped off her visor. When her vision cleared, fires raged on all the boats. The drones had already flown away, their thrusters flaring as they sped toward the Vanguard Islands. She was too late. Treading water, she searched for the shark's cage, hoping to get inside and send a message over the comms. A glance told her it wasn't going to happen. The rig burned like a cornstalk. With a loud crack, the top deck of the tower slid off into the water. The splash formed a sizable wave that pushed outward. She held Jojo, trying to think of what to do as smoke wafted into the sky. Over the crackling fires, she heard what sounded like a motor. A voice called out. Auxilio! Someone was still alive. Holding Jojo with her right arm, she sidestroked toward the noise, her life jacket keeping her afloat. Amid the burning flotsam, a single boat remained. At the gunwale, a man in Cazador armor fished out the soldier who had cried for help. Ada swam over as the boatman pulled the soldier aboard. When she reached the rescue craft, she tensed, half expecting the armored Cazador to point a gun at her. Instead, he reached out a gloved hand. A memory of the lion's crew surfaced, and regret tugged at her heart. There was only one way to make up for it. Ada sidestroked the rest of the way, holding Jojo against her. Reaching the boat, she took the Cazador's hand, burying the past in hope that together they could help save the future. When X told Magnolia to meet them in the abandoned shipping yard when the shit hits, he hadn't meant it as an understatement. But the sirens he and Victor had let out of the electronic fence weren't just heading into the compound, they were taking off into the refinery. It wasn't just skinwalkers they were hunting. The group of ITC slaves had returned after hoisting up the bodies of the Barracuda recon team. X couldn't see them, but he could hear their guttural screams. The sirens were tearing them apart. X and Victor continued through the maze of wrecked boats in the yard, putting distance between themselves and the monsters. Victor carried his shield over his back and led the way with his assault rifle. They passed a boat that was nothing but metal ribs, looking like the carcass of a whale calf. They made it to the container ship without being seen. By the time they started climbing a ladder to the deck, the outpost sounded like a war zone. Gunfire cracked, and the high-pitched shrieks of the freed sirens added to the cacophony. X took up position near the gunnel and glassed the industrial buildings inside the compound. A single steel door had opened, but only six skinwalkers had emerged. That was good. Easy pickings, X whispered. Two of the soldiers didn't even have their helmets on. Several were still loading weapons, and one had nothing but a machete in hand. The skeleton crew had been caught with their pants down, unaware that their patrols and snipers were dead. X didn't need to scan the six to know that Moretto and Horn weren't among them. No, the cowards would be hiding underground, or perhaps they were on Raven's Claw. Maybe even a submarine. X hoped that wasn't the case. He had to avenge Rhino with his spear. It was the only way for the general to reach his Valhalla. Determined, X crept along the rusted gunnel of the ship while the cries of the slaughter continued. The staccato of gunfire was followed by an electronic wail from a dying siren. He tried not to think of what was happening on the diving mission or back at the Vanguard Islands, or even to Miles and Roger on the beach, but it was nearly impossible. The only thing that helped was fighting. Merely watching the fighting didn't help much. A burly skinwalker strode away from the others, fearlessly approaching twenty prowling beasts in the compound. He raised two submachine guns in his beefy hands. The bastard had packed on weight by feasting on human flesh, but in a few moments, it would be the sirens feasting. The skinwalker sprayed the advancing monsters with both weapons, the muzzle flashes lighting up his large frame. The ten beasts in the open charged, and those near the industrial buildings scurried up the walls to the roofs. 
A muscular female siren made it through the wall of gunfire, taking several hits before punching its talons through a skinwalker's chest armor and bringing him down hard on his back. The beast slammed its head into the man's helmetless face. Another female jumped off a rooftop, landing on the back of the man with the submachine guns. He whirled, still firing, his bullets killing one of his fellow soldiers. The other four men fled while a pack of beasts descended on their two fallen comrades. A dozen more sirens gave chase, quickly catching up to two laggards. Hearing their screams, X smiled with grim satisfaction, then looked over his shoulder for Magnolia. She should be here by now. You see Mags out there? he asked. Victor seemed to understand and looked back the way they had come. A dirt road curved around the compound's outer walls. It bore fresh vehicle tracks. Weeds the height of a child framed the road, but X didn't see Magnolia anywhere. He checked the outpost once more to see the last two skinwalkers being surrounded by the sirens they had starved. The other beasts were already feasting on corpses or had continued their hunt into the barracks. The final screams rang out as the pack overran the two skinwalkers. They vanished under a flurry of spines, talons, and veiny flesh. One of the smaller abominations took off with an armored arm. It stopped behind a building where it peeled off the armor as if peeling off the shell of a shrimp to get at the meat. Human screams died away in the distance, leaving the island in silence. Even the gunfire had stopped. X searched for Magnolia again, but still didn't see her. The lonely wail of a siren shattered the stillness, and another monster answered the call. Hearing that sound, X still felt a shiver. They were once again the alphas in control of the outpost. He zoomed the binos in on the refinery. Bodies of ITC slaves lay crumpled, gutted, many of them missing limbs. He had never seen one of the cryo-frozen humans outside their chambers, and he couldn't help but feel pity for them all. But he was more worried about Magnolia. Where the hell was she? Victor pointed his rifle north toward the harbor. Men, he said quietly. X panned the binos to five men in armored suits. He let out a sigh of relief when he saw that the metal wasn't covered in human skin. These weren't skinwalkers. They were the remaining barracudas he had ordered to flank along the shoreline. Several limped from injuries, and the biggest man of the team had an arrow in his chest armor, the end already snapped off. X didn't want to leave without Magnolia, but he had a feeling she was hunkered down, waiting to make her move. Another fear crossed his mind, that a siren had gotten to her. X took the same ladder back to the ground with Victor. They joined the team of barracudas in the boatyard. The man with the arrow jutting from his chest armor walked over. It was Willis, the English-speaking Cazador X had talked to on the beach. King Xavier, Willis said. We cleared a patrol from the shore. Good work. Victor and I took out the skinwalkers here with a little help from the sirens. The demons. X nodded. There are at least fifteen still out there. Willis nodded. Shadow is sailing east, he said. We saw Raven's Claw to the northeast. X looked back out to sea, but couldn't distinguish much beyond the scrapyard. The warships would meet eventually. In the meantime, he had to do his part. It was not ideal and not the way he had planned it, but six able warriors stood in front of him and Victor. Once they linked up with Magnolia, he would take them into the outpost to clear the buildings and root out the rats. X explained the plan to Willis, who then relayed it to his soldiers. Pulling out his blaster, X led the way back through the scrapyard, hoping Magnolia was somewhere out here waiting. The barracudas fanned out, weapons shouldered. X went back the way he had come, all the way to the fence he and Victor had cut through after disabling the power. Several sheds and abandoned structures provided cover from the fences to the building where Magnolia had laid down covering fire. He raised his binos to the window where he had last seen her. Nothing moved behind the opening. X pushed forward. She would have seen him by now. Something had happened to her. You should never have left her, you old prick. The abandoned building was one of several outside the outpost and refinery. 
The others were just long warehouses. He kept low, eyes up, forward, then down, where he spotted siren tracks. They led to the building on his left where he had last seen Magnolia. The sight turned his gut to ice. Another pair of prints angled toward the warehouse on his right. He started running toward the larger building's back entrance. The first set of siren tracks led right to it. Victor and the Barracudas followed him to the back wall where they could see a wide alley between the buildings. He halted when he saw a flatbed truck parked diagonally at the other end with a shipping container on the back. He hadn't seen it before. But then again, he hadn't checked the alley for anything but contacts. X continued to the exit door that opened into a stairwell. Ash tracks led up into the dark building. He stopped to listen for the prowling monsters. The other soldiers set up along the back wall. A rattling sound rose over the wind. It wasn't coming from inside the building. Victor started to move around the corner to look into the alley, but X stopped him and went first. A siren had perched on the adjacent warehouse, all the way down by the parked truck. The eyeless head tilted like that of a curious bird on a branch. Its mouth opened into what looked like a macabre grin. Then it lowered its bald white head and tore into a body it had dragged up to the roof where it could eat in peace. A bloody arm hung over the edge. X swallowed, hoping to God it wasn't Magnolia. He pointed his spear at the monster. The barracudas followed him into the wide alley, past rusted trash bins and piles of bricks. Halfway down the alley, he stopped. The rattling came again. But it wasn't coming from the rooftop as he had suspected. His eyes flitted to the container on the truck. This wasn't some abandoned vehicle. It had inflated tires. The back end was much lower than the front, indicating much weight in the container. X looked back to the siren and saw that it was chewing on an ITC worker. Relief filled him. It wasn't Mags. The beast suddenly shrieked and arched its spiked back, grasping an arrow in its side. A second arrow and a third struck the creature, knocking it off the side of the building. It landed with a thud on the back bumper of the truck. The shipping container shook violently, and a roar sounded inside. X took a step back as the container door clanked open and a hulking figure emerged, glowing in the green hue of his optics. He flipped his NVGs off, expecting to see the orange visor and battery unit of a defector, but instead he saw a gargantuan monster. Bones formed bars over the bulging muscles across its body. Barbed spheres protruded from the double-jointed elbows and kneecaps. This was no machine, but a bone beast or what the Cazadores also called a demon king. A metal halo was bolted onto its bony head like some sort of evil crown. The creature went down on one spiked kneecap, hunching slightly. Jutting from its back were the long, sharp bones that X had seen other bone beasts use as spears. But unlike those abominations, this creature seemed strangely docile. X motioned for the barracudas to get back. They all knew what it was and needed no encouragement. Victor was the only one to step forward. Whoever had shot the bolts at the siren still had not emerged, and several barracudas had run over to the warehouse to flank. A buzzing sounded, and the bone beast reached up with a paw to the crown on its head, letting out a raucous cry that scrambled distant birds into the sky. The monster jumped out of the container and landed on the ground, exposing a skinwalker in the back of the truck who held a long black rod that connected to the metal crown. No! X yelled when Victor went to shoot the man. It was too late, and the burst hit the soldier in the chest. He released the rod, and the bone beast looked over its spiked shoulder. Roaring, it grabbed the soldier and ripped off both legs like chicken bones. Then it whirled, flinging the limbs at X and Victor. Aim for the eyes, X yelled. Open fire! Rounds lanced into the creature as it bounded forward. X almost tripped as he turned to run with Victor. Two barracudas were on their knees, firing assault rifles at the abomination, but X knew all too well they were going to need luck. He ran past them, almost skidding in the dirt when he saw that a group of skinwalkers had flanked them from the scrapyard. 
The ten soldiers held rifles, spears, and bows, but none of them aimed their weapons yet. They weren't alone. A female voice screamed, and the wall of armor parted to reveal Magnolia, crumpled at the feet of a short woman in armor. It had to be Carmela Moretto. Behind them, a massive soldier strode out of the shadows. Like the monster, the bastard prince wore a metal crown. His sported a horn. Something about the flaps of dried flesh on his helmet seemed familiar. The lips looked female but it was the buzzed crown cut from a skull that told X exactly who the face had belonged to. You sick son of a bitch, he snarled. Behind him, the bone beast gave a deep baying howl and slammed into two barracudas. One crashed to the ground, sliding all the way to X with a dent in his chest armor. He wheezed, trying to suck breath into crushed lungs. All around, in what seemed like slow motion, Gunfire rang out with the war cries of warriors. X and his men were outnumbered over two to one, and the bone beast was tearing apart their rear flank. He saw Magnolia move slightly. Back when he first met her, the girl with attitude and a gothic vibe had given him the creeps. Now she was practically family, the rebellious daughter he never had. And there was only one way to save her. Fight. Horn twirled an axe and pointed it at X. Victor screamed as he raised his shield with his injured arm, stopping several arrows and bullets meant for the king. X used the moment and turned with his blaster, firing a flare into the bone beast's face. The flare hit right where he had hoped and rained sparks down on the barracuda the creature was pummeling. Dropping his blaster, X pulled the other half of Rhino's spear from the sheath on his back. Releasing a war cry of his own, X ran with Victor and several barracudas toward the skinwalkers. Horn and his men didn't fire their guns. Instead, they brandished spears, swords, and machetes. X clenched his jaw, focusing on Horn. In just seconds, he would have his chance to kill the man. As he ran, faint booming sounded in the distance. He spotted flashes on the horizon. Shadow had finally found Raven's Claw. And Dex had finally found Horn and Moretto. It was time to end this or die trying. 38. An hour after Discovery surprised the army of machines, the remaining divers had worked their way through the jungles and into Kilimanjaro's rocky foothills. A bluff with multiple peaks provided a perfect vantage point over the fortress built at the southern base of the mountain. Only a half mile away from the nearest section of wall, it was the closest Michael had been to the base. Glancing up to higher promontories, he spotted Edgar and Les, now in position. Michael moved behind a rock and glassed the battlefield where Timothy had obliterated the small army of machines. Smoke still wafted up from the scorched dirt. Twisted and charred exoskeletons of machines smoldered in the debris field. Four tanks lay on their backs like dead beetles, their segmented legs twisted and melted from the intense heat of the bombs. Michael couldn't see the airship, but knowing that it was up there, with Timothy, Samson, and the crew watching over the divers, gave him a new sense of confidence. Now he just had to get inside the base. That wasn't going to be easy, even with two gaping holes in the fortress walls. The rocket impacts had opened the doors, but new tanks had shown up to plug them, with laser barrels aimed at the skyline. Michael couldn't see the cannons that had taken out Cricket, but he knew they were waiting for the airship to move into firing range. Discovery had been lucky to get away on the first run. Against all that firepower, the chances of it surviving a second attack were thin, and it wasn't just the cannons and tanks. A swarm of drones patrolled the sky. Michael guessed they couldn't fly as high as Discovery, or they would already have blown the airship out of the clouds. It had wreaked havoc on the base. Four of the fourteen buildings inside the walls were now piles of rubble. The undamaged buildings looked manufactured, all the same metallic color, all in perfect rows, like a small old-world city for machines instead of humans. Centered in the small city was a massive steel tower with a spiked roof. It was ten times the height of the other buildings. Several rockets had hit the odd structure, leaving black streaks on the surface, 
but there didn't appear to be any damage, nor could he see a single window or doorway leading into the tower. Several DEF-9 patrols marched down the roads where the divers had little to hide them from the machines. A few trees grew in the dirt, along with clumps of weeds. Stacks of pipes and metal parts might also provide cover. There were still enough machines to make sneaking in difficult, especially with the drones. He ducked back into the rocks as another flew overhead. This would be harder than he had supposed. The drone hovered a moment, and Michael decided to return to the cave where Arlo and Sophia rested. Lena waited at the entrance, holding a laser rifle. They exchanged a knot, and Michael went inside to check on the injured divers. Both sat on the dirt floor, leaning against the cave wall. The armor had saved Arlo's life, but it hadn't stopped the laser bolt that sheared off the top of Sophia's shoulder. As Michael knew all too well, the only upside to being shot with a laser bolt was the cauterizing effect. I can still fight, she said, standing. Did you find a way in? Not yet, Michael said. Arlo remained seated, holding his side. The wound he got in Rio de Janeiro had flared up after his tumble down the hill, and he likely had a concussion. Tell me when it's time to finish these tin pots off, he said. Soon, Michael replied. But we're running out of time. If there were machines at the Outrider, X and his team could be in terrible danger, and not just from the defectors. The drones had changed the game, and seeing them here meant they could be out there, too. Crunching footsteps sounded, and Michael moved over for Les and Edgar. Gather around, Les said. His tone was grave. Michael wondered what Les had seen that he hadn't. I'm uploading video to your HUDs, Les said. He tapped his wrist computer and fed the recorded video to their subscreens. I still don't know where the entry to their main hub is, but I did see a road. He tapped his monitor and zoomed in. Right here. The road went straight into the mountain, something Michael had missed. As we suspected, the mainframe must be buried, Les said. Now Michael understood the grave tone. So how do we get in? Arlo asked. By finding an alternative route, Les said. There has to be one. My guess is there are underground tunnels from the main buildings to the base below, but they'll surely be heavily guarded. Michael studied the imagery. The road was just behind the factories built against the mountain. Les was probably right, but it was a big risk on a hunch. Then again, a hunch was all they were going on anyway. We counted ten patrols of defectors, each four strong, and three more of those walking beetle tanks, Edgar said. Some of them are clearing debris piles, though, so that's good for us. Sophia checked Les's arm. You okay? she asked. I'm fine. You're the one that... It's not as bad as it looks, she said, eyeing the missing armor and the charred flesh beneath. I can fight. Les stepped closer to check the wound. Good, because I need all of you, he said. Lena and Edgar, find a spot up here to provide covering fire if we run into problems. Wait, who is we? Arlo asked. Les tilted his helmet. The rest of us. Arlo snorted but didn't protest. You're with Michael, Les said. I'll take Sophia. We'll scramble up the rocks to get over the walls by those smokestacks. Once we're inside, we split up and find a way into the mountain. You good to go? Michael asked Arlo. Sure, Arlo said. You don't sound like it, Les said. Because I just tumbled down a goddamn hill after nearly getting turned into Swiss cheese, and now we're walking into a slaughterhouse. The divers lapsed into silence in the dark cave. A drop of water spattered on the floor. If that is true, it's another reason we have to do this, Les said. Don't forget why we came here. I need you now more than ever. Arlo's cracked helmet nodded. I won't let you down, sir. I'm sorry, I'm just... You survived Rio, Sophia said. You'll survive this. She gave him a pat on the back. It's settled then, Michael said. Let's get moving. We don't have much time. The divers left the cave and climbed back into the rocks. Storm clouds, swollen with rain, were passing overhead. The drones blasted in and out of them, uninterested and looking for the divers. 
discovery was the threat. Once again, the machines were making a mistake that Michael would use to his advantage. He led the divers by climbing carefully, keeping three points of contact on the unstable rock. The first drops of rain fell when he got to the next bluff. Les, Arlo, and Sophia took cover there with him while Edgar and Lena moved to a higher vantage. The slope below stretched into a valley, then up to the fortress walls. Rocks the size of a man and bigger covered the dry terrain in between. Orange and red crust grew on the fractured surfaces of the boulders, but they weren't the only organic life. Purple blades grew out of the dirt, blowing in the wind. He also spotted a strange new grain with a corncob head attached to a long, curving stem. Patches of the odd plant grew all the way to the twenty-foot-high fortress wall. Michael didn't spot any guard towers along the top, but that didn't mean there were no defectors or cameras up there. Les stayed with him a moment, then signaled to advance, but Michael suddenly grabbed his shoulder. What? Les asked quietly. Michael stared at something on the ground near the base of the wall. He zoomed his laser rifle scope in on a patch of the plants. A pin-headed metallic object jutted out of the end of the corncob-shaped grain head. These weren't just plants. They were sensors. Michael whispered his discovery to Les, who twisted back toward the bluff where Edgar and Lena were moving into position. What are you thinking? Michael said quietly. Either we need Timothy to come back in for another bombing run, or we use our boosters with the eastern wind, Les said. If we launch from the bluffs, it should be powerful enough to take us over that wall. Discovery won't survive another run, Michael said. I know. Boosters it is, then. Michael again led them back through the cliffs, following the tracks Edgar and Lena had left in the narrow passages between the jagged walls. The two divers were around the next bend, perched on an outcropping with a perfect view of the factories. Edgar swung his rifle around at Michael before realizing who it was. Shit, Commander. You about lost your head, he muttered. Change of plans, Michael said. There are sensors down there. We'll deploy our boosters and let the wind take us over the walls. Risky as hell, Edgar said. But I've got your backs from up here. He set his magazines down on the rock and chambered an armor-piercing round. Lena got down on one knee beside him, laser rifle clutched like a baby against her chest armor. Okay, let's do it, Les said. I'll head east to the factories with Sophia. You start west and work your way back toward us. This is nuts, Arlo muttered. Michael spotted the perfect place to land on the western side of the compound. Several warehouses with industrial equipment on top provided cover and a long, flat roof to land on. The bombardment hadn't damaged any of those buildings. We aim for that one, Michael said, pointing. Listo, jefe, Arlo said. I mean, yeah, boss. Michael scanned the base once more. The roof of a three-story building near the factories opened, disgorging a drone. The spike on the tallest tower flashed orange, then went dark, and the drone zipped away. The spike had to be some sort of signal. Michael searched for more drones, but didn't see any. He didn't see any defectors or their human slaves either, only the tanks at the shattered walls and the drones patrolling the sky. So why the lack of interior defenses? Time to find out. The closest drone flew back into the base and hovered over the building where the last had emerged. The roof opened and the drone descended inside. From a bluff to the east, Les gave the signal to deploy their boosters. We fly so humanity survives, Arlo whispered. He punched his booster first, maybe trying to prove he wasn't scared. Michael followed immediately. His balloon burst from the canister and filled with helium, yanking him off the bluff. As he expected, the wind pushed him toward the walls. Rain pattered his visor as he rose into the sky. For the first several seconds, he anticipated lasers riddling his body. They were floating targets, known in the old world as sitting ducks. But their black armor and suits made them hard to see. Les and Sophia took off from the bluffs farther east toward the factories on the opposite side of the compound. Michael headed for the warehouse, twisting slightly to look at the metallic tower centered in the base. 
The spire on top made it one of the oddest old world towers he had ever seen. Ten defectors cleared debris from a destroyed building abutting the tower. None seemed to pay attention to the sky. The balloon carried him higher as the wind pushed him toward the walls. A patrol of defectors, visors forward, walked down the main road on the south side of the base. By the time Michael's boots cleared the wall, he was already two stories up. Arlo was even higher and rising. They both let helium out of their balloons to descend. East of them, Sophia and Les were also lowering. They vanished from view a moment later, and Michael focused on the DZ. He checked for contacts on the ground again, but the western side looked clear of machines. The flat roof rose up to meet his boots. Arlo landed first. Pulling his balloon down, he took cover behind a block of industrial units. Michael joined him there after carefully deflating his balloon. They each had only one, and it was their ride back to Discovery. Michael motioned for Arlo to follow him. As they crept across the rooftop, a drone blasted across the horizon, forcing them down. Once it had passed, Michael glanced over the building's edge. Below were several windows and a closed door. He had a feeling his wrist computer couldn't hack in as easily as on ITC facilities. He would do this the old-fashioned way. Hunching down out of sight, he explained his idea to Arlo. The answer was predictable. That's crazy, man. That's why it's going to work, Michael replied. He scanned the sky for enemy contacts, then the ground. Seeing none, he swung his legs off the roof, placing his boots on a narrow ledge. Then he turned and bent down, lowering himself to the next ledge. The window was shaded, but a light inside messed with his night vision optics. Michael turned them off, and in the moment it took to process what he saw behind the glass, he gave an astonished gasp. What? Arlo whispered from above. What do you see? A little boy holding a tattered stuffed elephant stood inside, looking at Michael. He narrowed his big green eyes, then waved. Several other people came running over, all of them covered in ash and grime. There had to be ten of them. Michael waved them back. One of the men inside understood and herded the group of filthy workers away from the glass. Michael aimed his laser rifle at the center and fired a bolt. Cracks spiderwebbed out from the hole. Slinging his rifle, Michael used his robotic fist to finish the job. On the third punch, the glass shattered and rained to the ground. He entered the room, which ran the length of the building. Bars segmented the long space into cages, each holding a dozen people, young, Old, white, brown. Michael froze as the implications set in. There had to be a hundred people on this level, and there could be even more below this floor. Chatter broke out, and the people in the cage Michael had entered stared at his robotic arm with wide eyes like terrified animals. It's okay, Michael said, raising his gloved hand. I'm not going to hurt you. His words did little to curb their fear or his. Panicked voices came from the other cages as people huddled close to get a look at Michael. He moved out of the way to let Arlo in. What in the hell? Arlo said. Where did all these people come from? Michael had an idea, but he was too worried about the machines to stop and theorize. Quiet, Michael said, bringing a finger to his helmet. Please, you have to be. In the next cage, a middle-aged man with a long beard and sunken cheeks spoke. So did a gaunt, gray-haired woman. He didn't recognize either language. Maybe French and German? Does anyone speak English? he asked. More voices in different languages. The noise made him cringe. He held up a hand again, trying to quiet them. People crowded the cages, jostling to get a look. Someone whistled, and silence filled the long space. Several people in the cage across from Michael moved aside for a shirtless man with a faded bird tattoo on his chest. He grabbed the bars of his cage. I speak English, he said. Michael and Arlo walked over to the bars of the cage, and Arlo fished a lockpick kit from his vest. Something told Michael this man had survived horrors as bad as anything X had seen. I'm Commander Everhart, Michael said, from the Vanguard Islands. We're here to destroy the machines and we're going to get you out of here. I'll be damned, the man said. 
We thought we were all that was left of mankind. He gestured out to the other cages. We're passengers from the ITC Victory, ITC Requiem, and ITC Malenkov, all brought here under the premise of salvation, saying the war was over. The man looked back to Michael and patted his chest. Never thought I'd see one of us again. Michael saw the tattoo as the man pulled his hand away. Not just any tattoo. It was a raptor. You're a helldiver? Michael stammered. The man sighed. A lifetime ago. I'm Cade Long. Cade, this is Arlo Wand, and there are four more of us out there. We need to know where the machine's mainframe is. Cade shook his head. Did you see that metal tower next door with no windows? Michael nodded. That's your target, Commander, Cade said. But the only way in is through the machines, and nothing short of a nuke set off inside is going to destroy their mainframe. Arlo pulled the lockpick away. Screw this, he said. Just use your laser, sir. Michael motioned everyone back and fired a bolt. It blasted through the lock, punching into the floor. The gate swung open, and Cade stepped through. Reaching back, Michael unholstered the pistol X had given him. He handed it to Cade. Thank you, Commander, he said. I never thought anyone would come for us. Don't thank me until we get you out of here. Let's start with freeing everyone else. They can't kill us all. His words trailed off because the machines could damn well kill everyone in this room if they wanted. Michael directed Arlo to the steel hatch while he and Cade walked down the passage between cages. Cade spoke to specific people in each, mostly older men and a few women. One by one, Michael shot the locks, freeing the prisoners. The strongest men and women converged behind Michael and Cade, eager to fight for their freedom. At the final cage, Cade beamed a yellow smile. Two prisoners helped an old man with white hair to his feet. A threadbare white uniform hung over his bony frame. Captain, Cade said. The man squinted at Michael and reached out his hand. Commander Everhart, meet Captain Rolo, Cade said. No time for introductions, Rolo mumbled. We have to get out of here. Michael nodded. How many machines are in this building, he asked. Normally none, Cade replied. They only come to get us for work in the factories. But after those explosions, who knows? Cade helped Rolo as they worked their way through the crowd of filthy people in the passage outside the open cages. All eyes were on Michael, as if he were some sort of divine savior. The boy with the stuffed elephant toy reached up as Michael joined Arlo, who was working on getting the steel exit open. Alton wants to know if you're going to save us all, said Cade. Michael looked over at the boy. I'm going to try, Alton. He patted the kid on the head, then froze when he heard a humming. Just as a drone rose outside the shattered window, Michael yanked the kid back from a flurry of laser bolts. Screaming filled the room as people rushed away, tripping and falling. Michael aimed his laser rifle at the drone and fired, blowing it away from the window. Amid the screaming, he never heard the door open. When he turned, a defector stood in the opening, holding Arlo up by his neck. 39. Magnolia woke up on the ground, tasting metal. She opened her eyes to a blurred view of dirt and grit covered in ash. Taking another breath of smoky air, she realized she didn't have her helmet. She tried to look around for it, but her eyelids seemed the only thing she could control. The rest of her felt paralyzed, and her head hurt something awful. She heard a faint clanking, followed by what sounded like grunts. Then people speaking in Spanish. Male voices, muffled by breathing apparatuses. A familiar gruff voice said, Don't touch her. Magnolia blinked as strong hands hoisted her off the ground. As her motor function returned, she craned her neck to see an alley between two rusted buildings. Armored bodies lay crumpled in the dirt between her and a flatbed truck with a shipping container on the back. She blinked again at the sight of a brooding beast with double-jointed kneecaps that ended in barbs. This can't be real. The monster looked in her direction, or so it seemed. 
she realized that it wasn't looking at her, or anything else for that matter. Half its face was burned away. A man stood behind the monster, holding it in place with a black iron rod attached to a metal crown around its skull. The clanking came again as the people holding Magnolia up dropped her onto the ground facing a boat scrapyard. She glanced in the direction of the clanking and grunting. Two men dueled amid the wrecked vessels. One man held a spear, and the other wore a horned helmet covered in dried skin. The man with the spear jabbed at the air, but his weapon wasn't long like a normal Cazador spear, and his arm looked too short. Then it dawned on her. The spear was the man's arm. King Xavier. Memories flooded her mind. She remembered everything up until the moment Horn sneaked up on her in the building. What happened after that was hazy. She knew only that the leader of the Skinwalkers had taken her captive, choked her unconscious, and was now fighting X to the death. And she was a spectator. Both men seemed sluggish now, their strikes weak and slow, as if they had been at it for hours. On their knees nearby were two Barracuda soldiers and Victor, hands tied behind their backs. None of them said a word, but Magnolia managed to mumble, X. A short figure suddenly blocked her view, removing its helmet to reveal a smirking, wrinkled face. The green eyes of Carmela Moretto burned at Magnolia. You fucking bitch, Magnolia blurted. Moretto nodded proudly. See, sí, claro. The two men holding Magnolia tightened their grip as she regained command of her body. A rush of adrenaline was all she needed to get the use of her limbs back. She nearly yanked free, but they pushed her to her knees right in front of Moretto. The old woman warrior leaned down close enough that Magnolia smelled her barbecue breath. Then Moretto leaned left to examine Magnolia's head. Reaching out, she grabbed the bandage covering her burns and yanked it off. Magnolia yowled in pain. X glanced over, and Horn used the distraction to kick him in the chest, knocking him to the ground. Her vision flooded with red, but she saw X roll away to avoid Horn's boot. He stomped the ground where X had fallen, then swung one of his axes. Moretto turned to watch. Explosions flashed on the horizon, providing another distraction. Magnolia spotted Shadow and Raven's Claw. The warships had come up alongside each other, and although she couldn't see it, she had a feeling General Forge and his men were in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Skinwalkers. This is what it all comes down to, she thought. Swords and spears. And from what she could see, which wasn't much, her side was losing. She could only hope that the forces at the Vanguard Islands were faring better, and that the Helldivers had completed their Africa mission just in case the machines had reached the islands. Tin. Les. Layla. Roger. Miles. X. Everyone she loved in this world was in danger. And not just them. The entire human race was at risk, thrust back into the apocalypse. The fate of the survivors would be determined by what happened in three far-flung locations. Filled with rage, Magnolia jerked free of the two men and tackled Moretto. The old woman hit the ground hard, and Magnolia grabbed her around the neck, screaming. This caught Horn's attention right as he held both axes high, ready to bring them down or throw them at X, who was backing away. X seized the opportunity to dart forward and jab with his spear arm. The blade punched in just below the collarbone with a sickening crunch. The skinwalker let out a roar and dropped one axe to the dirt. Magnolia didn't get a chance to see whether X finished the job. The two guards pulled her off Moretto and tossed her to the dirt beside Victor. Boots kicked her in the stomach and chest. The armor seemed to offer scant protection. Another kick knocked the breath from her lungs. She glanced up just as Moretto stumbled over, holding her neck. Then she too joined in with a kick to Magnolia's jaw. Blood filled Magnolia's mouth, and a piece of broken tooth cut her tongue. She slumped to her stomach, drooling blood and saliva onto the ash. The onslaught stopped, and a boot pushed against her back, holding her in place. She raised a swollen eye to X and Horn. The spear blade he had jammed into Horn's upper chest was stuck there. 
Horn had tried to bring his remaining axe down on X, but X had grabbed his wrist and was pushing up with that hand while trying to pry the spear free with his stump. Die, asshole, X said. Planting his left boot, he pushed the blade deeper into Horn's shoulder, eliciting another muffled roar of agony. A distant siren answered the call. Horn pulled X closer to his chest, pulling the spear blade deeper into his own flesh. He continued to scream as he pulled X, not stopping until the blade broke out the back of his armor, blood dripping off its slick edge. Now X was fastened to Horn's armored chest. The bastard prince, who was much taller, brought his horned helmet down hard against X's. The first blow didn't seem to inflict much damage, but the second knocked X's head back. He managed to keep his grip on Horn's wrist until the third headbutt cracked his visor. X seemed to go limp in Horn's grip. He headbutted the king another time, and shards of visor fell to the dirt. Then he raised the axe and brought it up to finish off the king. No, Magnolia shouted. Victor tried to get up, only to be shot in the upper back. A halo of dust poofed up as he hit the dirt belly first. The bullet didn't stop him. Hands still tied, he squirmed toward the king. Horn laughed as one of his men stomped on Victor's back. Magnolia's heart skipped a beat, then another, as Horn, still laughing, brought the axe down toward X's head. But instead of hitting him in the helmet, he smashed the spear contraption attached to his stump, breaking it off. Then he pushed X backward. The king fell on his back and lay still. Victor wriggled out from under the boot, but the skinwalker guard grabbed him by the boots and pulled him back to Magnolia. Tears rolled down her face as she watched helplessly. Moretto bent down and wiped away a tear with her finger, then brought it to her tongue. Magnolia glared with more hatred than she could contain. The distant chatter of gunfire sounded on the horizon as the battle continued between Forge and the other skinwalker forces. She could only pray for the general's victory. But even if he won that fight... There was little hope of him getting to X in time to save him from the demented skinwalker leader and his demonic mother. Magnolia had to do something. But what? She searched for a weapon, anything she could use. The other half of Rhino's spear stuck out of the dirt ten feet away, which was about nine feet too far. Horn staggered over to X, the other spearhead still stuck in his chest armor. Blood ran down his front and back. The blood loss would have been enough to bring most men to their knees, but like X, this wasn't a normal man. Fight me, Magnolia yelled. Horn looked at her, then reached up and twisted his helmet until it clicked. He pulled it off to show his face for the first time. Magnolia wasn't sure how she had imagined Del Pulpo's son to look, other than ugly. But the strong jawline and dimpled cheeks had little in common with his father. The surprisingly handsome features were ruined by soulless eyes that now focused on her. He licked the air and said, Te dejo para luego. Something about saving her for later. Then he went back to the king. Dripping blood, he bent down and pried X's helmet off. The scarred, battered face of the man Magnolia loved like a father tilted toward her. Horn kicked the king's legs out into an X shape. Then he kicked his left arm out at an angle. When Magnolia realized what he was doing, she felt bile rising in her throat. The bastard was going to cut X's limbs off one by one. No, she mumbled. X? Horn staggered, then righted himself. He pointed his axe at someone behind Magnolia. Snorting and the crunch of heavy footsteps told her what was happening now. The bone beast lumbered by led by the man with the electrical rod. Even Moretto stepped back, giving it a wide berth. The skinwalker guard gave the beast a zap, bringing it down on its barbed knees only three paces from X. Horn walked over to the monster and stopped in front of the ruined face. It was on the same level as his own eyes, even with the creature kneeling. Blood snorted out of the burned nostrils, flecking Horn's forehead and nose. He wiped it away, and licked his hand. Ya vas a comer a un rey, he said. Magnolia recognized the words eat and king. He patted the creature on the head as if it were a dog, then turned back to X. 
Horn didn't just plan on cutting X into pieces. He planned on feeding each piece to his pet. Over two hours had passed since the drones attacked the shark's cage. The only survivors had pulled Ada and Jojo out of the water into a damaged fishing boat. Miraculously, the craft made it to the Vanguard Islands, partly thanks to Ada's bailing efforts with a metal bucket. Sitting low in the water, they crossed the barrier just before sunset. Her view of home was obscured by smoke. It appeared that Ada was indeed too late to save her people. The drones had swarmed the outer rigs, slaughtering civilians and soldiers alike. They had already moved to the interior rigs, leaving burning metal stalks in their wake. A warship had sailed to meet the drones, but a squadron of the deadly machines rained bolts down onto it from all directions. Fire licked the hull of the massive ship that Ada recognized as Elysium. The Cazador sailors put up a brave fight. Machine guns and 20 millimeter cannons blazed into the sky, and pinpricks from small arms flashed from the deck. Other vessels had also joined the battle, but many had already been turned to smoldering debris on the surface. She searched the sky for discovery, and the water for the other warships, but none were in sight. Had the airship already been destroyed? She shuddered at the thought. If discovery was gone, they were doomed. The two Cazadores also watched in horror, one manning the motor, the other slumped next to Ada, gripping his side, where a piece of shrapnel from the first attack had punched through his armor. A pair of drones raked the deck of a fishing trawler with laser bolts. It burst into flames, then exploded. The wave of flames consumed the shapes of people jumping overboard. Another pack of drones circled a rig that served as a slaughterhouse and cleaning station for livestock and fish. The bolts punched into the bulkheads and flames burst out. Next to the rig, a farm burned. Hogs squealed in panic. The machines weren't discriminating. They were systematically killing everything that moved from the outer rigs inward. We have to get to the capital tower, she said, pointing. The Cazador pilot steered toward the airship roof. She spotted the decommissioned hive on the horizon. The drones hadn't made it there yet. Maybe there was a chance to stop them. After all, some had already been blown from the sky. Jojo clutched Ada as the craft labored through the waves. So far, the drones hadn't spotted them, but she kept a close watch to make sure they weren't being followed. An explosion bloomed on a rig up ahead. The injured Cazador man beside Ada got up and held onto a gunnel. No, he yelled. Several drones circled the rig, firing bolts onto the residential levels. Shacks collapsed and tents burned. Cazador civilians leaped off the decks into the water to escape the inferno. A few Cazadores held their ground to defend their homes, firing rifles at the drones. One woman was shooting arrows. The bullets and arrows had little effect, merely knocking the drones off course before they came back in and finished the job. The woman with the bow vanished in a fireball. The Cazador soldier at the gunnel took off his helmet and knelt on the deck, weeping. He wiped the tears away and spat into the water, yelling curses in a language Ada didn't understand. She shared his sorrow. Their boat skirted a fishing trawler destroyed by the drones. It was still in the process of sinking, the stern poking out of the ocean and dropping fast. A halo of debris surrounded the vessel. Barrels, tackle, and panels bobbed in the waves. Ada pointed at someone treading water and waving. The pilot throttled down and cruised over to them. This time, Ada was the one to extend a hand into the water. Days earlier, she would never have dreamed of helping a Cazador. They all were evil cannibals who wanted her people dead. But things had changed since then. The man who plucked her from the water, instead of letting her drown, had made her rethink everything. A memory surfaced of dropping the lion's crew into the waves. She had killed them because she feared them, and because of what some of them had done to Katrina. But maybe X had been right about giving them a chance. She shook off the thoughts as the boat brought her closer to the man in the water. He flailed in the other direction. Take my hand, Ada yelled. He turned around, treading water, then kicked over to her. Their hands connected just as another explosion burst on the horizon. The drones had moved on to another rig. 
the trading post. Jojo let go of Ada's leg to cower in the stern while the wounded soldier helped her haul the fishermen aboard. Then they putted away, the motor coughing acrid black smoke. The rescued man nodded his thanks to Ada. But then, seeing the monkey, he reared back slightly. Jojo, equally afraid, cowered behind Ada on the metal bench. It's okay, she said. But it wasn't okay. The trading post was being torn apart, and one of their farms had already been destroyed. Elysium sailed over to help, still taking enemy fire. The bolts stitched down the warship's hull. They were close enough now that Ada could see soldiers on the deck. They weren't all Cazadores. Militia soldiers in black armor stood among the warriors. They fought side by side, firing everything they had into the sky. What had happened since she left? Maybe X had secured the peace he promised after all. Remorse continued to eat at her. She looked back to the Capitol Tower. Cannons boomed from the rooftop, and in the waning sunlight came muzzle flashes from machine gun nests. Of the hundred drones that had attacked, over half were still in the air, enough to inflict major damage on the rigs, and from what she could see, the defector's aircraft carrier wasn't even here yet. In the waning light, muzzle flashes glowed like fireflies across the top deck of the hive as soldiers and civilians defended their home. She noticed a gaping hole under the balcony platforms built out from the airship. But this one wasn't smoking, and it had scaffolding around it. Was this from an earlier attack? Tracer rounds chased a pack of drones that rocketed toward the hive. One of the machines burst apart, scattering hot metal over the water. It was a victory, but short-lived. The swarm came together into a tight V formation, six strong. Bolts punched into the hive, blowing another hole in the side. The Cazador pilot steered them in a wide arc around the flotsam of sunken boats. Fires burned on three levels of the rig but the drones had stopped their assault to concentrate their fire on Elysium. Anti-aircraft weapons on the warship pounded the sky, and two drones exploded. The other ten fanned out, then came back together into a chevron formation. Bolts pierced the bow and slammed into the command tower. Soldiers on deck ran for cover as the squadron wheeled around for another run. Ada looked around for the other warships. Where were they? And where was X? The legendary Helldiver would be out here, not hiding in the Capitol Tower. She wondered again at the damage to the hive. Something had happened when she was gone. Darkness carpeted the ocean as the last drip of sun was swallowed by the outer edges of the Vanguard Islands. Flames from burning rigs reflected off the attacking drones. It was easy to picture how they could have destroyed Discovery in a single pass if it were here. She prayed that Les had flown it somewhere safe but that wasn't in the captain and Helldiver's nature. Like X, he would be here in the thick of it, fighting to save their home. She looked on as the soldiers on Elysium put up a last-ditch fight. The machine guns, cannons, and anti-aircraft artillery blazed away as a new pack of drones left an adjacent rig to join the fight. Together, the two aerial formations came in from starboard and port. Lasers pounded both sides at the same time. A third formation had approached low over the water to avoid the ship's defenses. They surged up into the sky, then made a strafing run over the deck. Soldiers dived overboard to avoid the brilliant wave of fire that erased the command tower. The formations broke back into individual flight, and dozens of thrusters jetted purple flame as they moved on to new targets. Then all at once, they took to the sky, vanishing into the clouds. Jojo clutched Ada's leg as she looked out on the devastation. The injured Cazador and the fishermen wept beside her. Plumes of smoke trailed away from the rigs, and a thick layer drifted over the water. Ada coughed as they motored through it. Water sloshed nearly ankle-deep in the boat, but they were almost to the capital tower, close enough that they weren't going to sink. The boat emerged from the pall of smoke, and the airship rooftop came into view under the glow of a rising almost full moon. Not a single Cazador or militia soldier stood on the docks of the Capitol Tower. Boats rocked in the water, still moored where they had been left. She jumped out when they pulled up, wincing as she landed on her injured foot. After getting Jojo onto the dock, she helped the injured Cazador soldier. 
The fisherman who had piloted them here tied up the boat, then grabbed a rifle. Ada wanted to scream for X, but she walked in silence. Her gut told her the king wasn't here, and neither were the helldivers. Helping the injured Cazador with one arm and holding Jojo in the other, she slogged toward the elevator cage. The fisherman went first, with his rifle shouldered. Looking skyward every few seconds, he slung his rifle and opened the elevator cage. Ada and the wounded soldier piled in, but Jojo balked. It's okay, Ada said, stroking its bristly hair. The monkey trembled against her, letting out a whimper as the cage jolted and jerked upward. The apocalyptic view took Ada's breath away. She had been right about returning home to a war, just not the war she had expected. As the cage rose higher, the fisherman pointed at the eastern horizon. A large vessel had broken through the outer barriers and stood bathed in moonlight. She recognized the elongated warship. The aircraft carrier had arrived with its defector cargo to finish the job. 40. X was tied to steel pipes that the skinwalkers had pounded into the ground. The irony wasn't lost on him as they splayed his body out and tied him up in the shape of his nickname. He raised his head, his vision swarming with fireflies. Twin suns resolved themselves into torches that a pair of skinwalkers held. It wasn't just a bone beast they were going to feed him to. Horn and his men planned to feast on the king's flesh. The former prince of the Metal Islands sat on a throne of dead bodies that the skinwalkers had piled up over the past hour. Orange gauze plugged the hole in his armor where X had plunged Rhino's spear. It had taken three skinwalkers to hold Horn down while a medic pulled the spear from below his collarbone. He had nearly strangled the medic before passing out. That had delayed the execution for a short time. Now he was awake again, and he seemed to like Moretto's plan to barbecue X a piece at a time, forcing him to look on as he was being consumed. Horn sat there watching X and grinning while the fighting continued on Shadow and Raven's Claw. The skinwalker leader didn't seem worried about the battle. He wasn't even watching. X was, though not by choice. Hanging from the poles, he had a decent view of the ocean and the smoke drifting away from Shadow. The skinwalker's last submarine had pounded it with rockets a few minutes earlier, then vanished under the surface. It would all be over soon, and Dex could do nothing to stop it. He turned his head toward the surviving barracudas. There were only two, one of them Willis, the English speaker. Both were tied up next to Magnolia and Victor. She lay in the dirt, hardly moving. Victor hadn't moved for several minutes. He had taken two bullets and X feared he had died of his injuries. Seeing his loyal guard gunned down like a beast when he had tried to help X was the breaking point. X looped his fingers through the rope tying him to the pole and tried to move a foot, but they were too tight to budge. Both guards with torches walked closer. One thrust the torch toward his face. The intense heat warmed his flesh. He turned his head to the side for some relief, this time in the other direction. The bone beast, still on its knees, chewed on the arm of a barracuda soldier while awaiting the main course. X. He drew in a rattling breath. For most of his adult life, his body had been pushed from one extreme to another. He had always defied the odds, survived when others died, and fought his way through what seemed impossible situations. A high pain tolerance and sheer stubbornness had helped. But it was over for him and he knew it. He had failed his people. Worst of all, he had doomed them by spreading them too thin. A good general would have dealt with one threat at a time. But all the good generals were dead or about to be. X looked at the bloody spearheads that had belonged to Rhino. He had come so close to killing Horn with them. Magnolia squirmed in her restraints. Good. She still had fight left in her, and Victor moved again. Another small cause for relief. The two warriors had journeyed far to fight with X, but they hadn't been able to stop the evil. 
a bright light flickered on the horizon. X tried to make it out. It wasn't coming from Shadow or Raven's Claw. General Forge had destroyed the final submarine, leaving just the two warships. X held back a grin. Maybe there was a chance. Another explosion blossomed in the distance. The skinwalkers on patrol all stopped to look. A man standing on a silo called out in Spanish, and the men all cheered. It was over. Shadow was destroyed. X felt the deepest dread of his life. He forced himself to watch the warship sink and vanish. Again, he tried to move his body, but he was having a hard time breathing now, wheezing every few breaths. Horn walked over with an axe in hand. Es hora de morir immortal. X didn't know what he had said, but this had to be the end. He lifted his chin as high as he could. I may have lost the fight in this life, X said. He coughed. But I'll kill you a thousand times in hell. Horn twirled his axe and moved over to X, looking at one leg, then the other. It appeared that he would start on the right. He waved one of the torchbearers over. X didn't fear the pain. He didn't particularly fear death either, but he feared what would happen to everyone out there. Michael, Layla, Bray, Miles, Les, Roger. The list went on and on. Moretto joined her son, arms folded across her chest. They exchanged a few words in Spanish, something about a perro. X knew the word for dog. Had they found Miles? Letting out a scream, he pulled with his left hand on the rope while kicking with his feet as hard as he could. Horn watched for a moment, then laughed. Moretto joined in with the other soldiers until everyone was laughing uproariously. You sick bastards, Magnolia shouted. I'll kill all of you. All of you. Horn glared at her and licked his lips again, then turned back to X as Moretto walked over and kicked Magnolia in the gut. X felt his sinewy muscles bulge as he fought to get free. His face burned with rage. Horn tilted his head, but not at X. A whooshing sounded. Something hit the dirt behind X, then something else. The guard in front of X slumped over onto his torch, two arrows sticking out of his back. Another guard grasped at an arrow through his face mask. Muzzle flashes came from the scrapyard, and several more skinwalkers fell. Horn grabbed the second torchbearer, using him as a human shield. Bullets riddled the man's armor and the dirt behind him. Horn tossed the limp body aside, and the torch landed right in front of X. The flames licked up between his boots. Horn brought up his axe to finish X, but a bullet hit the blade, and another punched into his arm. He hunched down and bolted away from the gunfire, no longer the gloating victor. Shouting broke the momentary lull. For X! The voice sounded familiar, but he couldn't place it. Barking rose above the war cries. That voice he could place. Miles came running from the scrapyard, flanked by a dozen soldiers in militia and Casador armor. Tun ran in front, his assault rifle blazing. The skinwalker guarding Magnolia and Victor took several rounds. Moretto hit the dirt and scrambled for cover, while the other skinwalkers knelt to fire. X could feel the heat of the torch, but he couldn't take his eyes from the battle. Magnolia pushed herself to her feet and looked over at him. Blood dripped from the corner of her mouth. She staggered a few steps, righted herself, and kicked Moretto in the face as she tried to crawl away. How you like it, you withered old witch, Magnolia shouted. X couldn't do anything but watch the chaos unfold around him. Ton, ten militia soldiers, and four barracudas laid into the dozen skinwalkers still standing. Horn returned to the battle to fight with his men. He brought an axe down on a militiaman's shoulder, splitting his upper chest in half. Then he yanked it free and threw it into the back of another soldier. Magnolia kicked Moretto once more and then grabbed an assault rifle from the ground. She lined up the sights on Horn's head. Die, motherfucker, she yelled. She pulled the trigger, but the gun didn't fire. Spear, 
X yelled at her. Tossing away the gun, she ran over to the spear still sticking out of the ground. The bone beast roared as a burst of rounds hit its handler. Free now, it grabbed the nearest person, another skinwalker. It twisted off his helmet, head and all. X, Brett yelled. The militia soldier that X had told to look after Miles was waving. Shoot that thing in the eye sockets, X yelled. Brett aimed at the monster's head and fired a burst that broke away a shard of bone. The creature roared, muscles flexing under its bony armor. Then it lurched forward, blind and pawing at the air. The beast slammed into the armored back of a skinwalker swinging a cutlass at Tun. He skidded across the ground, and the creature sniffed to find him before he could crawl away. Claws ripped through his back armor. Tun pulled a blaster and walked toward the feasting monster. He held the weapon up toward the bone beast's mouth as it turned toward him. The buckshot blew through the mouth and out the back of the skull, cutting short the beast's final roar. The boom of the weapon was one of the most beautiful sounds X had ever heard. Tun ran over to Victor while Magnolia stumbled over to X with the spear she had plucked from the ground. She cut his restraints and he slumped to the earth, arm and legs numb. Finish this, she said, placing the half-spear in his hand. Summoning the little strength he had, X got to his feet. Miles ran over, nudging against him. The fighting was mostly over. Five militia soldiers and three Cazadores had Horn and his remaining two men surrounded. Yelling in Spanish, the bastard prince swung his axe through the air at the encroaching circle of enemies. Moretto was sitting, hands clasped behind her head. Dozens of bodies littered the dirt. Magnolia picked up another assault rifle, then suddenly stopped, staring into the boatyard. X saw two more figures emerge. One hobbled on crutches made of broken oars, and the other wore a robe. Imola! Roger! Magnolia yelled. She ran over to them while X limped over to Horn and his mother. Brett and another militia soldier backed away to let the king through. Horn swung the axe once more, cutting only air. He went down on one knee, bleeding through the gauze that plugged his armor. His two men lowered their weapons and put their hands behind their heads. Everyone back, X grumbled. He walked up to Horn, who had to know he was defeated. But as soon as X got close, Horn swiped with his axe again. X stepped back, easily avoiding the blow. Horn fell to his stomach, and Magnolia used a knife to pin one hand to the ground. X used the spear to pin his other hand. An animal howl of pain followed. He centered his obsidian eyes on X, then Magnolia. X didn't finish him off. He had a promise to keep. Turning, he gestured to Roger and Imula. Magnolia grabbed Moretto, dragged her over, and dumped her next to her son. Roger joined Magnolia, looking down at the two skinwalkers. You okay? she asked. I will be soon, Roger replied. You? Same. Someone hand me a blaster, X said. Brett said something to Tun, who handed his over. X flipped open the breech and found a buckshot shell and a flare loaded. He flipped it shut and handed the weapon to Roger. Not until I tell you, Raj, X said. Magnolia helped steady Roger, as with a shaky hand he pointed the blaster at Moretto. X coughed deep. Imola, he said. I want you to interpret for me. Imola scurried over. As king of the Vanguard Islands, I sentence... Horn interrupted, talking fast. He followed up by spitting on X's boots. X calmly looked to Imula. He said that you are not worthy of the crown, and that's why all your people will die by the metal gods. Moretto mumbled something next. She said you may have defeated them here, but the sky people and the traitorous Casadores will all die soon. Imula paused. What? X asked. She said the islands are burning. What does that mean? X asked. He had a feeling that it meant what it sounded like, that the defectors had reached their home, and Dex was helpless to stop it now. With Shadow and Renegade sunk, they had no way to make it home. 
Moretto spoke again but was silenced by a crack that made X flinch. The flare from Roger's blaster burst against the side of Moretto's head, setting her hair on fire. Horn let out a scream of agony as his mother wailed. He yanked up on the blades, pinning his hands down. X pulled the spear, freeing one hand. Swiveling his head, Horn focused a soulless gaze of rage at X. His mouth opened to let out a scream, but X cut it short with a stroke of the blade across his throat. Horn reached up to stanch the blood as pink bubbles burst from his lips. Moretto, still burning, writhed in agony. Aiming the blaster, Roger pulled the trigger. A dozen double-aught pellets hit her in the chest, silencing her. Roger dropped the weapon to the ground and leaned on Magnolia, sobbing. X watched as Horn kicked at the ground, still fighting for life. He bent down over him with the spear still in his grip. For Rhino, he said, and staked Horn through his icy heart. Leaving the blade in his chest, X walked away, only to flinch as a voice shouted in the distance. Boats on the beach! X turned away from Horn and Moretto. Who? he shouted. I don't know the malicious scout yelled back. But Raven's Claw is still out there. Get ready, X said. This ain't over. The soldiers trained their weapons on the boatyard. Tons stuck by Victor, their backs against a brick wall. Both men held pistols. Brett handed X a blaster. Thanks for coming back for me, X said. He took the weapon and stood next to the malicious soldier with Miles by his side. It's okay, boy, he said. Stay close. The dog's tail whipped inside its hazard suit. Flashlight beams hit the scrapyard. X scanned the shadows for the enemy forces coming to avenge their leader. The wait wasn't long. Faint silhouettes moved in the scrapyard. Someone launched a flare. Hold your fire, Magnolia yelled. In the flare's glow, a group of Cazador soldiers strode out. One wore a burned and frayed orange cape. General Forge led a group of twenty men, some holding spears, others down to knives. All the blades were bloody. They ran up, then slowed to take in the battlefield. Magnolia breathed a sigh of relief and turned to X, smiling. But she knew this wasn't over, and so did X. We have to get back to the Vanguard Islands, X said. The killing won't stop until all the machines are destroyed. 41. We found survivors. Michael's radio message was garbled and staticky. Les heard most of it. He also heard the panicked screams in the background. It lasted only a few seconds, but those seconds changed everything. Fear took his fatigued body hostage as he tried to think what to do. Breaking radio silence could give away his and Sophia's position behind some metal platforms in a supply yard. Since landing on the roof of a low warehouse, they had climbed down, but were forced to hide in the maze of construction equipment. At either end of the supply yard, a defector stood inside a small metal kiosk that had shielded them from view earlier. Their visors were dark. Normally, they glowed. Something was different about their arms, too. Instead of hands, they had sharp blades. Defectors are surrounding. Can't escape, Michael said over the comms. Must get to the tower. Les tried to make sense of the second part, resisting the urge to ask. But he couldn't just crouch here and listen. He had to do something. He hand-signaled his plan to Sophia. She would neutralize the defector at the north entrance of the supply yard, and he would take out the one to the east. They parted, heading opposite directions. He crept between the rows, laser rifle forward, until he got about ten feet from the machine. A pulsing light glowed around the final row of stacked metal platforms. Les readied his rifle and moved around the other side to fire a bolt into the machine, which must have heard him coming. It had left the kiosk. Hearing a clank behind him, he ducked just as the robot jabbed a blade down at him from atop a stack of metal platforms. The sharp point of the second blade glowed red hot as it grew like an extendable baton. Les tried to fire his laser rifle, but the machine jumped down behind him. He dived to avoid the blade, but it punched into his booster. Helium hissed out of the canister. He rolled to his back and fired a bolt, 
but the defector lay slumped to the side, the skull sizzling with an orange hole through the temple. Sophia lowered her laser rifle and reached down to Les. Thanks, he said. I owe you one. She followed him out of the supply yard, passing the other defector, which she had fried with a bolt to the battery unit. Les slowed as he walked through a gate that opened to a street. It was the main artery through the base, but there wasn't much concealment here besides a few trees and clumps of weeds growing in the alleys between buildings. The patrols he had seen earlier were gone. It wasn't hard to guess where to. He tried to get a view of the warehouse where Michael and Arlo had landed. Just as he rounded the corner of a building for a look, the comms hissed again. Factories, mainframe, you have to get to, they have. Les retreated behind a fence of weeds growing outside the supply yard. He and Sophia looked out at the egg-colored silos rising over the next block. Their smoke plumes had ceased. The factories house the mainframe, he whispered. I don't know, she said. Les slipped deeper into the weeds, using them to get to the side of a building. Stopping at the corner, he sneaked a look down the street to the western edge of the base. At the far end of the complex, drones hovered over the multi-level warehouses. Those had to be where Michael and Arlo had discovered the human prisoners. What do we do? Sophia asked. At the creak of robotic joints, he motioned her down. The ground trembled. It wasn't just drones that Michael and Arlo had drawn to their location. Two tanks with segmented legs came from the direction of the factories. Les and Sophia froze as they charged past the weeds. After they passed, he raised his head to check them out. The weapons turret was built on a central core unit. An orange glow came from small windows in the side that must house the battery unit powering the tank. Over the crunching of the massive feet came another mechanical noise. Les went down again as four defector units strode after the tanks. Sophia kept her helmet tilted toward him. He couldn't see her eyes, but they had to be as wide as his. He moved his finger to the trigger of his laser rifle, ready to open fire. But they kept marching, the orange glow of their visors receding through the weeds. Les watched them head for the warehouse, where another patrol joined them. Then, another more and more surviving defectors showed up at the warehouse. Some were damaged and missing limbs. Others had soot-darkened exoskeletons. But at least thirty of those surrounding the building looked shiny and new, as if they had come fresh off the assembly line. Those units had the same blades that had almost skewered him in the supply yard. Michael and Arlo were not getting out of the warehouse alive unless their captain did something. But what could he do? If he and Sophia tried to help and there was no guarantee that they could. Then they threatened the entire mission. There was one possible way to save them, though it would risk their ride home. Les took a long, slow breath of filtered air. He had prepared for this to be a one-way trip. The thought of never seeing Phil and Catherine again hurt his heart worse than a hot knife. But they were the main reason he was here. He would never again let the machines hurt anyone he loved, even though it meant making a difficult decision. He turned to the smokestacks again. Could the factories really be housing the mainframe? If so, where did the road into the mountain go? Les looked back to the warehouse. What was the right call? Leave Michael and Arlo and try to complete the mission, or try to save them? The firepower surrounding the warehouse helped him decide. There was literally nothing he and Sophia could do to help. He could only hope the machines took them captive instead of killing them outright. That would give him a chance to shut the mainframe down and save them. Good luck, Tin. With a heavy heart, Les motioned for Sophia to follow him while they had the chance. Maybe there was a way into the mountain from the factories, a hidden tunnel or passage that Michael had discovered. Or maybe the mainframe really was inside. The abandoned streets between the buildings on the next block allowed Les to run, and despite her injuries, Sophia managed to keep up. They kept close to buildings and used whatever cover they could find, pressing on until they got to the road between them and the factories. 
less noticed tracks from humans and machines leading toward closed industrial roll-up doors built into the base of each tower. He checked the left and right side of the road, then nodded at Sophia. Taking point, he led the way to a side door. He didn't see a handle, keypad, or anything else to provide a way in. The hum of the drones would hopefully mask the sound of a laser bolt. He raised his weapon at the door and fired. Four shots later, it clicked open. He walked inside with his NVGs on. When his eyes adjusted to the green hue, rows of assembly lines across the long space came into focus. Robotic arms had frozen in place. Cranes with grappling hooks hung from tracks on the ceiling, still holding onto parts for DEF-9 units. An entire conveyor belt of metal skulls had stopped. Nothing was operating, not even emergency lights. Les hurried past the assembly lines, ignoring the limbs and torsos of the killer machines. The plant was empty, giving him free reign to look for an elevator entrance, a door, anything that might tell him where the mainframe was. Moving past boilers, compressor units, and other industrial equipment, he quickly cleared the first section of the main floor. Behind it was a wall. No door or elevator. Nothing. Les met Sophia at the other back corner of the lab where there was a door. He blasted it open and entered a passage with glass walls on either side. He bumped off his night vision and turned on his helmet lamp for a better look inside. The beam speared into the dark space on the left, illuminating cages and red eyes. Les reared back at the sight. Dear God, Sophia whispered. She joined him behind the glass, her lights raking over cage after cage containing human heads mounted on turrets like the tanks with multiple thin spider-like legs. Dozens of human eyes blinked at their beams sweeping over the cages. These people were still alive. Sophia turned away, gagging inside her helmet. Les stared in horror as mouths opened, trying to communicate. He shined his light down the rows of cages and then on tables with full-length defector bodies minus the heads. It didn't take long to figure out what was happening here. Come on, he said. Leave them like this, Sophia stuttered. This is torture. We'll burn this place to the ground after we shut down the mainframe. She hesitated, then followed Les back to the factory floor. Halfway across, they heard distant shouts, then screams, and finally, clicking joints of the machines. Les and Sophia dropped as three defectors strode into the room. Their visors emitted red holographic walls that swept over the space, beeping. He remained hunched behind a boiler, with Sophia beside him. The beeping stopped, not because the machines were leaving. Clicking metal feet echoed across the factory floor. Les motioned for Sophia to flank the machines. She crept around the other side of the boiler. He nodded, and they darted around the sides and opened fire. The first bolt from his weapon blew through a defector, knocking it to the floor in a fountain of sparks. Sophia dropped a second machine in almost the same instant, sending another shower of sparks through the air. Les turned his gun on the third as it aimed at Sophia. A bolt into the visor dropped the machine in a sizzling heap near the one Sophia had destroyed. Les looked over at her and gave a sigh of relief as she raised a hand to touch the rivet atop her helmet where the last defector shot missed its mark. If Les hadn't shot the thing at that exact moment. A vision of Trey swam before his eyes. If the machine had shot a moment earlier, aimed a couple of inches lower, Sophia's face would be nothing but a glowing hole. His son had died the same way. Les hurried over to Sophia and embraced her hard. After a moment, she wrapped her arms around him as well. Without a word, they broke apart, and Les picked up an extra laser rifle from one of the machines. It was time to finish this now and save the others. To save the entire human race. Carrying both weapons, he walked to the downed machines and put a bolt through each metal skull. Then he trained the rifles on the open doorway. The shouting intensified as they made their way outside and down the road. From there, Les had a perfect view of the warehouse at the west end of the compound. Drones continued to circle like vultures waiting for a meal. The tanks stood outside, weapons angled down at a horde of people. 
A hundred or more people filed out of the building and stood in the dirt. Les started toward them, motioning for Sophia to stay close and hugging the buildings along the way to keep out of sight. What he saw seized his breath. People young and old, of all races. Les had never seen such a diverse group. Defectors herded the growing crowd away from the warehouse. Two of the machines dragged armored bodies out of the crowd. No, Les whispered. We have to do something, Sophia said. They stopped behind a cluster of trees growing outside the metal tower with a spiked roof. Hidden by the trees, he watched in the darkness, his mind racing as fast as his heart. He had no idea what was happening in Aruba or the Vanguard Islands, and his team was either dead or captured. It was on him to complete the mission by finding the damn mainframe. If he did that, he still might save everyone here and at home. The machines herded the prisoners toward the gate. People sobbed, and a group of children wailed as they were separated from the adults. Les spotted a young girl who could have been his own daughter. Another reminder of what was at stake. He zoomed his rifle scope in on Michael. There was a reason the transmissions had stopped. Michael was limp, like Arlo, either unconscious or dead. Les lowered his rifle, his heart breaking. He searched the sky for discovery. Timothy was up there, awaiting his orders. There was no other choice now. It was time to risk the airship and his position. Les bumped on the comms. Timothy, this is Captain Mitchells, do you copy? The response was almost instant. Copy you, sir. You got anything up there left to fire? We are down to 10% of our ammunition, sir. I want you to use most of that on those cannons outside the base, Les said. Once they're destroyed, fly low and fast and take out the drones, then the tanks. We'll deal with the individual machines. Aye, aye, sir. Drop off all civilians before you come in. Food and supplies, too, just in case. Already done, sir. Only one person is on the ship with me. Another voice came in over the comms. Captain, this is Samson. I'm staying with Timothy. He's gonna need a co-pilot. Les wasn't surprised. He was one of only a few people besides X who knew the truth about Samson's cough. His fate would be the same as Captain Maria Ashes. Throat cancer. But it had spread to his lungs. Not even the ITC cancer medicine could save Samson now. We got your back, boss, he rasped. You're sure about this? Les asked. Hey, I always wanted to be a hell diver but was a bit heavy for the old launch tubes. I guess this is as close as I'll get. Good luck, Captain. You too, Les replied. And Timothy. Yes, sir. Give these AI assholes hell, my friend. You may count on that, Captain. The channel closed, and Les opened a private one with Edgar and Lena. It's on us now, he said. When Discovery comes in, start shooting the DEF-9 units to give the prisoners a chance to run. I'll try to find the mainframe and end this. Roger that, Cap, Edgar said. Stay safe. You too. With the division of prisoners complete, the gates were opening. Two machines dragged Michael and Arlo by their feet, while six others with laser rifles marched most of the men outside. The rest of the machines guarded the other prisoners. The women and children were sobbing and screaming for fathers and brothers. It was clear what was about to happen. Bless turned to Sophia, handing her one of the laser rifles. Stay here undercover and take out as many of those bastards as you can. What about you? I have to shut down that mainframe. As the prisoners were corralled toward the gates, Michael suddenly broke free from the two machines dragging him. He got up and swung with his robotic hand, shattering a defector's visor. The other raised its laser rifle. Les and Sophia both aimed their rifles, but before they could fire, the defector staggered sideways, sparks flying off its head. A gunshot rang out in the distance. Edgar had taken the perfect shot. Good luck, Les said. You too, Sophia replied. Two drones rocketed away from the warehouse as Les set off on his own. Lena opened fire with her laser rifle, and Edgar fired another high-velocity round hitting a defector in the chest. 
Les heard the electronic chatter of the laser rifle behind him as Sophia laid into the six defectors herding the men through the open gate. Screaming and wailing rang out from the crowd as the chaos spread. A voice surged over the comm channel. The mainframe is in the main tower, Michael said. Les glanced up at the black tower he had just left. The spike at the top flashed orders to other drones rising into the sky. A squadron of the bots blasted away through the darkness to find discovery. Timothy was ready. Explosions burst across the dark clouds over the mountain. Waves of tracer rounds from the airship's 20-millimeter guns raked back and forth. Orange bursts illuminated the snow-capped crest of Kilimanjaro. The drones that had taken to the sky rained down as bits of shrapnel. A moment later, Discovery exploded out of the cloud cover. Its reinforced bow slammed into a drone, splattering it like a bug on a windscreen. Rockets streaked away from the tubes, slamming into the cannons below. Explosions billowed up into the sky from each impact, some making huge, loud fireballs as the artillery shells also detonated. Les turned back to Michael, who had helped Arlo to his feet. Civilians were still scattering, but the defectors were gunning them down. One of the tanks released a flurry of rounds into several men who had picked up laser rifles. They vanished in bursts of pink mist and gore. Raising his rifle, Les aimed at the central unit and fired a stream of bolts into its core. Several bolts broke through the armor casing. The tank went haywire, jerking back and forth, legs stomping the ground, then crashed in a cloud of dust. Michael and Arlo looked in his direction. Get everyone out of here, Les yelled. Outside the walls! Michael stared for a stolen moment, then took off as Discovery raked the defector ranks with 20-millimeter rounds. Les took off for the tower as more drones ascended from an open roof to the east to fire bolts at Discovery. Several stitched across the hull. Timothy kept the airship steady and turned the bottom-mounted 20-millimeter cannons on another group of defectors, turning them into scrap metal. Another group of brave prisoners stormed the destroyed units and picked up their dropped laser rifles. The second tank swiveled its turret toward Discovery as the airship blasted back into the sky. The tank fired a volley of bolts, several blowing into the stern and knocking out a bank of the thrusters. The group of prisoners turned their newfound weapons on the tank. Les kept running, watching as a swarm of drones climbed into the clouds after the purple exhaust trail from the thrusters. Several of the machines peeled away a moment later, changing direction. An explosion boomed in the distant cliffs. Les paused, realizing that it was Edgar and Lena's location. The gunfire from Edgar's sniper rifle ceased, and so did Lena's laser bolts. No, God, no, Les mumbled. It was just him, Sophia, and Michael now, with Arlo too injured to fight. Concussions rang out in the clouds as the drones caught up to the airship. Les was almost to the tower. Bright flashes lit the skyline above the mountain as the drones and Discovery fired. He took cover in the trees surrounding the tower, the canopy blocking his view of the battle. Walking around the base of the structure, he searched for a door while the heavens rumbled and the shouts and screams of prisoners filled the night. Les found the tower's entrance on the north side. He approached with his laser rifle. Like the factory door, it had no handle or keypad. He fired multiple bolts until it clicked open, revealing a room of computers, all of them flashing and beeping. Their noise blocked out the sounds of the battle raging outside. Les had just stepped inside when a deep, burning sensation ripped his gut. He tried to move, but his legs wouldn't respond. Then he saw the red-hot blade sticking out of the armor below his battery unit. The blade retracted, and Les fell on his side. A defector strode toward him out of the trees. One of the blades attached to its arms glowed red. He had never even heard the machine following him. The second blade began to glow. Les brought up the laser rifle hidden under his body and pulled the trigger before it could stab him again. The bolts erased the visor and a chunk of metal skull. The machine clattered to the floor beside him, giving him a view inside the skull. A small microchip suspended from wires in some sort of thick fluid. With one hand pressed against his gut, Les stumbled into the room. He set his rifle down and reached into his vest pocket for the USB stick. Bolts streaked down the road outside, and the aerial battle continued, rattling the tower walls. Les resisted the urge to look down at his wound. 
He knew that it was something he probably wouldn't survive, and checking it wasn't going to help. Keeping his hand over the wound, he scooted all the way to a wall of computers. Lights blinked up and down the bulkheads, right up to the ceiling, ten stories above. Each time they flashed, he had a feeling they were sending out the same signal to machines across the planet. He pushed himself up, cried out in pain, and nearly fell back down. Captain, a voice hissed in his earpiece. Les blinked, trying to steady himself. Captain, we're almost out of ammo and have sustained severe damage, Timothy said. I'm not sure how much longer I can keep us in the air. I just need a few. Les slumped against the computers, his vision going dark. It came back a moment later, but his body felt weightless, as in the first seconds of a dive. He pulled off the end of the thumb drive and searched for a place to upload it. I'm almost there, he said. Just... More explosions rang outside, from ground or air he couldn't say. They sounded faint, or maybe that was just his hearing. His body was failing. Les inserted the drive into a slot in a computer and then connected his wrist computer, using cables from another pocket in his vest. He tapped the screen, starting the upload. At first, nothing happened. The percentage showed zero on his wrist computer. He slumped down the wall of computers with a view of the open door. The fighting was distant now, and he heard only one voice crackling in his helmet. Everyone's outside the base, Michael said. I'm coming back in. No, Les choked. He saw the upload starting on his computer. It jumped to 10%, then 15 That gave him a shot of confidence. Get as far away from the base as you can, just in case this doesn't work, Les said. But sir, Les spoke as firmly as he could. That's an order, Commander. No way, I'm coming back. Michael, if you do, you will never see Layla again or hold your son. Les said. Now go. I'm finishing this myself. But Captain, take care of Phil and Catherine. A pause. Sir, you can take care of them when we get out of here. I'm sorry, Michael, but it's over for me. Les groaned in pain. I'm hurt bad in not leaving this place. I'm counting on you. I love you like a son. And that's why I can't lose you like I lost Trey. Les shut off the channel before Michael could reply. He straightened his body against the wall. Timothy, he said into his headset. Do you copy, Timothy? Copy, sir. Beyond the trees, the street was still. No machines in sight, nor any human prisoners. Tall weeds swayed gently in the breeze. It was almost peaceful. He looked at his monitor. 95%. A moment later, the virus was uploaded, and the inside of the tower glowed again, sending out the signal worldwide. But it wasn't over yet. Timothy, you have to destroy the main tower, Les said. I'm out of rockets, sir, Timothy replied. Les closed his eyes. Another voice came online. Les disconnected his wrist computer and squirmed all the way to the door where he had a view of the skyline above the canopy. We'll use the airship, Samson said. Slam it right into the side. Les wanted to say no, but he knew that the airship was done for. This would ensure that the mainframe could never be brought back online. It's been an honor serving with you, Captain, Timothy replied. The honor has been mine, Timothy. Thank you for everything you've done for us. And you as well, Samson. You're a good man, Les, Samson said. Leave this to us now. Hit the tower at the lowest point possible, Les choked. Les didn't mention that he was right underneath it. He was already dead anyway. Roger that, Samson said. I always wanted to say this. We dive... So humanity survives. With what strength he had left, Les crawled out into the dirt past the weeds. He managed to sit up against a tree trunk, a perfect view of the skyline. 
a glowing outline moved through the clouds above the walls. Discovery shot through the barrier a moment later. Fire spewed from the hull as the airship hurtled toward the tower. An armored panel cartwheeled away to expose a translucent figure standing at the helm. Well done, Timothy, Les croaked. It's been a hell of a ride. He closed his eyes, ready to join his son. The mission to avenge Trey and save his family was complete at last. 42. Raven's Claw carved through the sea on a course for the Vanguard Islands. A day had passed since they left Arguba, but to Magnolia it felt like a lifetime. She stood in the command tower looking out over the deck below. Most of the fighting had taken place here after General Forge boarded with a team of his fiercest warriors. They barely won the hand-to-hand -hand battle against the skinwalkers, leaving a deck slick with blood. No one had walked away from the fight without an injury, and most of the survivors were in the medical ward three decks below. General Forge, Magnolia, Imula, and X and Miles were in the command center. The king sat in a chair, stroking Miles, while the general stared out over the water, his arm in a sling. No one had said much since they left Arguba and heard a single radio message from a militia soldier. It played endlessly in Magnolia's head. The machines are almost to the capital tower. We can't hold them back. Raven's Claw had lost contact shortly thereafter, and they were sailing home at full speed. Magnolia knew that the chances of anything being left by the time they arrived weren't good. It was a two-day sail in the best conditions and it wouldn't take the machines long at all to kill everything that breathed. Try the radio again, X said. Magnolia turned the dials, but only static crackled back. It was possible the electrical storms were interfering with the comms, but it was more likely that no one was left to answer the radio. X let out a long sigh and went back to stroking Miles. We must not give up hope, Imola said. Lieutenant Wynne was ready for them, and we have the octopus lords on our side. Magnolia snorted. The general turned from the window, his chiseled jaw covered by a bandage that moved while he spoke to Imola. He was ready to fight, and so were his men, but Magnolia knew they couldn't do much with what they had left. General Forge says we crushed Horn and Moretto, and we will do the same to the metal gods, Imola said. Crushed isn't exactly. A glare from X stopped Magnolia from finishing the thought. She backed away from the three men and Miles. I'll go check on Roger, she said. X nodded, and she went to the lower decks, which smelled of body odor, mold, and a putrid scent that she couldn't and didn't want to place. The skinwalkers, cannibalistic barbarians that they were, had lived in filth. And while she was glad they had salvaged the warship, Restoring it to habitable conditions was going to take a lot of work. Magnolia ducked under a bulkhead and into a passage with standing water. She took a detour to the shit cans. They were even worse than those on the hive. The draft in here was almost unbearable. She held her nose as she relieved herself in a stall missing a door. The bulkhead-mounted mirrors across from the toilet were stained and cracked, but she could still see her reflection. Both eyes were swollen, her lower lip was cracked, and she had lost a tooth. If not for the fresh bandage on her head, she would look like a monster. Even now, she looked awful. But she was alive. She rinsed off her hands and went to the medical ward. Roger was sitting up in his bunk. Max, he said, forcing a crooked grin. She walked over, and his face returned to its perpetual frown. Are you okay? She asked. Really tired, but I'll live. How about you? Magnolia shrugged as she walked into the space crowded with injured soldiers. Tun and Victor were in adjacent beds, and beside Tun was the English-speaking Barracuda warrior Willis. Everyone was being treated for radiation poisoning, including Magnolia, who had been exposed to low doses with her helmet off. She smiled at Tun and Victor and sat by Roger's side. His feet and legs were covered with a blanket, and she was careful not to sit on them. We still haven't been able to raise the Vanguard Island since the first message, she said. 
He looked down, then back to her. I have faith in Tin, Les, Timothy, and Samson, Roger said. If anyone can stop the machines, it's them. Magnolia wished she had that same faith, but she feared that their mission had failed. Even if they had succeeded, it may well be too late for the Vanguard Islands. Something in her gnawed like a parasite feasting on her guts. She had this horrible feeling her friends were all dead, not only at Kilimanjaro, but at the islands. Darkness swarmed her mind. All she wanted to do was curl up with Roger and sleep. But if the Helldivers had failed, there was another fight ahead. Would it even be worth fighting if everyone was dead? I better get back topside and start helping with the weapons, she said. The skeleton crew needs help. Wait. Roger reached out and took her hand. We're going to be okay, he said. Then he brought her hand to his mouth and kissed it. I love you, Mags. So you can be romantic, she said. I love you too. See you in a bit. She walked over to Victor and Tun before leaving. How are you two feeling? Victor blinked at her, still sedated. He mumbled something to Tun, who gave a thumbs up. Thank you for everything you did for the king, she said. Victor pounded his chest with his fist. She continued past Willis. He swung his legs over the bed and pulled an IV line out of his arm, then stood up with a pained grunt. Screw sitting here and shitting in a bucket, he said. You need help with those guns? I'd love some. He followed her back to the upper decks, stopping to change into a suit before going outside. Magnolia changed into one too and stepped up to a porthole. Lightning flashed across the horizon, illuminating the deck. Several Cazador soldiers worked on the 20 millimeter cannons and several smaller machine guns mounted on the gunnels. Most of the rockets had been expended, but the skinwalkers had several other weapons systems. She spotted the spear guns that they used to hunt sirens. Can't use one of those on a machine. There were two Mark 45 lightweight guns, but neither worked. If they could get them up and running, they might have a fighting chance to inflict major damage, as they had back at Red Sphere. We have to get those back in service, she said, pointing to one of the cannons. Willis nodded. I'll get a team on it. She spent the next hour working with him and a handful of Cazadores, including some mechanics who had managed to escape from Shadow and Renegade. The team finished with a final count on weapons and ammo. There wasn't much, even if they could get one of the Mark 45 lightweight guns working, which the mechanics weren't sure about. All tallied up, it was hardly enough to fight more than a few machines. She thanked Willis and walked off the bloody deck. A ladder took her to a hatch that opened to another empty passage. Brooding, she walked to the command center. Halfway down the next passage, a voice stopped her. There you are, Roger said. Roch, what in the hell are you doing out of bed? She turned around to see that he wasn't alone. Tun was there with Victor, and so was Imola. The fact that they all had gotten out of their beds despite severe injuries told her something dire was happening. Come quickly, Imola said. We made contact with the Vanguard Islands. Magnolia went over to help the injured men to the command center. As they approached, the crackle of static echoed off the overhead and bulkheads. X was standing with Forge at the comms station. What's going? Magnolia started to say. X turned with a finger to his lips. She helped Roger over, and Tun limped with Victor and Imola. Destroyed. Trading post gone. The female voice kept breaking up, but she caught the gist of it. The machines had all but destroyed the Vanguard Islands. Lightning forked through the sky, creating a resounding crackle over the comms. The view was one Magnolia had seen all her life. She had always thought this view was all that existed on the surface. Storms, wastes, and memories of a world destroyed. But through it all, they had finally found a home only to have it wiped out by the machines. She dreaded the thought of returning to a destroyed paradise. Machines are, said the voice. The message finally cleared. This is X, he said. 
Who am I talking to and what the hell is happening? White noise filled the room, but it passed, and a familiar voice surged over the channel. This is Ada Winslow, sir, came the reply. The machines attacked and sank Elysium. The radio cut out again. How can that be Ada? Magnolia asked. Is this some sort of a trick? Ada, do you copy? X said. Copy, sir. It's really you? Yes, sir. I returned to help you. X paused, his graying brows coming together in confusion. We're on our way aboard Ravensclaw, he said. How long can you hold off the machines? There was no reply. The radio had cut out again. Magnolia felt her chest warm. Ada, X said. Ada, do you copy? He pounded the radio with his hand. This piece of shit, he growled. Lightning flashed outside the portholes. The warship was sailing toward another electrical storm, probably the cause of all the static. They stood there for several minutes trying to get Ada back. Rolling thunder followed another barrage of lightning. After the rattling stopped, the radio came to life. King Xavier, do you copy? Ada said. Copy, X almost shouted. Sir, I don't know what you heard last, but we held the Capitol Tower and the Hive long enough for the divers you sent to Mount Kilimanjaro to complete their mission. The virus worked, sir. The defectors were shut down. Worldwide. Roger looked over at Magnolia, his swollen eyes widening behind his glasses. This couldn't be real, could it? We won the war, Ada said. The Helldivers defeated the machines. For a moment, no one said a word except for Imola, who interpreted for Forge. Then X stomped the ground and reared his head back, letting out a howl of glee. He got down and hugged Miles, who also began to howl. Magnolia remained frozen in place, unable to fathom what she had just heard. Over 250 years after the apocalypse, the Helldivers had defeated the ancient enemy that started the war. She was aware of Roger pulling on her arm and Imola laughing with Forge in a rare display of emotion. But she couldn't quite grasp that this was real. It wasn't until X kissed her on the cheek that she snapped out of it. They did it, kid, he said. They really fucking did it. Giraffe and Tin saved our home. They saved the world, Magnolia mumbled in disbelief. Michael stood at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro, blasted by wind-blown sand. Over three weeks had passed since Les uploaded the virus that shut down the machines, and Timothy had sealed the deal by ramming Discovery into the tower. The defectors could never come back online. Michael had never felt such a conflicted wash of emotions. But why now, after saving humanity from extinction? On the way back from a supply run into the destroyed base, he stopped at the graveyard. He knelt at the rows of mounds covering the remains of his friends and the prisoners killed during the battle. Hector, Ted, and Lena were all buried here. Nothing remained of Samson or Les, but Michael had dug a grave for them anyway. Behind him stood Cade, Captain Rolo, and the surviving crew of Discovery. Evie, Pedro, and Alfred and his team along with Sophia, Edgar, and Arlo, had joined Michael on the supply mission. Captain Rolo had also brought a small team of men carrying crates from the machine base. Mostly medicine, but some weapons too. Arlo limped over and knelt beside Michael. Edgar had a limp as well, but he had lucked out when the drones hammered his sniping position. Sophia was also lucky to be alive. Lena hadn't been so lucky. Losing her had hit Edgar hard, and while he hadn't spoken much about it, Michael knew he felt guilty for not saving her. Arlo showed the same guilt over losing Ted, one of his best friends. The dry wind swept over the ground, whipping up dust off the mounds in front of the four divers. Four left. A tear rolled down his face. They had lost much, but they had completed their mission, and the fallen divers' sacrifice would never be forgotten. They had won a monumental victory, yet they might never know how X had fared in Aruba or whether the Vanguard Islands had survived. He and the other survivors were stranded here with no way home. 
a tear fell from the other eye. His home and his family were almost half a world away. Somehow he would get back there even if he had to walk and swim the whole way. Nothing would stop him from seeing his wife and their son. He got to his feet as another dust storm swept across the plains outside the walls. Cade led the crew behind the factories to a road strewn with destroyed defectors. All had gaping holes in their skulls where Cade and his people had shot them after the virus shut them down. A precaution. That day had been a celebration of freedom and the end of an enemy that had all but wiped humanity out. The fight against extinction wasn't over yet, though, and Michael had a feeling it was going to be a long road ahead, especially for these people. At first, he didn't understand why the machines had even kept them alive, but it was obvious now that they all had worked in the factories. They were slaves, labor to help build more machines. And some of them had been subjected to worse horrors, turned into machines with human brains and awareness. Michael had blown the factory sky high after the battle, ending the suffering of the tortured beings inside the macabre laboratories. Gusting grit buffeted the group as they walked toward the massive blast doors built into the mountain. Timothy and Les had supposed this was the entrance to their command center and mainframe, but it was actually an entrance to a base built here before World War III. The doors screeched apart to reveal a long concrete passage, Several old-world vehicles sat on rusted hubs. The group walked over a mile before reaching the secondary entrance. Cade used a key to open the steel door, and Michael helped him push it open. The passage narrowed considerably, allowing just enough room for Michael to walk with Cade. He respected the old Helldiver greatly for keeping his people alive all these years. Behind the final door, he saw what they had been promised in the radio intercepts from the machines. A massive vault with high ceilings sprawled out before them. The bunker had its own water supply, farm, and everything else they had on the airships, but without the risk of crashing to the wastes. It was big enough to house 2,000 people, about four times the current population. Only 510 survivors remained. Many were in such poor health, Michael wasn't sure they would make it. They needed medicine, the purpose of this scavenging mission. Cade directed the men carrying the crates to a packed medical ward. Michael slung his laser rifle and took off his helmet as he walked into the open chamber. All ten metal tables were occupied with people eating dinner. Everyone wore dark blue uniforms from the bunker with the flag of some old world government. Most of them turned, eyes flitting toward the divers. For the first few weeks of living here, the former prisoners had shied away from Michael and his team. But now they were more curious, especially the children. Alton, the boy Michael had first seen when breaking through the window of the warehouse, had become his shadow. He was behind Michael now, walking with his tattered stuffed elephant. Commander Everhart, Alton said politely. Where are you going? Michael nodded at Edgar to keep going with the others. Then he crouched in front of Alton. I have to go to an important meeting, he said. Can I come? No, I'm sorry, bud, but this is about our future. Grown-ups only. The boy's brown eyes swept the high ceilings and then the rooms across the chamber. Are we going to live down here forever? Alton asked. No, Michael said. I'm going to take you someplace where you will see something you've never seen before. The sun and the ocean. The kid's eyebrows rose. Promise? I promise. Alton smiled and ran off toward his smiling mother. Michael waved at her, feeling a sense of dread. He was a long way from the Vanguard Islands, and he had promised Layla that he would someday hold their son, just as Alton's mother held him now. Michael went through the chamber and took a stairwell two levels down. Another hallway led him to a room that had been designed as a command center. There was radio equipment, computers, everything that generals and high officials needed to monitor a war. Alfred and his team were working on several of the computers, but they hadn't been able to get any of the comms to work. Michael went to a conference room and opened the door. Edgar, Arlo, Sophia, Pedro, and Evie were already seated at an oval table with Cade, 
Captain Rolo, and several leaders from the other two airships. This was their second planning meeting, and Michael hoped it would go better than the first. Across the table sat Captain Linda Fina of the ITC Requiem. The old woman's wispy hair and wrinkled face reminded Michael of Jenga. Fina was the descendant of French ITC soldiers, and she spoke several languages. Commander Everhart, she said in a croaking voice. Please have a seat. Anderson Lynx, a bald man with dark skin and a long beard, had served as a lieutenant under Captain Rollo. The other two attendees, a man named Dmitri Vasilev and a woman named Olga Novak, were the only remaining officers of a third airship, the ITC Malenkov. The Russian ship was the third lured here with the promise of the bunker. Let's get started, Rollo said. Commander Everhard, you and your divers have the floor first. Instead of sitting, Michael moved over to a wall of maps. They all had seen them. Everyone in the room knew how far they were from the Vanguard Islands. That was why half the group had argued to stay here. After all, this was better than their former living conditions, and they had supplies to last for years. But the other half of the group, Michael included, wanted to leave. The question was, would they be allowed to leave with supplies that his opponents thought would be wasted on a doomed endeavor? I know it sounds impossible to reach the Vanguard Islands on foot, Michael said. But even if it takes years, I'm willing to take the risk out there in the wastes. Edgar chimed in. For me, seeing the sun and living somewhere on the surface, the way it used to be, was worth diving for. It was worth dying for. And many of us did die to make it here. This place isn't exactly safe, Arlo said and I for one would rather spend a few years trying to get home and see the ocean again than stay in this rabbit hole. Everyone listened while an interpreter explained what the divers were saying. When they finished making their case, Captain Fina spoke. We are grateful you and your team came here to destroy the machines, and ultimately to save us, she croaked. But traveling to the Vanguard Islands on foot is a death sentence. A poor deployment of resources, said Lieutenant Lynx. Olga Novak spoke through a translator. If we believed we could make it to the Vanguard Islands, or knew of places to find vehicles and then boats, we would try. But until then, we agree that staying here is the best course of action. Michael was beginning to lose patience with these people. I say if they want to go, we give them supplies to go, Kate said. Also, they have their own from their airship, which was destroyed, mind you, while saving us. The others hashed it out while Michael stood with Sophia, Arlo, and Edgar. A rap came on the door, and Alfred stepped inside. Commander, we're picking something up on the radar, he said. You'd better come out here. Michael joined Alfred and his technicians around a radar screen in the adjoining room. A dot pulsed on the green screen, inching closer to the mountain. What is it? Michael asked. No idea, sir, but it's definitely heading for the base. Keep me updated on the internal comms, Michael said, referring to their headsets that still worked. He motioned for Pedro, Cade, Sophia, Arlo, and Edgar to follow him. They met back in the main chamber, trying to avoid scaring any of the people still eating their meal. Several looked up as they passed. Michael couldn't help rushing across the room. This could be some machine that they hadn't been able to shut down, an aircraft come from across the globe to exterminate them, or a swarm of drones moving as one. If so, they were already dead. Thirty minutes later, the team arrived at the blast doors. A thin guard with a buzzed head snored in a chair. Don, wake up, Kate said. The man nearly shot out of his seat. What? Michael secured his helmet. Open it, he said. I'm going to check this out. Cade gave the guard the order, and the man pushed a lever. The door screeched open, and sand blew in. Michael told Pedro and Arlo to stay behind, while Sophia, Cade, and Edgar followed him into the storm. He set off down the road, and VG's on to guide him in the darkness. Alfred, do you copy? Michael said. Static hissed in his helmet. Copy, sir. You got a location on this aircraft? Currently at 2,000 feet and lowering, Alfred said. Looks like it's about a mile outside the main gates. I'm uploading the coordinates to your HUD. 
Michael held up a hand, trying to see through the swirling grit that pecked his visor. Come with me, Cade said. Michael and Edgar followed the diver deeper into the base, carefully maneuvering around the debris from Discovery and the demolished tower that had housed the machine's mainframe. Michael looked away from the rubble pile. Les had given his life to stop the machines. But now Michael had a gut feeling this was some sort of machine they didn't know about. The team stopped at a three-story building with a ladder on the backside. Cade went up first, Michael next. The top gave a better view of the skyline above the dust storm. Michael finally saw a dot emerge on the minimap in the corner of his HUD subscreen. The aircraft was half a mile away at a thousand feet. The divers crouched and raised their laser rifles, scanning the dark clouds. Whatever was out there was lowering slowly. A shape emerged in the cloud cover, then vanished. Michael moved his finger to the trigger. Lights suddenly blazed through the darkness. Michael raised his hand to hold fire. That whirr sounded familiar. Rising from his hunched position, he stared in disbelief at the beetle shape descending over the base. It couldn't be. There in the whipping grit, spinning up whirlwinds with its turbofans, hovered the airship he had spent most of his life on. The hull was patched, and fresh paint marked the bow. Vanguard. The turbofan slowed and shut off as legs extended downward and connected with the dirt. Come on, Michael yelled. He nearly slid down the ladder. When his boots hit the ground, he took off running. By the time he reached the launch bay, it had already opened. A platform lowered. A figure in a helldiver suit emerged on crutches. A more slender helldiver followed. Michael had stopped a few feet from the platform, his heart about to burst. A woman emerged in the launch bay wearing a hazard suit, one hand on her swollen belly. Tin, she called out. Miles, Tun, and Victor all emerged with her, but they parted to allow another diver out of the launch bay. This one was missing an arm. Dressed in full armor, the legendary king of the Vanguard Islands was the first to walk down the ramp and set foot on African soil. Michael stared in disbelief. After all the horror they had experienced, this seemed too good to be true. In his years as a helldiver, he rarely saw happy endings. Is it really you? Michael asked. You just gonna stand there all teary-eyed? X asked. I figured you'd be a little happier to see us in this bucket of rust. Epilogue Two months after the machines invaded the Vanguard Islands, the rigs were starting to look like home. Not the old version of home on the hive, or when the sky people first landed and lived with the Cazadores. Repairing the rigs had allowed the people to build a new home. A home inspired by the diverse survivors ferried in on the airship from Mount Kilimanjaro, as well as the survivors from Rio de Janeiro, and all the sky people and Cazadores. X stood on the rooftop of the Capitol Tower with his dog, looking out over the kingdom he was in charge of rebuilding and all the people whose lives were his responsibility. To help the transition with all the new citizens of the islands, each group had been granted its own rig, a place they could make their own. The Cazadores and the Sky People had lost significant portions of their populations in the attack from the defectors and in the battles with the Skinwalkers. With the survivors from multiple locations, the Sky People had reached their highest numbers in the past two decades. And while several of the rigs had been damaged beyond repair, there was plenty of room on the others. He trained his binoculars on the trading post rig, still under construction. Scaffolding and ladders clung to the exterior, where a small army of workers helped rebuild the place that brought all these cultures together to share traditional foods, clothing, Goods and ideas handed down from generation to generation since the Great War. A distant bell chimed, notifying the militia and Cazador soldiers that a ship had returned. His hip radio crackled with a message from Lieutenant Wynn. X pressed the transmit button. Copy, Lieutenant. General Forge has returned with Ravensclaw from their raiding mission, Wynn reported. X raised the binos again. 
Two militia warboats pulled away from the marina below and sped east, their mufflers chugging. Lieutenant Wynne piloted the one that had been El Pulpo's. He had fought valiantly against the machines, and although they lost Elysium in the battle, Wynne had survived with a handful of his best soldiers. The two warboats sped through calm waters toward a vessel at the eastern edge of the islands. X zoomed in on the whale skull figurehead jutting from the warship's prow. And Raven's Claw wasn't alone. With it were two smaller ships General Forge had discovered and repaired. They would join the fleet X had ordered rebuilt, one of his first decrees since their victories in Aruba and Tanzania. The machines and the skinwalkers were defeated, but that didn't mean there were no other threats out there. He had learned that hard lesson over his lifetime. You could never let your guard down, not in a world of wastelands and monsters. Everywhere X looked, his people were rebuilding, preparing for the future. A fort of sandbags protected three militia guards holding sentry at a machine gun nest. On an adjacent rig, Crops were being sown in the soil that some farmers had salvaged from the attack. X walked with Miles along the railing built around the airship's rooftop, taking in the view. Tun and Victor shadowed him, spears in hand, ever ready to die for him if it came to that. They stopped at a platform overlooking the western islands. In the distance, an oil tanker had dropped anchor at a new marina built around one of the rigs. The ship had returned from the Outrider with a supply the skinwalkers had barely tapped. It wasn't just oil they needed. The crops had been severely damaged in the attack by the machines. It would take a year to get back to full food production. In the meantime, they were relying on supplies brought back from Africa, and the fleet of fishing trawlers was working overtime. The boats were out there now, hauling up the day's catch. There would be enough for every mouth. X would make sure of that. He turned the binos on their true savior. The Hive, renamed the Vanguard. The airship sat on the platform Samson and Roger had built months earlier. But it was no longer secured by beams and bolts. The airship was back in service, and they were going to keep it battle ready just in case they needed it again. She's like you, an immortal, a voice called out. Magnolia smiled when X turned. Her hair had grown back, even where her scalp had been charred. It was dyed a light blue, like the water. A good contrast to the matte black helldiver armor she still wore from an early morning training with the 30 new recruits. When I die, you're all gonna feel stupid for calling me that, he said. I can see the tombstone now. Here lies the immortal. She smiled back. You can't die, X. If you try, I'll drag you back, kicking and screaming. Yeah, there's too much work for me to die, which I'm guessing is why you're here. You're right. Ravensclaw has returned, and I saw it, he interrupted. Looks like they found two new ships, which is a good start. But building a new armada will take years and many trips to the wastes. That's not the only reason I'm here. Oh? General Forge has called a council meeting in an hour, she said. He found something on his journey. Must be classified. I guess we'll find out soon, X said. Thanks. Magnolia trotted off, but he stayed on the rooftop to enjoy a few minutes of sunshine. It always helped him feel better, but today it wasn't meant to be. A cloud shadow crept across the roof, blocking out the sun for a moment. X left the rooftop with his escort of two men and a dog. The walk through the Great Hall allowed him to pay respects in passing to many they had lost. Roger had been busy carving wooden busts over the past few months to honor the fallen. He was here now, chisel in hand, standing on one foot and a peg leg. The mangled foot had been amputated at the ankle, but he still had the other and two of the toes. Roger tucked the chisel into his leather apron. What do you think? he asked. X stepped up to examine the statue of Captain Les Mitchells. The tall man stood with his hands cupped behind his back, his tuft of red hair seeming to blow in the wind. You outdid yourself, Rajman, X said. Can't dive anymore, so I've got to do something with myself when I'm not working for tin. Roger wasn't the only retired diver. 
While he and Michael still trained the new Helldiver recruits and volunteers, they were part of the reconstruction team, with Michael taking over for Samson as chief engineer. Soon, Michael would add another title to his resume. Father. X continued down the hallway. There were other statues among the paintings of Cazador generals and leaders. Katrina DeVita, Captain Maria Ash, and Samson all had been carved out of wood to replace the portraits of Carmela Moretto and El Pulpo. Roger hobbled over to X. You still haven't told me what you want yours to look like, he said. Yeah, I did. Roger tilted his head. I told you I don't want a damn statue, painting, or anything of the sort, X said. But, Rog, there are no butts, only butt heads. You don't want to be one of those, do you? Uh, no, sir. Good. Keep up the excellent work. X continued down the hallway, with Roger joining his entourage. A cazador and a militia guard opened the chamber's double doors. The Helldiver leaders were in their new uniforms, each sporting the red V logo of the Vanguard Island's crest. In the audience sat thirty new divers, most of them survivors from other airships or Rio de Janeiro. At first, X hadn't liked the idea of retiring the old teams, but he realized it would be honoring the memory of those who came before and looking toward a future under one banner, that of humanity's vanguard. The divers all stood up. Boots clicking on the floor, backs straight. Team leaders Edgar, Arlo, Magnolia, and Cade walked up to the council table. Layla was already there, only a week from her due date. She slowly rose from her chair with the officers of the airship. The new captain, Evie Corey, saluted, as did her lieutenant, Ada Winslow, who had helped lead the fight against the machines after returning from her exile. Miles trotted in front of X to sniff his new friend, Jojo the monkey. Pedro and a woman named Cecilia also had seats on the council, representing the people from Rio de Janeiro. Sofia sat on the council as a representative for the Cazadores. Joining them were the leaders of the three airships lured to Mount Kilimanjaro by the machines over the past few decades. Captain Rolo, Captain Fina, and officers Dmitry Vasilev and Olga Novak. It was only now that X understood the truth. Captain Maria Ash had received the same signal from the machines, but she had recognized the danger after Captain Rolo never returned. Everyone stood as X walked down the aisle to the throne. As he climbed the stairs, the doors opened again, admitting General Forge and two of his guards. They had come straight from the marina and now marched to the council table. Forge pounded his chest armor and then stood behind his assigned chair. He carried a metal case in hand, and his helmet under his arm. Imola joined X on the platform, along with another translator. Welcome back, General Forge, X said. I'm anxious to hear what you found out there that is important enough to call a council meeting. Forge nodded at Imola and spoke. The general says they raided an old world port in Panama where they found the new vessels, Imola said. One is an ITC ship. X narrowed his eyes. So what's in the case, he asked. After Imola interpreted, General Forge set his helmet down and placed the case on the table. He opened it, and X moved closer for a view of the contents, which appeared to be laminated papers. Forge unfolded what looked like a map. Not a map, but a blueprint. He took it up the steps and handed it to X. X wished he had brought his glasses, which he now must use when reading anything. Although he couldn't read the small print, he could make out the images. Forge spoke through Imola while X studied the blueprints. General Ford says these are blueprints of a weather modification system that ITC built before the war, Imola said. They are located at the poles and along the equator, and he believes they could be used to reverse the electrical storms. Michael, X said. The new head of engineering flipped through the blueprints, reading each one carefully. Well, X asked. I think you should ask our old friend his opinion, Michael said. He held up his wrist computer and with a nod from X, tapped the surface. A hologram in the shape of Timothy joined them on the platform. 
Hello, Commander Everhart. How may I assist you? But this wasn't the same Timothy, nor did it look completely like him. He had shaved his beard, exposing dimples X never knew the AI had. The program was indeed Timothy, but it was a backup that lacked most of his memories since leaving the hilltop bastion. General Forge brought back blueprints from what we believe are ITC weather modification facilities, Michael explained. We want your opinion. He held them up for the AI to see one page at a time. General Forge is correct, Timothy said. These facilities were named Red Sky and were designed in the year 2036, according to my database. However, I have no record of them ever being activated. If they were, could it reverse the electrical storms? Michael asked. The room was silent. It is hard to say, Commander. This technology was built to counter the overheating of the planet, but, as I said, it was never used. Magnolia gasped. X paid her no attention until he saw Layla standing in his peripheral vision. Michael? Layla stammered. What? Michael turned calmly, but then hurried over when the other council members got up. Michael, I think Bray is coming, Layla said. Clear liquid ran down her leg, pooling on the floor. X was no doctor, but even he knew what this meant. Bray was coming early. Get her to the medical ward and let Dr. Huff know she's coming, X shouted. We'll finish this conversation later. X rushed out of the chamber with a small group led by Michael, who had scooped Layla up in his arms. He ran down the passage to the stairwell, then up two flights to the medical ward. Dr. Huff was waiting outside with a nurse and a wheelchair. Put her in the chair and come with me, Huff told Michael. The rest of you stay here. Michael gently set her down, and Huff gave X the glare that said you'd better not test my patience today. Good luck, X called out. Layla groaned as Michael pushed her chair down a passage of closed doors. The group vanished around the next corner. X stood in the lobby with Magnolia and Roger, while Tun and Victor took up position outside the medical ward's entrance. Miles remained outside too, sitting on his hind legs and watching the hallway. This could take a while, Magnolia said. We better get comfortable. Roger hobbled over and took a chair next to Magnolia, but X couldn't calm his nerves. He paced on the tile floor. When he was younger, children had scared him more than anything, especially babies. Not the kids themselves, but that he would screw things up around them. An hour passed. Another. X lost track of time while they waited. Roger dozed. Magnolia left and came back with food and water for the three of them. After a while, Roger pulled out an unfinished wood carving and a knife and began carving while Magnolia slept with her head on his shoulder. X couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. He could only sit there worrying and playing with the thread that had come loose from the arm of his chair. Finally, when he'd managed to work the thread out to triple its original length, a technician came into the lobby with an update. Layla's in the final stages of labor now, he said. The man didn't leave. He stood there looking at X. What? X finally asked. Michael said you're welcome to come back, said the technician. But you have to put on a mask and scrubs. X looked at Roger, then Magnolia. What are you waiting for, X? Roger said. Go, Magnolia said, swatting air at him as she might a pesky bug. Just as he was about to leave, the doors opened, and Catherine walked into the lobby with Phil. The girl clutched a new doll that looked like a giraffe. We were told Layla's in labor and to come up here, Catherine said almost sheepishly. Phil glanced up timidly. Since losing Les, neither of them had been the same. X had shared several meals with them and had taken Phil out to fish, but broken hearts mended slowly. X's did too. The captain, helldiver, electrician, and engineer was as good a man as X had ever met. Les deserved to be here with them far more than X did. I'm going back with Michael, he said. Have a seat, Magnolia said, patting the chair next to her and smiling. Catherine and Phil sat down and X followed the technician to a room where he changed into scrubs and a mask. 
He froze at screams that echoed through the medical ward. The technician grinned. It's normal. Follow me, King Xavier. They put on their masks and went to a room filled with staff surrounding Layla. She looked at X and yelled, Shut the damn door! X hurried inside the room but hesitated at the sight of blood on the sheets. He had seen boatloads of blood over the years, but for some reason this made him queasy. Come here, Michael said, waving a gloved hand. X took a few steps and swallowed hard. Almost there, Layla. Great work, Huff said encouragingly. A few more pushes, Michael said. You've got this. She gripped his hand and grunted. Good job, kid, X said, not knowing what else to say. The room started to spin around him. The screaming, the blood. It was like a damn battlefield. He held in a breath and blinked, trying to get control. Another hour of screams, grunts, and heavy breathing passed. The nurse and doctor leaned closer. One more hard push, Huff said. Layla roared, and X looked away, wincing. He heard voices, but didn't comprehend the words. He did feel someone pulling on his arm. When he turned back to the table, Huff held a wet child in his hands. Unlike other babies, this one wasn't crying. The doctor went over to another table, where they cleaned the child and wrapped it in a blanket. Layla and Michael watched, still hand in hand. They spoke, but X still didn't hear a thing. The baby was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. Huff wrapped the boy up in a towel and brought him over to Layla and Michael. She was crying tears of joy. X moved closer to the bed, still mesmerized by the tiny fingers and toes and the matted gossamer hair. He's perfect, X said. Layla looked up. Isn't he? Michael stared too, every bit as dumbstruck as X. Congratulations. X said, leaning down. Hey there, little buddy. Layla clutched Bray against her chest, and Michael bent down and kissed them both on the forehead. They held him for several minutes. We can move to your room when you're ready, Huff said. Layla nodded. X left, his heart full, but also aching for all the people who hadn't lived to see this. Back at the lobby, everyone stood to greet him. Well, Magnolia asked. He's a healthy boy, X said. Almost eight pounds. Roger and Magnolia embraced, and Catherine smiled warmly. Can I hold him? Phil asked. Soon, I'm sure, X said. Dr. Huff is getting them settled in a room, but then we can all go back and see them. An hour later... A nurse came and brought them back. She took them to a room at the end of a hall with a view of the ocean. Layla was sitting up in her bed, slowly rocking Bray with Michael by her side. The sun streamed through the windows. Wow, Phil said. She walked over, grinning from ear to ear. Layla and Michael held the baby up together. We present Bray, Leslie, Everhart, she said. Catherine put a hand over her mouth, and Phil looked up at her mom. We wanted to honor him, Layla said. He meant so much to both of us. Catherine didn't bother trying to hold back the tears. Thank you, she managed to say. He would be honored. Michael took Bray and held him over for Catherine and Phil to see up close. Phil chuckled and Catherine wiped away a tear. The baby slowly opened both eyelids. X made his best funny face and a cooing sound. In response, Bray burst into a full-throated wail. Man, you really don't know much about babies, Michael said. X frowned. Like I said. Here, Michael said, holding the swaddled infant out. You're gonna learn fast. Backing away, X shook his head and said, oh, hell no. Come on. Don't you remember what I said happened when I held you? You're the godfather, Michael said. You're holding him sooner or later. Best start now. 
Come on, I'll help. X looked to Layla, who nodded her approval. Reluctantly, he reached out with a stump and one shaky hand. It's okay, Michael said. Bray had stopped crying and looked up while Michael handed him over. X held the baby as if it were an unstable high explosive. Layla watched like a hawk, which didn't help his confidence. X walked cautiously over to the balcony doors with Michael, and Magnolia opened them. The cool breeze swept into the room. Together, they stepped out onto the deck. You're going to make a great dad, just like your father. Thanks, Michael said. I've had several good role models. He reached out and took Bray from X. Then he raised him up to bask in the warmth, a new tradition for all children born at the Vanguard Islands. Welcome to the world, son, Michael said. The sea wolf rocked in the water below. X could see the airship, too, resting on its rooftop port, ready to fly when the need arose. Both vessels had helped find this home and protect it despite all odds. Michael lowered Bray and returned to the room to hand him off to Phil while Roger and Magnolia hovered. You're next, Roger Dodger, Michael said. X grinned, but he stayed on the balcony for a moment, looking out over water that sparkled all the way to the barrier between light and dark. They had saved a pocket of humanity. But if the weather modification system was real, then just maybe they could also begin to reverse what had happened to the entire world and bring it back from mass extinction. One thing was certain. They all were going to enjoy retirement for a while and the miracle of new life. But at some point, the world was going to need helldivers again. <laughs>